Welcome to Monza, just north of Milan. For over a hundred years, the National Automobile Racetrack of Monza has been a mecca to race fans from all over the world. For the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS, it is the venue for the European season opener. GT World Challenge has races across the world and includes the American, Asian, Australian and European series. The calendar kicks off here with a three-hour classic. The season covers 10 events split equally between endurance and sprint races. Let's now take a look at how the classes are divided. All the cars run to GT3 regulations with SRO's Balance of Performance or BOP ensuring no one manufacturer has an advantage. In essence, they are all equalised as much as possible. The drivers, however, can and do vary in experience and ability. They are graded by the FIA Categorisation Committee. This allows drivers of the same grade to race against lineups of similar standards of age, experience and skill. Thus, we end up with five classes. The pro category can have drivers of any level, including full-time, factory-paid, professional races. The teams are heavily linked with their factories and include one of the most successful in years, WRT. But this year, there's a change. After years of running with Audi, they've linked up with another German manufacturer, BMW. And they've added to the driver lineup as well. We've done a lot of testing in the off-season, as we know, WRT in, in pure fashion. Uh, to do so I think we're very well prepared for the season um, but yeah obviously we still have a lot to learn with the car and stuff. Also with WRT is a name every motorsport fan will recognize. Maxi Martin and Augusto Farfus joined Valentino Rossi in the number 46 entry. He's a, he's a very good car, he's a, he's a new car, have a lot of potential for sure we need, we need to work a bit, we need to understand better all the things because the car is very different compared to last year. If Italy's Valentino Rossi is their favourite ex-motorcycle turned car racer, then the favourite make of car represented here has to be Ferrari or Lamborghini. And we have both. The prancing horse gives its Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe debut to the beautiful 296. Ferrari have also provided the lineup to go with the car. Fresh from their world endurance exploits, Alessandro Perguidi and Antonio Fuoco joined Davide Rigon in one of two AF Course Pro entries. More factory Ferrari drivers appear in the other crewed car. Nicholas Nilsson, Alessio Rivera, and the reserve driver for the Scuderia in Formula One, Robert Sportsman. Not to be outdone, Lamborghini have pro cars too. One from the crack American K-Pak squad and one from Iron Lynx. Jordan Pepper, Mirko Bortolotti and 2019 champ Andrea Caldarelli will steer one of a pair of the latest Evo 2 versions of the menacing Huracan. I'm really happy to be back. Uh, it feels like it's been a long time. Yes, I did spa last year, but the full, the full season, it's been too long time. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And even in Monza, it's, uh, it's great to be back at, uh, at home. Mercedes AMG aren't resting on their laurels. They have three entries. Factory drivers are appearing in national championships and fight it out against one another. But here, the big names team up together, with the runner-up in last year's Sprint Series, Timo Bogolavski, being joined by 2022 endurance champions Jules Gounon and Rafael Marcello. For sure, if, if it's a year where we, we have to try to win, it's this year. Because for sure, BMW with a new car, they, they, they can be really quick, but they also have to know maybe something in the car. So for sure, this year maybe we have a better chance than the past year. We haven't yet mentioned Porsche, who have a new 992 GT3. Audi, who have won previously at almost every level with the R8. And McLaren, all of whom are represented in the pro category. Very different car, very different style of driving. Um, you know, I've had to get used to it a bit and change, change uh, my style a bit. But, uh, you know, it's a really nice car to drive. I, I really enjoy it and uh, I think it can be quick this year. The next class is Pro-Am. Here, your driver lineup can only include one platinum graded professional, but partnered by two bronze pilots. One of the new Porsche 992s will be run by the car collection team. Favourite for this class may be another Lamborghini GT3 Evo 2. Dennis Lynn can be amongst the very fastest. 
The likeable Dane is paired with Adam Ballon and former touring car ace and British GT champion Rob Collard. We're in the Pro-Am Championship, so um, we've got you know, a fantastic driver in Dennis Lynn to lead the team. You know, you can't get any better than that. And um, we've got Adam Ballon, so I've, I've not been a teammate with Adam before. I've raced against him in British GT, so it's going to be interesting to see how, he, how, how we fare. But I'm, I'm very confident we've got a very strong lineup. Aaron Walker is just 17. He teams up with Lance Bergstein and Andre Lewandowski and a get speed entered Mercedes AMG. BMW Italia have an M4 and Ferrari are represented by the tried and trusted 488. Samantha Tan has been racing since she was 16. The Canadian is paired with John Miller and Isaac Tatumalu and completes the five car lineup in Pro Am. Yeah, it's so exciting to be here. We did run the 24 hour spa last year, so that was like our first taste of the series. But again, it's like the top teams, the top drivers in the world. So we're very excited to be here and I'm just super excited to be here with Rinaldi Racing. Next up, the gold class. The driver lineup here can be gold, gold and silver. Dean McLeod put in some very impressive performances in the McLaren last season. Joined by 2021 European GT4 champion Charlie Fagg and silver graded driver Sam Dehan, the optimum entry should be fast. There's plenty of opposition though. Aurelien Panis, the 28 year old son of former F1 driver Olivier, is part of the Boutsan VDS squad and joins Adam Ezetsky and Alberto Di Fuoco in the number nine Audi, with another Audi entered under the Come To You racing banner. Two Mercedes AMGs come from Winwood Racing. WRT have one of their BMWs entered here too. Rounding out the gold entries is the Iron Lynx Lamborghini of Rolf Inishin, Michele Beretta and Leonardo Pulcini. Silver is the class for the aspiring professional drivers. Last season, silver entries caused more than a few upsets and like every class are still capable of taking the overall victory. Sam Neary has been making quite an impression in British GT with the family Mercedes. But here he joins Ricky Campo and Fabrizio Cristoni in a Lamborghini Hurricane. A second Lambo comes from the Grasser racing team. The sole Aston Martin entry is in silver too. The Vantage GT3 is entered by Bullet Racing for Roman Leroux, Jacob Rigel and Geoffrey Kingsley. There are also four Audi R8s in this class. The Santaloc entry crewed by Paul Evra, Owen Bastard and Grégoire de Moustier is likely to be at the front. Watch out for another famous name too. Lorenzo Petrezzi joins the impressive Alex Acker and Pietro Deleguante in another of the Audis. Another Porsche from Dynamic and Mercedes AMG complete the class. Finally, the bronze category. Here, the maximum lineup is platinum, silver, bronze. A huge 17 car entry has been accepted. Porsche among the most numerous of the seven manufacturers represented in this class. Five of the new GT3Rs are here from five different teams. Klaus Backler is the only platinum graded driver, but has won this race overall in 2019 and 2021. Highly rated Kiwi Jackson Evans is part of Team Parker and Ben Barker is the gold driver in a dynamic entry. Herbert Motorsport are also represented along with CLRT who have the impressive all French lineup of Stephen Palette, Hugo Chevalier and Clément Mathieu. We are exciting to be here, it's a new challenge, uh, French lineup, French team, but uh, we have a, a big story, a big background, so that's, uh, that will be our, um, our value and uh, our strongness for this year. The lone Ferrari in this class is run by the crack Air Course squad for multiple champion Louis Michaels as he returns with longtime teammate and 2010 GT1 world champion Andrea Bertolini and son Jeff. BMW is represented by WRT and Valkenhorst. Adam Carroll and Thomas Neubauer are the gold rated drivers respectively. Sky Tempesta always seems to be at the front with bronze driver Jonathan Hui partnering Chris Froggett and Eddie Cheever Jr. Whilst Garage 59 have Miguel Ramos as their bronze driver. It's going to be a big fight. I think this year the, our class has 17 candidates, very strong. So. Uh, it's all about who's making most of the points uh, during the whole season, so looking forward to start here this weekend. 
Audi have two R8 LMS GT3 Evos, one for Attempto Racing and a second with CSA. There are three Mercedes AMGs and India's Arjun Maini can be found in the Haupt Racing entry, while Saudi Arabia's Rima Jafali is the bronze driver for the FIBA motorsport team. Jafali is far from the only female driver here in Monza. Iron Dames are one of the favourites. Class winners at the Spa 24 hours last season, Sarah Bovey, Rahal Freya and Michelle Gatting will be tough to beat in one of two Lamborghini Hurricanes. I think that's the good thing about this championship is that there are different classes, but the competition in all the classes are very high. In the end of the day, we're actually all competing against each other. So there are the highlights of the entry. 55 cars, 165 drivers will compete in the opening round of this series. And points have already been awarded for the top five. As points in the eSports race on Saturday evening contribute to the real world. And it was Sandy Mitchell on the pole position for Lamborghini getting roughed up and unfortunately losing the lead, not strong enough into turn one. As per usual, the first chicane causing issues for Thomas Drouet, the Acodis ASP team driver unfortunately giving himself a lot of work to do in the inevitable tangle. Points from five down to points. One point for fifth position in each class and with three classes represented in sim racing this year, it means there are plenty of points that go towards the real world. Unfortunately for Sandy Mitchell, the man on pole position found himself being flooded by other cars and eventually he would drop down to the back of the field. After that contact with the wall, no more straight line speed in his Lamborghini. Contact between Sam de Jong and Owen Bastar. But the winner was Jordan Pepper in the Pro Cross. Marius Zug in gold and Alexei Nesov took the overall victory and silver points. All of that leads us to the main event, the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS, the Endurance Cup race, the first of the 2023 season across the board. My goodness me, are we in for a thriller here on the Autodroma Nazionale Monza. This is going to be a sensational battle out on the starting grid. So far, it has been BMWs all the way with Rove and Team WRT dominating things so far. But let's go down onto the starting grid as Gemma Scott is chatting away with Stefan Rattel on the main straight. Stefan, we've just been watching the crowds cheering here. There's so many people here in Monza celebrating a huge grid. The atmosphere is wonderful. Yeah, they're here for 55 cars and for one man. <laughs> and uh, it's fantastic to have Ali with us and to have him starting from the front row today is just making it very exceptional. It feels like an exceptional season starting. It really does feel like something's going to make history this year, right? Yeah, it's the biggest we ever had. The combination of the number of cars we have uh, in, in endurance and in sprint is unprecedented. The diversity of cars, the new ones coming, the new uh, Porsche, the new Ferrari, the new evolution of the McLaren, of the Lamborghini. It's all very new, we need to see how it's going to end up but uh, in terms of performance, but it, it's looking like an absolutely exceptional season with 72 cars, 72 GT3 cars, GT only at the start of the CrowdStrike 24 hours of Spa. It never feels like it can get bigger every year and it, yet it keeps on growing. Congratulations to you because you're driving this. This is wonderful. And we're joined also uh, by Mario Isola from Pirelli, a partnership that you've had with GT World Challenge for 11 years, I believe it is. It's, it's a very long partnership. I'm very happy that we are still working together. It's a successful championship. Uh, growing and growing, this guy is never happy. So he's always pushing to, to improve and he did it. So we are very happy to be on board. It's not the easiest championship for us because we have to supply the same tire to everybody. And as uh, Stefan said, we have many different cars yeah. with different characteristics. So it's a technical challenge, but we're happy to be here. And for you guys, it's a home race here in Monza. Yeah, it's a home race. We have good weather that was not uh, granted uh, 
looking at the weather forecast. So it's, it's good to be here with a lot of people, a lot of motorsport fun. This is uh, a really a success. Thank you both very much for joining us. Enjoy the race. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Great to hear from Stefan Rattel and Mario Izzola, courtesy of Gemma Scott. What a fabulous battle it's going to be here in the Autodroma Nazionale Monza starting point. I'm Jake Sanson. Beside me is John Watson. What a fantastic thrill this place is. And John, you know it better than most. Well, let's take a quick trip and it is going to be quick round as the tracker again manages to beat me on a lap. That certainly broke the lap record. 11 corners here, all corner names, final corner. Tamburello, but now called Alberetto, and acknowledgement of Michele Alberetto, the great Italian Grand Prix driver who sadly lost his life some years ago. So there we see Monza. I mean, I've raced here so many times. Every time I've come here, I love it. 3.6 miles in length, 5.7 kilometers. Three chicanes. First one, the Retifilio. Big, big break when you come down. Monks pit straight. Down to first gear we saw, then accelerate through, then Cover Grande, then down to the Roger chicane, another big stop, left, then right, then through the two Lesmos, of which both have been readjusted over the last number of years. Lesmo 2, which I've got very fond memories of, of course, has been slowed down considerably. Then they run all the way up under the bridge that would be part of the Indianapolis loop here at Monza, up into the Ascari chicane, a really good high speed chicane, left right and then left back onto the back straight that then runs you down to the Alberto curve an opportunity to pass there but of course you've got to be able to get yourself into position and the braking zones here at Monza are now getting shorter and shorter such as the evolution and the progress made with these GT3 cars so down on the starting grid Nick Yellily is getting himself ready for the start from the front row of the grid with Gemma Nick, great to see you back with us. The, uh, the grids are growing and growing. It's nice to see some of the drivers stay and bringing more and more through. You've got new teammates this year. Yeah, exactly. So I'm teamed up with Philip Eng and Marco Whitman this year. Uh, last year was Augusto and Nicky Katzberg. So, yeah, obviously we've had a good start to, to qualifying so far. Um, BMW's obviously taken a good step forward over the winter. Um, and now it's about yeah, trying to keep it on the top step of the podium, of course. Yeah, I think that first corner is going to be crucial today, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, obviously we can't be stupid. We have a lot of the same manufacturer at the front. All these guys know what they're doing, so I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, and it's always a long, you know, a long run to the first corner and very tight. So you never know what can happen, but fingers crossed uh, we can keep it where we're starting. Thank you very much. Have a good race. Thank you very much. It's going to be quite an incredible battle on the run to the Fred Filio. As we've already mentioned, BMWs occupy both of the front rows of the grid. The Rove BMW on pole position for Philip Eng, who will start the race and the WRT BMW number 46, the man who everybody has come to Monza to see on pole position is the Philip N car, but alongside him, these two are sharing it with him, Maxim Mata and Augusto Farfus in the WRT BMW. But Gemma Scott has worked their way through the throng to find Dries van Tor, and she will tell us how things are bearing up for them. You guys are just talking about these warm conditions we've got here. It's actually quite hot, isn't it? Sheldon, you'll be starting the car. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's one of my first starts in two years, I think. So very fun with all the fans here for Valle. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be a cool day. Um, obviously, starting towards the front, so that's always good. Uh, got two very fast teammates next to me here, so I'm pretty sure they're going to do the job at the end. Um, but yeah, obviously, our goal is to get on the podium. Naturally, when you start P3, you want to end up on the podium. So I think that's the goal. Absolutely. It's a long race ahead, though. Three hours, Dries. Yeah, a lot. I mean, uh, and uh, anything can happen. Uh, like, like it's always past, uh, proven in the past here. So um, let's see. I mean, uh, we're well prepared. Uh, let's hope for a good race, a clean race, clean first corner, uh, and then we will see how it goes. And a quick word, Charles. New new car for the team. Seems to be going well. Yeah, we already saw at the beginning of the year with uh, some victories for the team and for BMW. So looking, yeah, it looks quite strong, quite good. Hopefully, we can maintain this uh, this pace also in Europe, and we will give our best for sure. Have a great race. Thanks, boys. So this is obviously going to be an intriguing battle for the BMWs, but the man who starts on the front row of the grid, look at the throng. The doctor is in town, Valentino Rossi, and he starts from the front row of the grid. Pinch me, I think I'm dreaming. Yes, he does, and I'm rather surprised because when Valentino was out last night in the pre-qualifying session, he made a small error going into Alvarez's curve and backed the BMW into the Tech Pro barriers. Very light damage, nothing of any consequence. But he hasn't driven here since that moment because in qualifying, 
we had a, a, a qualifying situation and qualifying three was actually cancelled so Valentino didn't get to drive his car and he hasn't driven that car since Saturday night but the other thing I want to mention is very important is that remember this is a circuit with high speeds the temperature here is warmer than it has been and there's a history in the past of drivers driving aggressively and consequently maybe doing a little bit of overloading on the tire so keep an eye on just how drivers are approaching the curbs and particularly just the temperatures rising let's hear from Mirko Bortolotti down on the starting grid with Gemma Scott Jordan, first Lamborghini on the grid. I spoke to Mirko yesterday and I said to him it seemed like there may be a few struggles and he said no, we have no problems, nothing at all. Car's feeling good, is it? Yeah, yesterday we really focused on the race. Um, you know, we're so limited on testing now, so we really focused yesterday to do a race car and the best we could, so we're always um, focusing on that. And then today, you know, I think this championship's more about a free lap than actually the perfect quality car. So. In all fairness, it was a bit of a mess with the whole Q3 being cancelled. It would have been nice to actually drive. Uh, so the first time I'm driving today would be straight into the race. But yeah, car's good. We up front, which is perfect here at Monza. Obviously, the first chicane we know can cause chaos. So I'm happy to be in the front few rows. And yeah, let's see if we can make it around turn one, two, the first lap, and then see what happens. But uh, dream start for me yeah, with the Lamborghini, my first official race as a factory driver at home in Monza so yeah let's see I definitely have goosebumps let's see if we can convert it into a podium I wish you the best of luck thanks Jordan thank you, thank you. have a good one Jordan Pepper who is of course sharing the Lamborghini with Mirko Bortolotti what can we tell you coming into this race well there's been a slight change in the balance of performance coming into this one BMW and McLaren have both had 10 kilograms added Porsche and Ferrari oh, so hold on hold on you have to go back <laughs> because there was a big change in BOP last night. There was, there was. And indeed. it is that balance of performance which maybe has skewed the, the performances between what we had seen at the end of Saturday evening. And then it was after Saturday evening the balance of performance was changed, which to some people, some teams felt that that gave other teams an unfair advantage. Had the balance of performance been changed, let's say, after qualifying, which is on Sunday morning, they feel that would have been a more level playing field. But subsequently, more weight has been added to some of the brands to try and redress what maybe was seen as being oh, too generous in some cases. But of course, that has led to a grid which has been I mean, really dominated by the performances of the BMW M4 GT3. And I mean, these cars have been absolutely phenomenal in qualifying. I mean, I think six of the seven cars at one point were BMWs. Yes, indeed. There is Dan Harper, who will start the race for the Rove number 998. But uh, obviously, to pick on that, BMW and McLaren have had 10 kilograms added to their performance. Porsche and Ferrari have had five kilograms taken off. So that's going to be significant coming into the long period of the race. And also, Ferrari and BMW got a slight break in terms of the BUP, the, 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 the turbo boost, basically. So they got a, not only did they get a weight break, but they got a very, very small horsepower increase. So combining taking a, a 20, whatever the weight was, and the, the extra power, it certainly didn't inhibit those cars that were the beneficiaries primarily. And I, I'm saying that because it's a fact of life, it was BMW and McLaren that really leapt forward. Uh, but others were certainly much more to the fore than we had seen on Friday, Saturday evening. The leading car that is not a BMW is the Santaloc Junior Audi of Simon Gachet in fifth position. The leading car that is not a pro is the Garage 59 McLaren that we just saw of Louis Pret. But how about that? Valentino Rossi, front row of the starting grid in a drag race to the Retifilio with Philip Eng in the Rove BMW. There is so much pressure on him here, on the front row, in his new car, having the last thing he did yesterday was spin off into the barriers at the final turn, in front of the home fans, with so much pressure on his shoulders. This could be the mother of all first corners. What can you say? I think you've summed it all up. <laughs> I mean, it, it, no one knows how the start will unfold, but it is always a very, very difficult to start into the first chicane after a long run off Parabolica or Alberto Curve as we now call it and you've got 55 of the quickest GT3 cars in the world and 165 of a mix of gold professional bronze silver whatever drivers in those 55 cars it's just I mean it's in terms of GT racing this is the best you're ever going to get to see and there you can see that at the very, very top of your picture, 
some of the cars at the rear of the field haven't even begun to move no, as the leaders are making their way already through the exit of the first chicane. And three hours ahead of us, Rove and WRT are occupying the front row of the grid for Eng and Rossi and the second row for Sheldon van der Linde and Dan Harper. Then on the third row of the grid, we've got the Santa Lock Audi of Simon Gache and the Ironlix Lambo of Jordan Pepper. Garage 59 McLaren in bronze leading the way alongside the K Pax Lamborghini. Then the Mercedes Albanar alongside the Dynamic Hubert number 54. The Optima McLaren on row six from the Contiu Audi of Fred Vervish to start in number 11. Patrese, the leading silver in the Trezor Attempto Audi alongside the Proctor WRT BMW. The next one is the gold, second place. Critton alongside Marcello, the leading championship car from last year. The Boots and BDS Audi alongside the leading Ferrari 296 of Beguidi in the 71. Then Inechian in the Iron Lynx Lamborghini and the Ritronic Porsche of Dennis Olsen. The Tracer Orange 1 Audi, number 40, is 21st alongside the Comteu, number 21. Then it is the second Ferrari 296 alongside the Sky Tempesta car, Eddie Chiva the third to start. Pure Racing Porsche 911 alongside the Mercedes AMG Akadis of Gotts. Then it is Grassa, K van Berlo in 27th alongside the Windward of Bourne. And then we have the Half Racing Mercedes alongside the Grassa Lamborghini in the number 58. Next up, it's Meodas stepping up from GT4 in the Boots and BDS alongside the Iron Dames. Then it's the Windward Racing Mercedes and the Herbert Porsche number 91. The AF Corsa still in the 488 in bronze alongside the CSA Audi. Then it's the Dynamic Hubert number 56 alongside the Mad Panda Mercedes. Then we have the Comteu Audi number 12 alongside the Dynamic Hubert Porsche 55. Then the car collection car that leads Pro-Am alongside the Santa Lucia team, Yuan Bastar stepping up from GT4. BMW Italia Ciccato alongside the Garage 59 McLaren, the Walken Horse Norwegian, and the Tiva Motorsport for Rima Jafali. Barwell Lamborghini versus CRRT Porsche, the Bullet Racing Aston alongside the ST Racing Ferrari, the Get Speed Mercedes car alongside the Tracer Retempto car, Garini starting the Lamborghini for AGS alongside Bergstein in the second Get Speed Mercedes, and bringing up the rear, the Team Parker in 55th, Derek Pierce in the Parker Porsche. This is such an incredible grid. 165 of the best racing drivers in the world. Now they all better behave themselves, because it is very easy. And remember, it's not the cars that are at the front, maybe two or three rows of the grid. It's that middle pack, the sort of the, the sandwich, the meat in the sandwich of this 55 car grid. You know, some of the cars at the back of the field would if they had the choice, would prefer to start from the pit lane because that's probably the safest place when you're that far back in the grid to start because it means you're going to be behind anything that may occur. It could be a major, we saw certainly about four years ago, a major multi-car accident going into turn one, two, three. That's the chicane, Retafilio chicane. So everybody needs to be aware that the race is not won. We keep repeating ourselves year in, year out. You've got to get through the first lap trouble-free then you can think about going racing. Anything can happen, and it probably will here at Monza. This is the championship winning team from last year, the Akadis ASP Mercedes number 88. Raffaele Marcello did a fantastic job in 2022 alongside Jules Cuno and Daniel Cadella. They have swapped things around a bit. Yeah, but that's back, I mean, that car back in the eighth through of the grid. When have we ever said that <laughs> Raffaele Marcello starting back on the eighth through of the grid? I don't remember it. No, indeed. It's going to be a big fight back in the first GT World Challenge Europe race of the season. And how about this, folks? Philip Eng in pole position for Rove. Second on the grid, the doctor himself, Valentino Rossi, the man everybody's come to see in the BMW number 46 on the front row of the grid with the sister cars from WRT and Rove charging after them into turn one. Watch for the Audi and the Lamborghini on the run to the first corner. Looks like a very aggressive start from Dan Harper already before we've even got going. Well, I think Dan Harper's the man I'm going to watch. He's directly behind Valentino Rossi and he will be looking to get moving. He's already made it sweeps out. We are underway at Monza, and Valentino Rossi goes wheel to wheel with Philip Eng down to the first corner as Dan Harper decides to slot in behind Sheldon van der Linde. It's going to be a good start for van der Linde as they run through. Rossi's going to try and come around the outside into the red to Filio. He will battle for the lead. He slots in a second place as the cars work their way through. There's contact. There's all sorts of pandemonium. We weren't sure if it was going to be a tough start, and it has been. One of the Get Speed Mercedes is out already. Yeah, it's going to be a full course yellow very, very shortly, and then O'Donnell followed by a safety car. So contact this time at the rear of the field, but two cars 
have had heavy damage, but looked at the dynamic Porsche getting oh, almost sideswiped by the Lamborghini as they come down in the chicane, the Rogier chicane, and it's all going a bit mad behind the lead two cars. Look at the car that's in third. That's the Almanar Mercedes has stormed right up to third position. What a start from Mauro Engel. All the way up into third position, chasing down the BMWs of Philip Eng and Valentino Rossi. We have yellow flags in sector one, of course, but we have at least two cars, one on either side of the run to the Retifilio in the barriers, one out of the race for definite, one struggling to get going, but it's Eng, Rossi, Engel and van der Linde. Safety car. Yeah, I mean, it had to be deployed. It was yellow flag already in sector one. So now that isn't going to be a safety car. Everybody will have to slow down and don't try and race. Wave yellow flags coming into the Ascari chicane. That means you don't over take if you do you'll be penalized but really the star has been got to be Mario Engel who came all the way from what was this fifth row of the grid up into third position no it's not third position according it is, no, it is position. Third, we haven't yet had the uh, correction on our, on our timing and scoring it is third position it's an astonishing star for the Almanar Mercedes I mean they were worried coming into this one after being so strong in free practice how about that Maxim Martin can breathe a sigh of relief. Valentino got through the first few corners. He's there in second place. He actually made a perfect start. Made a very, very good start, bearing in mind that he had so much pressure upon him. And not only just from the rest of the field, well, there we see the get speed Mercedes, and that is heavy right, left, sorry, left damage, left front. I think that's Lance Bergstein's car. So Lance Bergstein, I don't think, has gone anywhere at all. So uh, his race is over. That's uh, very unfortunate for the number two crew, which is also, of course, Meaning it's Look game at the over. damage on the Ferrari. Oh, is that Samantha Tan? It is Samantha Tan's car, yeah. Unfortunately, that is the first race of the season for Samantha Tan, and the car doesn't even make it to the Retifilio. Very unfortunate. It's also game over for Jenik Chauvinak and the 17-year-old teenager Aaron Walker, the British driver, who was hoping to make his debut. He won't even get his chance to run in the car. Get speed number two is out, and so is the Ferrari number 38. Well, Samantha Tan just... No, it gets out of the car, a lot of heavy damage to oh. the front of the car, and you can see the skid marks. I'm wrong, it's actually in the number three get speed Mercedes that, okay. that's gone, it's the other one. So it's the Assenheimer, Peroni and Schultzer car. So Florian Schultzer is the one that's out. But the, that incident began, what, maybe 100 metres beyond, or back up the racetrack, where we see these cars that have come to rest. They were spinning, banging into each other. So let's have a look back and see what happened then on the run to the Retifilio. This is going to be very interesting to see. We look back to the start as the lights go green. Good reactions from Rossi, actually. He was not that far away from Sheldon van der Linde's reaction time. Van der Linde got a quicker start than Rossi, but Rossi was able to hold it round the outside. Look at that, four wide further back as Engel just bolts through. Yeah, that, that was just very, very much all the experience of Mauro Engel and finds his way, but further back, and this is the view that we maybe get an indication to where it all began to kick off. But look, you've got cars with spikes, six cars wide as they come through the widest part of the start finish straight. But look at the way back in that dustier part, and that's where it all seeming is a bright yellow. I think that's the Mercedes we're looking at almost at the tail of the field. Does he? That, there it he is. He hits they, they hit Samantha Tan. Yeah, unfortunately, Flodden Schultz backs across the racetrack. Yeah, Flodden and Schultz just caught the door of Samantha Tan, and I'm afraid that's where the chain reaction happened. Nothing either driver could do. Racing incident for my money, although maybe Flodden and Schultz should have looked a little bit further to the left. Uh, well, certainly the contact would have been the Mercedes contact of the Ferrari. Let's look at it from this. This is the drone Ooh. shot there. That was a big old hit with the Mercedes. And then the, the secondary hit from the Samantha Tan Ferrari. So, well, well this time it was previously, it's always been the mid pack. But the mid pack behaved very well, got through the chicane. But it's the tail of the field. And I have to say, it was the Mercedes to me that moved across in the Ferrari that seemed to set the whole process off. And then we get a view of now as cars decided to do the same thing and take that little access road, but they'll have to give up any positions and cars even not attempting to go through the chicane. Those are, they, those are some of them that were further back that basically were taking avoiding action from all the bodywork. There's, here we go on board with, this is with uh, Raffaele Marcello. Marcello down to the braking zone. Look how tight it is to pick a braking point. He almost got towards the back of the McLaren, but he nails it quite nicely as they work their way through. Just pick a moment, pick a gap, go for where the gap is. And a couple of cars going wide there. I think Lorenzo Patrese went a little bit wide, the Italian, and also one of the BMWs just getting a little bit wide. But on the whole, everybody sorted themselves out pretty well up in the first 20 cars. Certainly did. Um, I say the middle to tail of the grid, that was the, the problem, problematic area. So on board, and again, 
looking for the opportunity to go around the outside of the chicane. This time he gets it done, so Marcello used his experience and uh, put the Mercedes just on the part of the racetrack that gave him the high ground. Here's another great view looking from as the field goes down, and you'll see that Mercedes, uh, well, it actually, I think the Mercedes tipped somebody on the right, and that then shot the car off to the left. So I think if we could have another look at that, just caught. So the, the mess that has now got to be cleared up, not only is it possible damage to the barriers, the cars obviously are heavily damaged, but there'll be a lot of carbon fiber that will need to be cleared away from the racing line as we come down into the Retifilio chicane. And of course, carbon fiber and rubber are not necessarily best bed mates. Are we have it, we're slow, everything's going really slow just as we filter through. Yeah, we're just trying to back yep. the pack up essentially. Now one car has come into the pits, that is the treble eight, uh, the CSA Audi. And look at that damage to the number three Mercedes. All gone for the Get Speed crew, but uh, Owen Creed has come into the pits. He obviously sharing that car with Arthur Rougier and Igor Walalko. But uh, yeah, very big problem. So there is the car having some attention at the back. I wonder if they were caught up in it. Well, this is look, we've got the old gaffer tape out first of all for bodywork. <laughs> uh, so whether that was a, a consequence or cause, but they feel that there was certainly was a bit of bodywork, black bodywork lying in the middle of the chicane. So whether it's part of the Audi's bodywork, let's again watch this replay as we see the field come very well controlled at this point and everybody doing what they're required to. Dan Harper was the one I thought looked like he might be trying to find a way around Valentino Rossi and he moved to the left once this race went green. Watch that car in the second row, the grid immediately moves out, there he goes, and then he feels he can't, that's going to run close down, so he has to go back into the middle of the pack and then gets a bit swamped in that middle of the pack. Fabulous swarm of cars, 55 of them heading down to the first corner. We're just going to try and follow this a little bit to see how the chaos ensues. Yep, there it is. Just a little bit of contact between the Mercedes and the Ferrari initially, and then they swarmed away, and then they caught each other again a second time. Yeah, but the cars were spinning. There's nothing much that they were able to do, just they were going from one side of the track across to the other side of the track. So there is one of the sad sights to see Samantha Tan's Ferrari. She's come a long way to do, what, a half a kilometre of motor racing here at Monza. Yeah, you've got to feel for her teammates as well, Isaac Tatumlu and John Miller, who don't get a chance in the car at all. But uh, for some reason, the number nine Boots and VDS car of uh, Aurelion Panis does not appear to be circulating, so I'm not sure what's happened there. But certainly, it's BMW 1 and 2 with Mauro Engel, the star of the show at the moment, up to third position. That was an absolute rocket launch, like the missile gunning through the field in Mario Kart. That was amazing. Yeah, I mean, it just sometimes gaps open up for you, and it's a matter of you put yourself in a position, and then suddenly there's a gap appearing. So Mauro Engel threaded the needle extremely successfully to get himself up from the fifth row of the grid, up in what would be in a... Look, there's still bodywork down there to be removed away, so until that's been cleared by the marshals who are really dealing with a bigger problem on the entry into the chicane. This race is going to continue under safety car. So we're what, just coming up to nine minutes in and we haven't even had a racing lap. No, indeed. It's been a very tough start to the season, but we've got two hours and 51 minutes of racing still to come here at Monza. And it's going to be very interesting to see who actually gets the job done. Philip Eng, Valentino Rossi and Mauro Engel is your top three. So let's have a look. This is on board with the number 93. This is from Chris Froggart in the Sky Tempest of McLaren. This is what it's like being in the middle of the field when all of that kicks off. Ready? Onto the throttle. Wait for it. Wait for it. Now. Where do you go? You've got cars to the left of you, cars to the right of you, cars ahead of you, cars behind you. All you can do is just really, and again, just had to back out of it because the Mercedes swooped. Right, find that little gap, which really Chris Frogger was being cautious and trying to preserve, but it allowed, oh, there we go, cars actually cutting through the inside because they felt that they couldn't clear the exit of the Roger Chica the Retifilio chicane without maybe having further contact. It looked to me as though Chris Frogger had actually got a little bit of a love tap from behind on the way in as well. He was very wise and very mature and sensible to get the car to stop traveling because he could have cannon into somebody else. I think he got a little well, love tap from someone. That could have been a massive chain reaction. It's, it's a bit like playing snooker, you know, you play off another ball. <laughs> he could have been the, the ball that was being played off. So anyway, here we are underway. This is a replay of the start and it's beginning to calm down marginally as we come into Lesmo 1. So let's have a look again over, over the top of the cars and look in the background. It's all quite tightly congested anyway, but there are the two cars going off. 
Mercedes and the Ferrari, and they bounce across each barrier. What I would like to see is actually how did Maro Engel get past Sheldon van der Linde? Because at that point there, he came th through and out of the chicane, and he was still behind van der Linde's BMW, but somewhere around the rest of the lap, he found a way around. So incident between three and car 38 are going to be investigated, and the marshals, or sorry, not marshals, the stewards will have cameras to look at, not at their leisure, because it's going to be a very busy race for the stewards, I would imagine, but they will be able to determine if there was an issue which was um, maybe deserving of a penalty. I've got a feeling that Sheldon van der Linde lost ground on Mauro Engel on the exit of the Retifilio on the opening lap, and that's where Mauro Engel picked up the place around uh, Curva Grande. As we look at Nick Yellily watching on for Philip Eng, in fact, the whole team at Rove, a little nervous. Their cars are first and fifth at the moment, but Philip Eng is leading under safety car. Valentino Rossi in the lead WRT BMW. He is loving this. Second position under safety car. That gives him a little bit of breathing space to do before we restart. Most importantly, it's allowing him to get his body language, you know, re-establish having had that incident yesterday evening. So he started the race, gone into turn ones, into the chicane, and come out in second, went in in second, came out in second, and finished the, completed the lap in second place. So he only needs that small amount of time behind the wheel for all the natural sort of senses that he would maybe been a bit nervous of to return so he ought to be back up to full race program, Valentino Rossi. Second pit stop for Irving Creed in the treble eight uh, Audi from CSA Racing. So more problems for them than first thought. So let's talk you through the field a little bit. Philip Eng out in the lead of the race in the Rove BMW and then Valentino Rossi in the WRT car in second. There is Augusto Farfus watching his teammate in action out on the circuit. Third position for Mauro Engel after that rocket ship of a start in the Almanar Mercedes. Fourth place is Sheldon van der Linde in the number 32 WRT BMW, the sister car to Valentino Rossi. Then Dan Harper in the second of the Rove BMWs in the 998. Fred Vervish in the Comte U Audi. They have got a good start. Sixth position for Fred Vervish. And then it's the two Lamborghinis from Capex and Iron Links, Frank Pereira and Jordan Pepper. And then Simon Gachet, who started fifth initially, is down to ninth in the Santa Lock Junior Team Audi and the dynamic Hubert Porsche of Christian Engelhardt in 10th position. The leading gold car safety is the car Optimum. in this lap, safety car in this lap. OK, there we go. So the safety car is coming in this lap. So this is on board with the WRT BMW. This is on board with Valentino Rossi. So the lights have gone green. He's now in a, a, a drag race. You can see Philip Eng just to the right. And uh, both drivers giving each other plenty of room and space. That's what's happening behind that Rossi is concerned about. So he just about, he, didn't, he wasn't really attempting to overtake, but in fact, they got much closer from that camera position that we saw from the overhead cameras. But Rossi then just sits back and lets the lead BMW make its own way out through the Carver Grande, but further back. This is again a shot we saw earlier from Raffaele Marcello. And if, where can he go? He's got nowhere to go. He's got cars all around him. He tries to make spaces. That's blocked. Then he goes back again, and there's a Porsche directly ahead of him. So, the, you know, starting back on, the, what was he, back on the eighth row of the grid, a lot of cars around, and he needs to be aware that some of those drivers are not as experienced as he is. Well, this is a fast car trying to work its way through the field. What on earth do you do when you're stuck in that bottleneck trying to make progress at the start? Drive with your head and not your feet, basically, because you can do nothing until the opportunities start to form. You know, the one that bucked that hope trend was, in fact, Maro Engel, who found his way through from the fifth row of the grid up into third position. I mean, that was phenomenal. It's not normal to see that kind of progress on the opening lap here at Monza, into the first chicane, into the second chicane, through the two Lesmos, up to the Ascari, where we are now. The safety car, by the way, is coming in. The lights are out. This race is going to get back underway once the safety car peels off, and it will be a lot easier now for the entire field to see the start with outstanding, with the, the side by side start that we had, the rolling start at the beginning of the race. So we had the two cars that crashed out on the way to the first corner the ST Racing Rinaldi Ferrari and the Get Speed Mercedes number three. But the Boots NVDS Audi didn't start the race at all for Aurelion Panis and the crew because they had a clutch problem. Uh, thanks to Gemma Scott for updating us on that one. Out of the final turn, and it looks like the number 98, Philip Eng, has already bolted. And but watch behind Maro Engel as the driver who will have been hopefully watching, reading it as best he can. He's going to try and use the slipstream coming down on to start finish straight. 
And, uh, well, I tell you, the pace the BMW has got is not doing any favours to the pace of the Mercedes-AMG GT3 Maro Engel. Flashing the lights, trying to distract. Valentino Rossi gets up pretty close on the entry, but not close enough. Next opportunity for Engel will be into the Rob Gear chicane, which is another... Oh, and done. Just people sort of launching like unguided missiles, just launch themselves down into the chicane. So let's see whether there's an overtake possibility here for... Mauro Engel in third place over Valentino Rossi. Very intriguing body language from Mauro Engel down into the Retifilio, clearly feeling that's only Valentino Rossi. He's a motorcycle racer, I could take him on, but Valentino, equal to the defensive tactics, no problem at all in holding him off. No, he hadn't because he had, the car has got good straight line speed. The straight line speed has not an awful lot to do with the driver, it's to do with the balance of performance and the overall performance of the car. But Mauro Engel, with goodness knows how many years' experience, one of the finest GT3 drivers in the world, will think, how can I find a way? I pass the car that arguably is marginally faster than I am on a straight. There's other parts of the racetrack where I can give Valentino a good working over and make him earn his spares in that second place. Now this is going to be interesting behind there because you've got Sheldon van der Linde and Dan Harper lining up in fourth and fifth position as well. Fred Vervish in what is now the leading Audi, the CompTU number 11. And then the K-Pax and Iron Lynx Lamborghinis trying to charge through, through the Valiante Ascari. There's the Ferrari 296. A couple of drivers running wide, it seems, on the exit of the Valiante Ascari in the top six. Now there is the 63 Lamborghini in the background there, the Jordan Pepper car, under pressure from Simon Gachet into Parabolica. They're going to try and work their way forward. There is the Ferrari 296, the leading car there. That is Rivera in the number 51. They are currently 17th and 22nd, those two cars. As up the inside comes the number 12, gone to you, Audi. That is Hutchison getting the move there on Malikin. Good move, a courageous move down the inside. Sometimes it pays off, sometimes it doesn't, because it means you're on, on that narrow entry into Parabolic or Alberto curve. It restricts then your ability to get off that curve quicker than the car you've just overtaken. The undercut is always available, but this time Hutchinson has done a good enough job to consolidate his overtake and move forward. Christian Engelhardt trying to take on Jordan Pepper as well as they move forward. I think Simon Gachet has got through. Yes, he has. And watching the background, that's the McLaren. Oh, and a spin. That is Rolf Heineken. Heineken in the Lamborghini has beached it on the way through, he's beached it into the Retifilio. Now, was that a driver error or did he get a bit of assistance? That's something, again, maybe we'll get a little glimpse of it later because, oh, in the front left, front tire on the ID, has that been a tire cut down? And that's the car Lorenzo Patrese. Is that oh. a brake lock or a tire? Certainly he spoke off that left front, and I think it's a, well, I think it's maybe a cut down tire. Yeah, unfortunately, we, oh, that's the, one of the Lamborghinis stopped out on the circuit as well. That's Kay Van Berlo. So he was the one that was with Rolf Heineken as they went through to the Retifilio. So that tells us a little bit of an interesting moment there. I think Heineken and Van Berlo may have had an incident and Patrese has picked up damage as a result of it. Anything is possible in this early phase, but what is clear is that Billy Bang is leading in relative terms comfortably. Valentino Rossi doing an excellent job consolidating his second place. And Maro Engel's progress seemingly has now been somewhat halted and he's got the pressure of Sheldon van der Linde directly behind and then Dan Harper. Right, we just got told the full course yellow is coming out. Five, four, three, two, one, full course yellow now. There we go, full course yellow on the circuit. That is for the latest incident. And what did we say about, uh, you know, incidents breeding incidents? Unfortunately, we have got ourselves a full course yellow rather than a safety car, of course. So well, safety cars frequently follow full course yellows but it will be a call made by race director as to whether that will be something he wishes to do. Probably in this early phase in the race, everybody is still, in relative terms, close together. Uh, so we wait to see whether the race director wants to make that call or he might feel that uh, it would be fine to go racing without a, without a safety car. So, so far, it is BMW 1 and 2. I think Maro Engel needs to close up a little bit more. And, of course, the Lamborghini is sitting there. That's the reason why... With, so was that a was that a was that an assist? Oh, oh there my we are! Goodness! Hop, skip, and a jump. But one ID goes over the front of the Lamborghini. Another one hits the rear of the car. So he's punch board and countersunk by the two Audis. So Patrese pitched him into a spin, but one of the Audis actually hit him in relation to that, so that he had to get out of the draft. He had to get out of the way of it, and in getting out of the way, he opened up the steering angle a bit, and there's nothing Patrese can do but hit him. So there we see one of the recovery vehicles already moving into the middle of the Retrofilio chicane to pick up the, 
the Lamborghini and once again the marshals at this part of the racetrack are basically probably some of the busiest people on the racetrack. It looked like the Com to you Audi. I can only guess it might have been Hutchison in the number 12 because we've still got Fred Vervish in the 11 car. There is the damage that's taken to Patrese's car. Bodywork, you can see there the, the front of the part of the splitter is damaged. That car's going to go back into the garage because oh. the only way they can work at it uh, with a number of people rather than just the two mandatory is back in the garage. So what a disappointment for Lorenzo Patrese who had really been outstanding all the way through the weekend. But you know, the reality of racing is there are disappointments as well as high, po high points. Yes, indeed. Everybody's been talking up the 17-year-old after his performances through free practice, through pre-qualifying and through the qualifying session this morning. Let's see if we can have a look at what really happened, because I think that was really started by the first Audi going rodeo. Let's have a look. So there is Rolf Anakin, and it is the 12, I think. It's just, I mean, it just was never going to make the corner in the first place. So then the Lamborghini's compromised, then Lorenzo Patrese had the Lamborghini coming back across. He had nowhere really to go, so it was more unfortunate for Patrese. Now the Lamborghini again, almost did he tag it a second time? No, he didn't, he managed to avoid that. So Patrese was unfortunate because he was really innocent in all that incident, uh, but has a penalty, or not the penalty is he's had to go into the pits and the car's back into the garage to have work carried out on him. Well, how on earth has Finley Hutchison in the Com to You Racing Audi, or was it Max Hoffer in the number 21? It was one of the two Com to Yous for definite, but how on earth are they still circulating after that barrel roll into the Well, I mean, it depends, it, it depends the angle of, a, of contact. So it looked like the Audi just was hit, clipped a part of the rear of the Lamborghini that didn't really do much damage to the Audi, but what it did, it set the Lamborghini into a spin, which then is how Ricardo, or sorry, Ricardo <laughs> Daddy, how Lorenzo Patrese found himself the, sort of the unwitting sort of victim of that incident. Yeah, unfortunate when you lose the car under braking, that's how it happens. Let's have a look at the Gold Cup uh, rankings at this moment in time. So it is the number five McLaren that leads the way. Charlie Fagg in the Optimum car. They're 11th overall at the moment. Nicholas Crutton in the WRT BMW number 30. And then the Comtu Racing Audi of Max Hoffer is 20th. Then the Winwood Russell, uh, Winwood Racing cars of uh, Russell Ward and Nicholas Bourne. They're fourth and fifth. And then Rolf Heineken, if he can get started again in the Lamborghini, in sixth position. So those are the Gold Cup cars. There are only six of them because obviously we lost the Boots and VDS Audi uh, with clutch problems at the start, but it's looking good for the Optima McLaren, currently running in 11th. Yes. There is, there's the car, they moved up to 12th, look, the yeah. champions from last year. Yeah, I'm just looking, timing and scoring. Well, there it is, I can walking away. Oh so that car isn't going to continue, it's going to be trailered away by the, the security at the circuit. So and I again, think look at, I mean, this part of the racetrack, I mean, only 10 minutes earlier, it was littered in bodywork and carbon fiber and whatever, having just had it all cleaned up. So turn one, there is the Lamborghini, it's going to be either dragged, I'm not quite sure, they, they have got the ability, there are pickup points in the, the roof of these cars where they can be lifted and removed, but in this instance it's being pulled. And they've got Kay Van Berlo's Lamborghini off to the side oh, as no, well. No, no, this is going to be a bit funny, of course, the, the, the recovery vehicle is going one way, the Lambo wants to go another way. <laughs> so there's nobody in the Lamborghini steering it, it's just, it's just whatever the car's... The car decided yeah, to do what it wants to do. Yeah, it's going to do what it's going to do, you might right. Well, here's Chris Roggert, who is currently sat behind uh, Hubert Haupt in the Haupt Racing Mercedes. So they've made big progress. They're actually sitting third at the moment in the, I think they're third in the Bronze Cup, aren't they? They're running it just behind Louis Proctor in the WRT BMW and Louis Pret, who is the other McLaren that leads the class. Yeah, Chris Fogger started from the 12th row of the grid, so that was 23rd, 24th. He's currently still running in 23rd position, so he's got a net-net situation in terms of gain or loss over the opening laps. He's certainly in the hunt for the podium, though, because they're sat in fourth position in class, the Sky Tempesta McLaren, so that bodes well for the second stint. There's still two hours and 34 minutes to go. You know, <laughs> Positive it, thinking uh, here, John. I, I, you, Positive yeah, I, thinking. No, no. Listen, that's what the team do. <laughs> but you know, there's an awful lot of motor racing, and I hope it isn't fragmented as we've seen it so far, basically in the opening sort of 
half hour or so, just under half hour. It's elementary, my dear Watson. It, well, it sometimes is actually use your brain. <laughs> Indeed. Chris Froggart, though, is doing just that, sat in fourth position at the moment, behind Hubert Haupt. It's a good opportunity for McLarens to get two cars on the podium, but as you said, there's a long, long way to go, and there are 16 cars still competing for the Bronze Cup. Just a, I like looking at these onboard shots of drivers and the, the, the way they sit in the car. Look at Chris Froggart. Chris is a, a large guy. I mean, by large, I mean, he's quite tall. And he's sort of sitting in what I would call a more like a, a leaning over the steering wheel rather than leaning back. And he's, because he's tall, he's maybe having to lean his head down to go look forward rather than having his head at a more level. Just one of those little details a, a former driver might just pay attention to. But again, what I notice with racing drivers is how often do you see them blinking? And the reason they don't blink, a little sad, is Valentino a blinker or not? Well, he's having a few, I think. Or maybe that's just a bit of break up on the, on the camera, on the onboard camera. So certainly a, a study of concentration, that is for sure. Just trying to get a little bit of temperature into the tires, not being aggressive in uh, his steering use. Some drivers like to really put a lot of load into the tire, into the sidewall of the tire in these circumstances to keep tire temperature. The other thing you've got to be aware of is that you don't use your brakes anywhere near as aggressively as you do on a race lap. So you've got to get some brake temperature. You can just simply use that by, if you're a left foot breaker, just apply some brake at different parts of the circuit, even on the straights, just to keep that temperature Safety in the discs and as they've had. Right, safety car in this lap. It's worth pointing out at this point that the potential weaker link in the chain in the 46 WRT, Valentino Rossi, is still in second place. And most of this race, he's had to just keep the car on the straight now behind a safety car. Now, if he can hand the car over to Martin and Farfus in the top three, there's a really great chance that they can take over. Now, down in the pit lane, Gemma is with Lorenzo Patrese, I do believe. Pietro, obviously the car looks like it's being retired. Very disappointing. What do you make of what happened with the accident? What did you see? Yeah, I didn't um, already know what happened in uh, in particular, but uh, yeah, it's a shame to end up the race uh, so early. Uh, but that's that's racing that uh, things that uh, can happen. And um, but the championship is is really long, and uh, we will do everything to to come back stronger. And uh, we had the, we showed already. Um, a really nice pace this weekend, especially in the Friday, in um, in uh, Saturday, and um, we will do our best to to come back stronger. Yeah. That's Thank you very much. Up. Thank you. Pietro Deleguenti there speaking to Gemma Scott. How difficult was that? Because obviously, what you've got to remember is that that was the car that was the fastest of all in pre-qualifying yesterday. They had a great chance not just to get the silver cup win; they could even have contended for the overall. Again, I don't I was on old and, cr and grouchy, but. That was yesterday. <laughs> it's in the history books. It doesn't make it any difference. What happens now is real live motor racing, and that's all that matters. And again, watch this battle for green. second and third position. Right, here we go. Sheldon van der Linden looks like he's going to make an attack on Mauro Engel into the first corner here. He's already shaping him up as Philip Eng leads. Valentino Rossi in second, then Engel versus van der Linden. Watch for van der Linden. He's going to try and go around the outside. And Valentino Rossi's left his braking very early. Mauro Engel going to go sweep around the outside. And they bang doors. Valentino Rossi trying to hold it around the outside. Holds it into third position. But Mauro Engel, a force of nature not to be fought against. No, that was again typical of a professional driver. Mauro Engel knows the Mercedes inside out. He knew where he could break and he put a load of pressure on Valentino Rossi. Rossi tried to respond, but there was just too little room left as they transfer from right to left going through that first chicane. But look, I mean, Rossi's not given up on the position. He thinks, well, I've got a quick car on a straight line, and if I can get myself under the rear wing of the Mercedes, possibility of making a pass as we make the run down into Parabolica or Alvaredo, whatever we want to call it. Or if not there, at the next lap, as they'll go on to, will be lap, this is lap uh, 12 we're on, onto lap 13, there will be an opportunity. But again, you know how much quicker uh, we see Mario Engel was through Lesmo 2 than Rossi. So he's been able to stretch that gap fractionally. And that'll be the strength that Engel has got. He's just got too much experience and he knows where he can push and how much he needs to push. But Sheldon, Sheldon van der Linde will be more of a concern to Rossi than Rossi will be a concern to Mauro Engel. 
that's what I think anyway. Absolutely. I think you've got a good point there from Sheldon van der Linde, who's already trying to put Valentino Rossi off down into the breaking point for the Valiante Alboreto. Now, behind the top five, sixth position is Fred Vervish, and an incident has been noted by the officials, uh, a car gaining position by cutting the chicane. Now, this is a good little battle further back. The McLarens are going door to door. This is Fag and Brent, and they've also got the Lamborghini in the mix there. That is the 63 of Jordan Pepper. I mean, that is door-to-door -door racing at high speed. And you can do it. Audi and the Lamborghini coming side by side. Audi has got the advantage at the moment because it's on the inside coming down into. But it'll all change because breaking of the inside, you've got to break that a little bit earlier. And the McLaren has now gained that position. Audi tries to go back around the outside, but McLaren just about manages to retain the position and takes it away. It'll do for now. Here come the Ferraris. Now, this is the first proper racing green laps of the Ferrari 296 in the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe. And they are there or thereabouts. Currently, they came across the line in 17th and 18th, Rovera and the Piaguidi. So they're trying their best to work their way further forward. There's a little bit of an opportunity here for Hoofer to try and work his way further forward, battling away there with Maxi Gutz. So there are our leaders. And, uh, well, first to second, might be about a second and a bit, 1.2 seconds. But second to third is just about half a second. So Rossi is not letting Maro Engel get away. And Max Sheldon van der Linde on this lap is going to find himself maybe under pressure from his young Ulster teammate, Dan Harper. Now, Rossi has got one job. Keep that car in the top five, hand it over to Farfus and Martin with a competitive enough car that hasn't got enough, too, many, too much damage just so that they can be competitive in that top five. That's what they need to do to try and go for the victory. So far, so good. He's following in the wheel tracks of Mauro Engel. Van der Linde's falling into the clutches of Harper to a certain extent. And Vervish and Pereira are really starting to kick on as well. So this is perfect for Rossi for the moment. He just needs to keep it there or thereabouts. But following Engel is the perfect way to keep him in the game. As long as he can maintain the gap that we see here right now, so let's wait and see what that gap is in terms of time. We see visually, so it's probably just under a, a second, I would suggest, as come across the world. It's actually six tenths of a second. He just set the fastest lap of the race, a 148.0. So that's not bad going. That's a feather in the cap for all of the doctors. It's a very, it's a very, very good effort indeed. Right, here it comes the McLaren into the braking zone, battling away with Christian Engelhardt. And now we are on board with Raffaele Marcello, 11th position for the car that won the championship last year. This will be frustration unquantified for Raffaele Marcello, but they still have every opportunity to fight back. Indeed, I mean, look, there's pit stops to come. We know that penalties will be probably, somebody will be penalized for a pit lane speed limit offense, or it might be something uh, you, during the pit stop, somebody does something incorrect, and that's a penalty as well. There's lots, lots more to go. We've got two hours and 26 minutes of this three hour event to run. And look, if you want to look down, that's the top five or top six, top ten even for that matter, that uh, Raffaele Marcello, there we see him just coming out of Lesmo too. You've just got to be patient, because if you're too eager, if you're too keen, that's sometimes where you find yourself getting yourself into trouble. So the leading gold car is the McLaren number five of Charlie Fagg. The leading AM car is Louis Pret in the McLaren. The leading pro AM car is Comandini in the BMW down in 29th position. So that was the view from Marcello's car looking at the rear of the McLaren. Charlie Fagg in 10th position, so can the Mercedes, is, he hasn't really got any more he can do to find a way around. I do want to pick up the story of the leading silver because that was the Tracer Attempto Audi of uh, Lorenzo Patrese. By the way, that incident, they're going to take no further action on it. So Rolf and Eichen and Lorenzo Patrese. Oh, big stop there for the cop to you, Audi coming into the pits. That was a big slide for Vervish. Yeah, well, he had to get on the brakes big time because he was going way, way too quick, and that would have been a penalty uh, for a speed limit infringement on the entry into the pit lane. But no, to pick up on the leader of the silver category now, that is Hutchison in the Comte Audi number 12 in front of Cristani in the Lamborghini. And in third position in that category, it is the Mercedes of Gustafsson, the number 90 car. Now, they're having a look at the left rear quarter of Vervish's Audi. I think they've got damage to that car somehow. Well, the wheel comes off and the wheel goes back on again, so it wasn't either a, a cut-down tyre or an issue with the tyre, so they were taking that off to have a look behind the wheel to see if there's any obvious damage to some of the suspension components of quick eyeball and send it again, send it. But they are being noted for overtaking by cutting the chicane, that incident, car number 11, 
Fred Vervish. So I don't know what that's going to do in terms of, you know, how is that going to affect them moving forward? But certainly the pit stop not going to help them in the slightest as that promotes everybody. So let's have a look at it. Oh, yes, that's, look at that. He's really struggling to get that car into the pits. He almost catches the McLaren. Well, he got sideswiped almost. You can see that right left rear. I mean, the tire, the wheel has stayed in touch. So that's why when the car came in, they took the wheel nut off, put the wheel back on again. Very unusual to see a, a rear wheel do that and not actually detach from the car. So look at the gap, first to second, still fairly constant, 1.3 seconds, up a tenth of a second. Valentino Rossi, 0.6 behind, and 0.5 of a second behind him is uh, Sheldon van der Linde, and a further 0.4 behind him. Dan Harper, so BMW, our top five, with the exception of second place Maro Engel in his Mercedes and uh, that's the team Alomar. We've got about 24 minutes before you're going to start seeing the pit stops frenzy. Here comes the move from the McLaren. Fag is going around the outside of Engelhart down to the Retifilio. Can't quite make that one turn around the outside of the Porsche. And now Raffaele Marcello senses an opportunity to try and get on Charlie Fag's back bumper. Back on the throttle, out of the Retifilio and through the Curva Grande. But that's where experience pays. Matt Marcello was watching that, and he's thinking, well, Fag is focused on trying to find a way past Christian Engelhardt. He probably doesn't really remember that I'm actually right on his rear wing anyway. So while Fag's concentration will be more forward, look, watch what Marcello's doing. He's just going to work over the McLaren, corner by corner, little straight, long straight, whatever straight it is, and that's where you get, that's why you get drivers who are successful. It's not just because they're fast, it's because they've got the capacity to work out. Oh, and if I say that, he himself runs very wide in the exit of Les Mutu. That is a very rare driving error for Raffaele Marcello. There. Takes, takes me back to Raffaello about four years ago, and that was a regular occurrence. Well, yes, indeed. I mean, this is obviously the ASP Agonis team on the back foot, and they are desperately trying to make something come together. Do they have to wait for the pit stops, or does something spectacular have to happen? Well, pit stops... Oh, what's happened to the Audi? That's just the that's the Spurvish's Audi getting out of the way and letting everybody well, through. Well, there's a bigger problem than that. The pace he's going at, it looks like he's going to go back into the pit lane. Yeah, it could well be a wheel bearing issue or a suspension failure, whatever it might be. But certainly getting out of the way and letting everybody go. Or is that Hoffer? No, that's Hoffer in the other car. So that's two Contiu Audis then struggling. I think that's Hoffer in the sister car having a similar problem. Well, certainly the car was going slowly and it wasn't just to let other people go past. So, again, pressure car coming 96 for Valentino Rossi. Back one position. Oh. 96, 35, gaining one position, so he must give it back. Right, that's the Porsche of the Rutronek squad of Dennis Olsen. He's gained a position and he's just been ordered by race control to hand the position back. Correct, and that's how it should be. So there is a battle, Pro Cup battle for third between the two... BMW teams. Valentino Rossi versus Sheldon van der Linde. Oh, oh. big accident at the Retifilio. Porsche. That Porsche. is that is the Ivan Jacoma car, isn't it? The 24. It's Lidvala who is at the wheel, but that's that's gone in hard. That's definitely going to be a full course yellow at the minimum. Yes, you can see the right front of the car and bodywork heavily damaged. The car spins across the racetrack, across the grass, as we go back to this battle for basically third place. But again, there's a slight seesaw between third third place Rossi. Fourth place, Van der Linde. Uh, would like to have a lip. I'm sure we've got images of it somewhere and get a glimpse as to see whatever went wrong or whether that was a, a, a mechanical issue, a driver issue, or, or a third party issue. The insurance underwriter will want to know that one very clearly. Well, that was a big one for Nicky Ludwig. As up the inside, that is the Comte to you Audi number 21 of Max Hoffer, I think, making the move as we head towards sector one. We're obviously completing the end of the lap and going through the Variante Albaretto or the Parabolica. We've got a yellow flag in yep. sector one. That's for the car that has gone off. That is Nicky Ludwig, the uh, Porsche, and they are stationary on the run to the first corner. Maybe he's been able to get the car off the racing line so that we can head down double wave yellows on the approach to Body the work in the middle of the racetrack. I can see it even from here. Yes, that, that's a, a big spot. Of, it was a rear wing or something, whatever it is. Everybody's having to stay on the left-hand side of the racetrack as they would come down into the first chicane uh, where others would be trying to look up the inside and try and sneak down and make a make an overtake. So here we are on board with the Sky Tempesta McLaren. Oh, look at the oh. bodywork. Oh, dear. Not again. I mean, this corner is going to get a complex with all the damage that's been carried out on it. 
Well, fortunately, everybody has spotted it. They're going to try and remove it under double wave yellows rather than under full course yellow. They can certainly clear the car. It's not the car I'm concerned with. It's putting marshals onto the track to clear away, again, a load of carbon fibre. Well, still, they continue to battle away. Philip Eng and Mauro Engel in front of Rossi, van der Linde, Harper and Pereira. Four BMWs, the Merc and the Lamborghini. Let's have a look at what happened then at the first corner. Oh, contact. Oh, and that was a big hit. A hit actually at a marshal's post. Look at the damage to the front of the car. But more importantly, when the car turned sharp left, it was actually had a, a flag marshalling post. I saw the marshal diving as he saw the car coming to get fo to fall down. And that was a heavy impact. I mean, the car was still travelling maybe up to 200 kilometres per hour at the point when that impact took place. Well, that was the mother of all shunts into the barrier on the approach to the Retifilio. So uh, a bit of a scary one, but we do n we, we do believe that Nicky Lutvala is out of the car. So that is the main thing at the very least. Yes, I mean, with the, the kind of safety now we have in race cars, you'll get a, a big impact. Uh, but with the hands device, hands and neck device, that is a mechanism to avoid the whiplash that used to be a big part of an impact like that. And of course, the six point seat belts in the car and the very specialized seats that are now in use with all race cars. So let's look at it again. No, we're going to, so there it goes backwards. Look at the My bodywork. Gosh. Goodness me, that was a heavy, heavy, heavy shunt. Now, I think we're about to find out which car it was that helped him to do that as it's going to come into shot. Oh, I hoped it was going to come into shot because they got away with it. But unfortunately, we didn't quite see. But I have a feeling that it's going to be picked up by the officials, of course. Car 81, yellow flag infringement noted. So an interesting situation there. Rima Jafali, I think it is, that has uh, been noted for a yellow flag infringement. So two Porsches coming together there in the first corner, and that was marginal contact. But at that point on the circuit, uh, no, it's, 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 there is no marginal contact. Uh, marginal contact is just enough to set a car off because everything is so delicately balanced. So what's going on? That's so the boots and VDS crew. Yeah, just are well, they preparing for, let's say, an early stop as they well, I don't know why the Ferrari is pulling out from behind the BMW because you, you're not allowed to overtake. Other than he just wants to get some air into the air intakes for the flashing his lights. Maybe he wants them to get a move on because I think that's what it is. The gap between well, the BM and those that you're meant to keep no more than a five car gap between each car. Well, no, we're not the other the gap is much bigger than a five car gap. We're not under full course yellows. Oh, we're not, we're, car, we? racing, no, we're, we're still racing. Oh, we never even okay. we never even went to full course yellows. That's the thing. They've been trying to control that incident under, under, under wave yellow flags, under wave yellow flags. So we, we are still under racing conditions in sectors two and three. Oh, OK, so the Ferrari is now making its first proper attack. Rivera is trying to take on Lewis Proctor in the BMW, and behind them, you've also got Alessandro Piguidi trying to get Maxi Gotts. Here comes the Ferrari. And the Ferrari way quicker coming through Alvaredo. You can see the pace the Ferrari had, just simply much, much quicker. Just more grip, and therefore able to get the power down earlier and use it and pull away from Lewis Proctor in his BMW. So uh, maybe Ferrari gradually, slowly, are beginning to find how to make this two 96 Ferrari actually work. I think the yellow flags have actually now been withdrawn, so we can go racing again in sector one. Yes, the racetrack has now apparently gone green. Maxi Gutz trying to get his move on Lewis Proctor. BMW versus Mercedes, and keeping a watching brief behind them is Alessandro Piguidi in the Ferrari. And behind them, you've got Dennis Olsen in the Porsche, who I think has already conceded the place he had to. So now we're going to see if Maxi Gutz in the other ASP Aquidis. Mercedes could try and make the move on the WRT BMW of Lewis Proctor, who is currently, of course, fighting for the win in the bronze category. So there is the Ferrari just hustling Maxi Gutz behind as well. They come into Lesmo 2 and onto the run to the Valley Anti Ascali. Finally, the Ferrari starting to look racy. Yeah, no, that's what I said. I, you know, I noticed that coming through, that when the pass was made on Lewis Proctor. The Ferrari had clearly a lot more bite and grip in the corner and as a consequence had the ability to get the throttle open, get the power down, and then he's just managed to pull away very quickly. And the second, the sister car to the 51, I think it is, is uh, not too many cars behind the BMW likewise. So we've got Philip Eng still leading the way as he has done for the entirety of this race. Mardo Engel in second place in the Mercedes, one second back. Valentino Rossi keeping it nice and tidy in third position in the WRT BMW number 46. Sheldon van der Linde, 
trying to keep close to him. Three tenths of a second between the two WRT BMW teammates. Slippery oil flags down at the Retifilio because of the debris that is still at various points of the apex. And we had, that was uh, Gache. That was Gache in the Santa Lock. So the Santa Lock Junior Audi going straight on there at the Retifilio. And he's going to have to concede any ground that he may have earned which I think he may have had to do or has already done. No, I think he's only lost one place yeah. to Pereira. So that was, I mean, I don't understand why, because just an error, that's a driver error. And I mean, it's, 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 you know where you can break in these conditions. He just seemed to overshoot and uh, as a consequence, had to take the escape route. Right, Sheldon van der Linde starting to get irritated behind Valentino Rossi, trying to put him off as now they work through further back. This is the Tracer Orange number 40. This is Fella all over the back of Louis Pret in the uh, leading bronze McLaren. So uh, Ricardo Fella in the Trezor Orange 1 Audi trying to make the bids. Here are the Pro Cup leaders leading the way. Eng, Wittmann and Yellily. And Philip Eng has led the whole race so far. But Mauro Engel is definitely not done yet. I think what Mauro Engel has now found himself, he's found himself in a position where he's not able to do anything with the race leading BMW, but he's able to control what Valentino Rossi would like to do. In other words, the pace that Maro Engel's running at is... Rafa, sorry, go again. <laughs> <laughs> Valentino hasn't got the pace to, to re-overtake or overtake uh, the second place Mercedes. So here comes the number five, McLaren, trying to work its way forward. That's Charlie Fang, sat behind Engelhardt's Porsche, but in front of Raffaele Marcello, and they are leading goal. Yeah, and Marcello's been behind the McLaren now, what, four laps? And he still hasn't found a way. I, th I thought he might have been able to give the McLaren a bit of a harder time, but he's realizing that the pace, the straight line pace oh. that the McLaren has got. Did Rossi overshoot? I think Rossi may have overshot a little bit there into the Retifilio, and that could give Sheldon van der Linde the chance to leapfrog him as we look briefly. Yeah, he's, he's out! He's out! Not yet. He's oh. going again. He had he a had problem on the way out. Whatever he did, that was either a, a, a mechanical problem, I doubt more likely a driver error, which I would like to see the replay of before I completely crucify him. Well, I wondered if the car had a mechanical problem and that's what caused him to overshoot, but it looks like you might be right in the sense that I, he just got a little bit of a difficult line into the Retifilio and he must have caught the curb on the way through and Possibly. maybe spun the car. Possibly. Uh, again, you know, just traffic behind you, you've got to be careful. So <sighs> Sheldon van der Linde was the car directly behind. That's so frustrating. Let's figure out what happened to Valentino Rossi as he tries to get back up to full strength again. Here he comes. So he's staying close all the way down to keep Sheldon van der Linde. Just doesn't get the car slowed oh. down enough, 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 enough. And then he makes the, sort of the sin of going across the curbing. And then Mrs. Bassett, he's out of gear. He's having to pull gears. Oh. Look, he's pulling gears. And he's basically, the engine's almost on sort of limp hold mode. What's going on? He's thinking, why am I going to get this car rolling again? So that was... Once it started to go wrong, panic station set in for Valentino Rossi, and um, just a, a very, very minor error led to you know, significant consequences. Such a shame. 48 minutes of brilliance from Valentino Rossi, and then one error, and it's all fallen away. Long faces at WRT, and rightly so. Well, Eve Vers, the gentleman there with the beard, part owner of the WRT operation. But I noticed this Valentino is getting a little bit more oversteer, in the, particularly going through a right-hand corner, than I noticed earlier in the race. So I'm wondering, again, I referred to tyres at the start of the race. This is a, a fast circuit, high-speed circuit. You've got to look after your tyres. You've got to do an hour stint. And I wonder, maybe, maybe, is that maybe in addition to what occurred here one lap ago? So Rossi now in 14th position in the WRT BMW, but Max Hofer fancies his chances of getting past the greatest of all time in motorbikes. Here he comes, trying to make his move through Curva Grande. Is he going to make a bid now into the Variante della Rocia? Hunting down the move. Rossi trying to go defensive. Max Hofer has nothing to lose. And well, that looks like uh, Augusto Farfas is gearing up, ready to take over from him. But Rossi did defend well. Yes, he did. I'd like to see that entry into the corner rather than saying Farfas has been in a Barraclava helmet, but there we are. You can't get them right all the time. Look again, look, the back of the BMW, I said it a lap ago, yep. I said it again, there is a problem with the left rear tire, and that to me looks like the tire is probably beginning to overheat and grip is going away. He's done his best to hold on to it to the, for the time being, but dropping down to 14th in that little moment, and now trying desperately to get back into position again. So uh, he's almost got uh, pressure from not just Max Hofer, but also Rodavera in the Ferrari 296. 
but teams are now starting to get ready for driver changes. I think they just want to uh, give Valentino Rossi an early bath because he's done an awful lot of hard work here, but I think it's inevitable they need to change it up. Well, I think the earliest that realistically they'll bring him in is when the clock gets down to two hours and around about five or maybe four minutes, because if they're coming in any earlier, then that's going to Drive upset. Drive true penalty to car triple eight. Drive true penalty car triple eight. Right, that Working is Working on the car in the working lane while the engine was on. Yes. Oh dear, yes, that's so Owen Creed. Uh, yeah. That's another visit to the pits for them then. Well, you know, this is where these races are won and lost. And it's not just what takes place on the circuit, it's what goes on in the pit lane. And if you make an error in your pit lane, the penalty is even greater than the pit stop in itself on occasions. So Louis Pret is leading the Bronze Cup, as we know, in 11th position in the McLaren. Louis Proctor still running second in that class and uh, Hubert Haupt in the Mercedes running in third position. Chris Roggett still hunting down that podium. Still plenty of opportunities for them to take it. And then the Porsche is following in pursuit. Right here is Maxi Goetz and Alessandro Beguidi. Mercedes versus Ferrari. And then we've got uh, Dennis Olsen in front of Hubert Haupt. Hutchison, Froggett, Cristani. And then there's Malikin in front of the 57 of Russell Ward. And they are obviously battling for the Bronze Cup as well. So. Uh, sorry, no, they're battling for the pro Ab Cup, I do apologise. So, uh, an interesting challenge for them as they continue to try and work their way forward. There is the 15 in trouble by the look of it. Yes, that's the Italian squad. Once, no, no, it's the pro Ab Cup leaders, I do apologise. So, uh, they're still having a very sturdy run. They've actually just got past Bourne in the Winwood Mercedes. They're running in the Gold Cup, of course. And uh, they're just in front of Yuan Bastar, who, of course, has come up from the GT4 European Series last year. He won that title and has now moved up into the GT World Challenge Europe and is finding it very tough going in the number 26 Audi. But he's uh, still there for the count, still yes. there to battle away with the Santalock Junior team. BMW Italia. So looking all the way down and from the exit out of the Ascari chicane. And the straight has never gotten any shorter, but it appears to get shorter at the pace that we're seeing in these GT3 cars. Uh, just every racetrack we go to, it just seems to get quicker and quicker and quicker. As the gap, first to second gap is actually reduced to under a second, by the way. We've got a great little battle developing here for the Silver Cup. Hutchison currently holds it in the Comp to you, but look behind the Sky Tempesta McLaren. That's the second place car in the Silver Cup. That is the Lamborghini of Fabrizio Crestani, the Grasso Lamborghini number 58. So they're challenging for the Silver Cup win. And down in third in the Silver category, we've got Juan Bastar in his first race in the GT3. And he is looking at a podium. Good way to start a career. Absolutely it is. So Goetz versus Birguidi still going strong. Dennis Olsen still giving them pressure. But here comes that battle for the Silver Cup. There is the car in second place in silver. That is Fabrizio Cristani, currently hustling Chris Froggatt in the Sky Tempesta McLaren as we start to get towards pit stop territory. Yes, I mean, it's still six minutes in effect before most teams will think about coming in. Some might want to run a lap, maybe more or longer, but again, the pit lane will all of a sudden get very busy, and it's a, not a, it's, a, it's a big pit lane here at Monza, but with the 55-car field, which is probably now down to 52 cars, it's still very, very tight, and really what you'd like to do is speak to your neighbours and say, well, here's what we're planning to do. Can you help us make sure that we don't trip over one another when uh, one's coming in, one's going out? So we've got several cars now out of the race. I think we're down to 46, because I think we've just lost the other Get Speed Mercedes. I think they've had a mechanical problem and pulled it into the pits. So neither of the Get Speed Mercedes come around. Yeah, look at that left rear tire. You picked it up, John. He's an absolute sitting target with Rivera bearing down on him in the Ferrari. I mean, I, I don't know what he's done because it didn't look like Valentino when he was in the opening laps was unduly loading the car. But uh, certainly there's something which I consider is going to make it a difficult oh and again just a very sharp quick move to get from right over to left so what's it like on the exit is he struggling no it looks not too bad on the exit out of the retafilio chicane but the ferrari all over the back of rossi rivera in the first of the two two nine six ferraris and that car we knew earlier had very good pace particularly coming off uh, the old uh, or they knew I should call it Alboreto. Well, interesting, because Valentino Rossi is being hunted down by a Ferrari. Wasn't it about uh, 17 years ago that there were rumours circulating that he might switch careers and go and drive a Ferrari in Formula One? 
And if history had played out a little differently, he might have been sat in that Ferrari that he's currently being chased by. Oh, it's a lot of ifs and ands and buts. Mad Panda, an early stopper. So the car into the pits just two, uh, well, just under the, the, the one hour, so by 56 minutes. So that's a pit stop. Probably a wise thing for Mad Panda to do, to come in early, pit lanes clear, there's no pressure. So get the job done, get the car turned around, get it back out again. And you know, undoubtedly, that pit stop will earn them, that's almost what I would call free places. And you know what? They're not the only team to have decided to do that. This is Rossi's replay as he's being hustled by Max Hofer in the CompTU Audi. But uh, I don't think they're the only team that decided to go with an early pit stop. Philip Sega has brought the dynamic GT Huber Racing Porsche 55 into the pits as well to try and avoid the traffic. So uh, they obviously thought there was a good idea. There is the number 55, but there's more to it than meets the eye, perhaps. Yes, I don't know why they pulled up the bonnet or oh, the clip on the right-hand side. So I'll do the do the left. I'll do the left and let the right one get locked. There we are now. That's it now. So <laughs> just you had to undo the one on the left to let the bonnet get parallel between the two clips, and then they could close them both successfully. Yeah, my glove box does that. Is that a bad sign? Uh, it depends. It depends. <laughs> I'll not make any further comment on what you do in your glove box. <laughs> But this Sheldon van der Linde, again, they're closing the gap to Maro Engel. And Maro Engel has closed that gap, but it was a fraction under one second. It's now three thousandths of a second above that one second. But the gap between first to third has closed on. Dan Harper's further second behind Sheldon van der Linde. All four cars covered by 2.6 seconds. Right, Dennis Olsen has been one of the first big names to bring his car into the pits then. They decided to jump the gun and... Uh, try and uh, negate the situation there and bring everybody in. And I think uh, Alexei Nezov has just done the same thing in the other Mad Panda car. Oh, no, sorry, he's coming back out onto the pits, having done so. But there is Sheldon van der Linde, still trying to stay with Mato Engel and releasing Valentino Rossi from him has definitely given him a better run at the Mercedes up front. And his lap times have been very strong. So we could still see a potential BMW eclipse of the podium the way this is going. Still a long way to go. I'm always sort of realistic about endurance races. So there we see. Augusta, no, no, it's not Augusta Far. That's the 32 it is. car. Yeah, it is. It is. That's Augusta Far first getting ready. And to uh, welcome Valentino Rossi back into the pit lane. It's been a valiant effort from the doctor. But Here he comes. So he is into the pit lane now. Slow the car down. And that's it. WRT will. Oh, he's, that he's angry. The, yeah, well, it should be. He made an error. But don't unrelease, don't release the buckle. You can, un, you can undo the shoulder straps. If you release the buckle before you come to a pit stop, that's another penalty. So I don't know what he was doing. His hand looked to me to be quite low. I hope he didn't release the safety belt buckle. Just release the shoulder straps to enable him. So there he is. Oh, he does it now. So and out Valentino gets. A good effort from Valentino Rossi, but he will be absolutely kicking himself yeah, for that he mistake. Will be kicking. Well, BMW have got, you can make adjustments to the pedal box. You can either bring the pedal box nearer to you or further away. You can lift the steering column up or down or bring it further or closer to you. The engineering of Valentino, don't worry about it. You're <laughs> not, nobody's going to hit you, Valentino. We all love you, Valentino. Well, he did a good job. He ran very well up in the top five until that moment where it all just got away from him, but uh, he certainly impressed himself for the majority of that stint. I mean, in, in essence, uh, I think that's probably as good a race as we've seen from Valentino, albeit there was that minor little mistake done at the Retevilio chicane. But it's something he'll learn from. He won't do that again. But, of course, he's, he's made the work of his teammates all that more hard. Right, here comes the McLaren, battling away still with Christian Engelhardt. That's now up to sixth position, that Porsche. These three cars have been more or less tied to each other for quite a number of laps now. So you've got Engelhardt, Charlie Fagg, Raffaele Marcello, who's in eighth position. He had been in tenth for a while, but in eighth position. Right, the pit stops are all going to happen now in the next five minutes. They have to by regulation because the driver in each stint is only allowed a maximum of 65 minutes behind that's, the wheel. That, that's correct. So there we see the Vulcan host BMW uh, having completed its first stint, so it's up on the jacks while the fuel continues to go in and the fuel bowser, the fuel hose must be removed cleanly and clearly before the car can be dropped off. In the past, sometimes teams tried to anticipate the fuel hose being removed and would start the process of dropping the car. 
that's a penalty as well. It certainly is, because you're running the risk of a major fire hazard there. Mato Engel dropping back a little bit from Philip Eng. Eng has picked up the pace of late, and that gap has opened up again to 1.7. So Philip Eng just trying to give himself a little bit more of a gap to play with before the pit stop. Notable that Philippe Eng and his car, the number 98 BMW, hasn't shown any of the that sort of very snappy rear oversteer that we saw from Rossi for maybe the last eight or so laps of a stint, eight, maybe ten laps of the stint. So whether that's simply just down to the style of driving that Philippe Eng has or whether there's a, a difference between the setup of those, the rival teams, Rover Racing and, of course, WRT. So, again, all that will be taken away. The teams will analyse and look at it because with Valentino having that sort of instability at the rear, particularly on the left rear, it made maybe having to compromise in other parts of the circuit. And if you're having to make compromises, then ultimately you're not able to do what you would like to do. So is the leader coming in? No, he's not staying out for one more lap. So he'd probably be in as the, what's that coming in behind? Is that, that is the, that's the 32 coming in. Well, for those who are a little bit critical potentially of uh, the first stint for Valentino Rossi, I can tell you that in the first stint, the fastest lap of the race was set by Valentino Rossi. One minute 47.742, he said. Uh, absolutely, but he, he made an error. So, into the pits comes Van der Linde, Pereira, Engelhart, Pepper and Feller. So that is the BMW, the Lamborghini, the Porsche, the Lamborghini and the Audi. And also in his Maxi God. So Sheldon van der Linde getting out. What a great opening stint for him. Yeah, an excellent drive. I mean, both from Philippe Eng and uh, Sheldon van der Linde and from Dan Harper, for that matter, behind. And they, and, uh, they're over racing BMW, so... It's going to be from now on, uh, because we're nearly at that 65 minute limit for the opening stint. So there is our race leader, and I suspect, I would imagine, anticipating, it don't have to be an Einstein, that these lead two cars are going to be making their way into the pit lane. So I think we're going to see a battle between WRT, the uh, Rove Racing, and of course the Mercedes Almanar crews. Is, those are going to be the ones to fight for the victory in this one as uh, Sheldon van der Linde has obviously got out of the car and he now hands the number 32 BMW over to his teammate Charles Wirtz. Yep. So there is Wirtz moving out uh, and hard on it, as you would imagine. Fresh set of rubber, new fuel load. And oh! This is all, oh, don't get overexcited. This, me, look, there. You know there's going to be cars coming out of the pit lane, so you have to be prepared to see a car coming out and okay you wanted to use the right hand part of the circuit coming down into the chicane and there are our first and second cars coming in as we get up to just one minute really to go before the 65 minute driving stint would have been over but even so the speed difference between the cars coming out of the pits and the one going down the straight that would have been a slight gray hair moment in reality you should be prepared oh no there's a puncture a puncture oh, for the 46 no. i don't believe it it's gone from bad to worse for the Valentino Rossi crew. And it's the same corner that we saw Valentino. Now, oh. I don't understand why that, is it ironic, is it fate, whatever it is, something on that left rear corner was a problem for Rossi because the car was getting unstable at the rear. Now we've got a tire totally flattened and uh, whether that's because he maybe ran over some carbon fiber or whether it's a, another issue we can't anticipate but that is a, i hate to use the term or the word disaster but it is going from bad to worse for the 46 wrt bmw m3 uh, as the pit lane again the rover racing car waiting to be released that's the lead car there it goes so we need to have a little look and see what the pit times are it's all coming thick and fast well that's there, well, look, I mean, nobody could have anticipated that. No, indeed. But it's disastrous as far as the 46 crew is concerned. It's not game over for WRT because they've still got uh, Charles Vietz, uh pushing for the victory up front. They can still get this job done as Marco Wittmann now gets behind the wheel of the 98 Rove car. But, uh, yeah, big moments. So let's see if the red BMW is going to go through. This is going to be a massive amount of ground gain from Marcello as well. Look at that. He's got himself into the top five by the look yeah, of it. Yeah, but I'm looking back at the, at the Mercedes, the 777. I don't know where that is. Oh, Sandy Mitchell nearly oh, get through. Oh, that's a that. big mistake for the Almanar Mercedes. Me. And what a mistake. They made a slow pit stop. They lost ground in that pit stop. And then a massive overrun coming into turn one. All going pear-shaped for 
Well, oh dear me. All that hard work by I'm, Marto Engel, I'm, I'm and it's been undone. I'm going to have to stop talking and I'm going to say something because <laughs> that was just, I mean... Devastating. I'm, I'm going to say nothing because I'm going to say something which would be inappropriate. Well, devastating bad luck for Marto Engel and the crew after all that fantastic run. But their pit stop did not match that of Rover Racing. And that's the reason, I suspect, why that error crept in. Yes, indeed. Well, as a result of that, we've now got Marco Wittmann dueling with Charles Wirtz. BMW versus BMW again. Be interesting to see how these rival teams and uh, different drivers. So, Wittmann in the lead car, uh, in, in effect. Uh, not Wittmann, no, with it. So, Charles Wirtz and uh, then the Rover Racing car that he is chasing down. So, yeah, two teams, same brand of, of manufacturer. Now, we were told that the reason for the number two get speed Mercedes uh, going out of the race uh, was that the fire extinguisher was released and they were hoping to get the car back out again. They haven't managed to do so, but that's the reason why Lance Bergstein had to pull the car into the pits. But I think they have now just changed driver and they're going to get back out again. 88 Mercedes getting a, a real old workout from the Lamborghini behind. And who do they put in? Sandy Mitchell, here we go. Who's in the 88 Mercedes? That's Bogoslavski, yes. So Bogoslavski versus Mitchell. This is going to be a great run to the Retifilio oh. as Bogoslavski defends big time. Sandy Mitchell getting angry behind him. Yeah, but you've got to be careful, Bogoslavski. You're not allowed to make aggressive oh. moves like that. Now, Bogos well, Mitchell will have to give that place up because he wasn't technically ahead of the, of the Mercedes there. He's backed out of it to let Bogoslavski go through. Oh, yes, I think he's backed out of it. Yes, he has. But the danger is he doesn't want to let the... Oh, did oh, you see that? All right. They're all right. They're all right. <laughs> they, they're in the cockpit. They know what they're doing. I mean, they're nudging doors as they went through the curve of Grande. I mean, yeah, that but was... Mitchell had to make sure that he didn't lose a further position. That's very true. Very true. But now in sixth position behind them, you've got Andrea Caldarelli in the number 63 Lamborghini. Now, he's going to be one to uh, fight them out. So, Bogoslavski, Mitchell, Caldarelli, and then Fabian Schiller, who's trying to recover after that error at the first corner. They're down to seventh position now. But this is the battle for fourth position. You've got the Agadis ASP, the K-Pax Lambo, the Iron Lynx Lambo, and now you've got the Mercedes. Here comes Fabian Schiller trying to take on Andrea Caldarelli into the Variante Ascari. Caldarelli holds him at bay for the moment. Still, Fabian Schiller trying to make progress. And look behind them, you've also got Marshall hunting down in the Audi. Well, Dennis Marshall is always going to be a threat wherever you look, but what is good news for the 88 Mercedes is that they've been elevated basically because of a good pit stop and because of errors by others up into fourth place and they're running, what, 7.6 seconds behind Beatman in the lead BMW and I mean, they're going to take that every day, all day long. But it's currently BMW 1, 2 and 3 for Rove, WRT and Rove. They are having an absolute rout at Monza at the moment. Great work from Neil Verhagen, having taken over from Dan Harper. They're now up to third position, of course. Wittmann versus Wirtz in the inter-teams battle. Fabian Schiller, desperate, desperate to make amends for that mistake he made. I, I sat at lunchtime and had a chat with the entire team. Fabian Schiller was there, and nothing indicated in his personality that he's going to get a serious red mist coming down into the first chicane on his first out lap. Or his, no, you can't have a first out lap. You can only have an out lap. Now here comes Sandy Mitchell, trying again. He's going to try and dive in. Oh, that's not going to work. Now that forced, that forced Bogoslavski to go the long way around. But he comes back out and almost not even steams. Now I'll be interested, not only losing one position, he's lost two positions. So that'll be Andrea Caldarelli. He'll have that again. Easy overtake, so he'll be thinking, now I'm going to find a way past Sandy Mitchell. But look up the inside. Oh, I think contact. there was contact. So Fabian Schiller has been like a punchboard counter-strike as we, Valentino Rossi goes through what took place, what was the reason uh, he lost that position. So it is a disaster. I think they've actually retired the number 46 car. I, I'm not surprised because whatever the problem is, yep. it was sort of beginning with Valentino behind the wheel. And you can see his body language and talking to Sheldon van der Linde, who's just given over his car. Very unfortunate. Charles Fitz. So, I mean, it was a very good effort by Rossi, but you know, if I'm a team manager, I'll say, nevertheless, we could have come in in second place. Think about it, and, and then 
don't make the same mistake again. Yeah, absolutely. Because the thing is, Valentino Rossi doesn't want to be treated like a celebrity. He wants to be treated like every other driver in the pits. He knows well, he's it, got a job to do. No, in the team he is treated like everybody else. But so everybody around him who produces you know, this whole issue of Valentino and whatever. The fact is, when you're a professional driver in a professional team, you have to oh. behave. And again, contact. Fabian Schiller getting a cow to him. He's getting really messy. And Pogoslowski just manages to call it. But I think that's going to be a position. Yeah, Schiller's giving it back up to the ID. He had no right, choice. Dennis Marshall wondered what was going on there. Yeah, he had absolutely no choice. I mean, Fabian Schiller normally is a very controlled, but he's almost in a state of panic right now, trying to compensate, make up for that error on his lap. Well, for the lap. Well, for the entirety of the first hour, they were the leading Mercedes, so there's a pressure to get back into that position again at least and try and hunt down for a podium because they were on for one, they were on for second, maybe even for the win. So this is a bit of a problem for Fabian Schiller, and now he's going to have pressure of his own because here comes the WRT BMW of Callum Williams, who is now currently leading the Gold Cup. Yeah, he looks like he's got a, a lovely view of traffic ahead of him, and he can apply the pressure to Fabian Schiller and see how Schiller is going to respond again to a pressure from another brand, but a car not racing in, in the same class that he is in. So all very, very tense. Max Hoffer at number in tense position. In the Audis, he comes through the exit of Ascari. And of course, those two cars, the WRT BMW and the Comte U Audi, are battling for the gold victory in ninth and tenth. No, Sandy Mitchell comes up behind one of the as a back marker as it happens. It's never and the back marker indicated pass me, and the Lamborghini couldn't pass the Mercedes. Andrea Caldarelli likewise is going to think, oh, can I use that car to give me an assist going down the straight? He chooses to go behind Sandy Mitchell to pick up his aerodynamic slipstream as we go back to our race leader and Charles. second place, Charles Vitz. Charles Vitz, he, he is catching. He is absolutely eating into the lead that Marco Wittmann had built up. So they are definitely starting to gain some ground on the Rove BMW. In fact, Neil Verhagen has actually chipped away a little bit at the leaders as well. The gap down to 3.8. I think it was around four and a half a while ago. For Sandy Mitchell and Andrea Caldarelli in the Iron Lynx and Grasso Lamborghinis now in the top five. Well, basically, you've got the two Rover racing cars, first and third, and the two WRT cars in uh, second. And where is it? No, it's only second. So you've got two Rover racing and one WRT car in the top three. Here we go. Charles Vitz is really starting to pressure Mittman. BMWs one, two, and three. The K-Pax and Iron Lynx Lamborghinis giving chase in fourth and fifth. And then Bogoslavski in the championship winning Mercedes from last year. Dennis Marshall in the Audi. Schiller in the Almanar Mercedes. And then Christopher Meese uh, has handed over, of course, to Oh, Christopher, here we go. Now we've got a really fast traffic jam. Lewandowski, the slower car, trying to stay out of trouble here. But this could get very messy into the Valiante Ascari because he's still there on the road, trying not to trip over him. Watch Dennis Marshall because he has got to see opportunity written all over the front of his car at Bogoslowski coming down out of Ascari chicane. And Schiller, the third car, and that pack of three cars just coming into frame now. Marshall looks to have a look down the inside, covered by the Mercedes, equally behind. You've got to be on your toes because Fabian Schiller trying to make amends for the error and a number of errors, in fact, in this first laps of his one hour stint. Well, the Comte to Audi still pressuring Max Hoffer, trying to close up on Callan Williams as he continues to. Work his way further Draw forward. Drive-through penalty to car 81, overtaking under yellow flag. Drive-through penalty 81, overtaking under yellow flag. There you go, that is oh, Alain again, oh. again, again, Bogoslavski makes a mistake and has... Now, he didn't gain a position, but he's gained ground. So he's going to have to come off the throttle, surely. Now, Alain Valent is the one that's going to get the drive-through penalty for going through uh, for overtaking under yellow flags, I think it was, for the Theba Motorsport Mercedes AMG. So uh, that's unfortunate. But yes, Timo Bogoslavski, who has obviously taken over from Daniel Yukadella in this car, and he's finding it very tough to run in the same sort of mode. I just, I need to look, was Bogoslavski behind Marshall or ahead of Marshall before I think that was, occurred? Yeah, he was ahead of Marshall. He was ahead of Marshall, so that's okay. not going to be a problem. Now, this is the victory for the Gold Cup. Battling away as they continue to duel for position. BMW versus Audi. Now, this is on board with Bogoslavski. OK, OK, he was just, again, the pressure from Dennis Marshall, he just overran the braking. Okay, he didn't gain a position, but he gained 
time on the track. So whether he has to give that back up or it's just seen as an incident, there's no no winner or loser per se. But you know, Dennis Marshall might say, well, you know, I think I could have maybe have taken them there. But there we are. Right, incident in. Turn four for cars 83 and 35 are noted. That is Neubauer and Rail Frey, the Iron Danes Lamborghini. So we're not sure what happened, we didn't see it, but there is an incident in turn four, which is the entry to the Valiante della Rocia that's been noted by the officials. So really all the way through the field, you're getting pockets of three or four or five cars, all having really intense inter, sort of intermark battles. So we're coming one hour, 44 minutes. Here comes the move from Max Hoffer, does it? As Callum Williams is having to move across in the braking zone to hold him back. You've got to be absolutely alongside or nose ahead to take that route around the outside. And if the car you're passing wants to be say, obstinate about it and put his car in the middle of racetrack, you know, that's where experience in racecraft plays its part. And that's what's so wonderful about racing as opposed to motor, motor racing is seeing cars going around a racetrack. Racing is the skill and art of knowing where and how to use your equipment. And being a racer, as opposed to a racing driver, big difference between the two descriptions. So here comes Max Hoffer again, trying his best to hustle Callan Williams, but even he's struggling to keep it on the road. Well, he's certainly in the rear of the eye. He's sliding around, just coming through Lesbo 1, launch on the exit of Lesbo 2. Looks a little bit more planted. Well, we had a very dramatic WRT BMW exit with Valentino Rossi and Gemma Scott has found the doctor. Valley, it feels like a bag of mixed emotions from starting the race on pole. You've been in one of the fastest lap times. You were running really well. You slowed down at one point. What, what was happening? Yes, uh, at the beginning it uh, was uh, very good because uh, I can stay with the, with the top guy uh, fighting for, for the podium. Uh, at the beginning it was a little bit chaotic because I have a lot of uh, yellow flag, a lot of problem, but I was there. And uh, after, unfortunately, I did uh, one mistake in the, fa in the, f in the first chicken yeah. and uh, I, go, I go wide. But after uh, I, touch, uh, I touch the banana and the car remain uh, with the uh, anti-stall, you know? So I lose like 15 seconds to put to the first gear and we lose a lot. And after, unfortunately, with Augusto, the, the, the car have a problem and we have a puncture, so we have to stop. Yeah. So it's a good feeling at the beginning for sure. Uh, but after, we are out of the race, unfortunately. Very disappointing, but it's the start of the season. There's yes. more races to come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Valley. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. So that's just a replay of what happened to Valentino. The anti stall kicked in, they had to find all the way down the gear, get himself sorted out. But this battle for the race lead is getting more intense. Four tenths of a second between first and second Charles Fats hunting down Beatman in the Rover Racing entry as opposed to Charles Fats in the WRT entry. And while they're both racing for BMW, they're both racing for their individual teams. Right, we are understanding that the reason for the Retirement of the number 46 WRT BMW can be traced to a broken diffuser. That would do it. I mean, it, it may have been the reason why the tyre got cut down. So if the diffuser at the rear of the car, particularly the bit, look at this battle coming down into the chicane. How do you get five cars in and get five, more important, how do you get five cars out? Oh! <laughs> the Iron Dames are on the outside and they're going to be given a bit of a, oh, a contact between the ID and the Porsche. Look at the rear, left rear. That's bodywork rub on the tyre, and that will not last very long before that tyre gets cut on. Indeed, no. So, oh, there, there he goes. goes. Yeah, you were right, John. You called it. I don't like to be right all the time, but it feels <laughs> good when I am right. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Not gone well at all for the Audi at the back of this little train as they drop out of the little hunt, and that is obviously... That was the mixture of uh, Gazo de Mustier, Rapange, Frey and Chevalier, I do believe. But there is the Iron Dames Lamborghini of Ray and Frey. Switching, of course, from uh, Ferrari car to Lamborghini car for 2023. Yeah, it's actually quite a different car, different characteristics. You have to really learn the, the, the skills that are required to get a performance out of a Lamborghini Huracan. And this is the latest evolutionary version of the car, still running the, the wonderful and sonorous V10 engine. One of the few engines that really sounds like it's a racing engine. I uh, wish we had more of it. But anyway, we can't talk about all those sort of things. <laughs> we have to live in a modern world, a modern society. And think about, think of, you know, well, whatever. <laughs> so down the uh, straight to the Parabolica, 
we've got the BMW bearing down on us. That is Tim Whale in front of Cesar Gazzo, and then De Moustier, Frey, and Rapange. So they are working their way through. We are approaching the half-distance mark of the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS Endurance Cup season opener here at Monza. Jake Sanson and John Watson with you. Down in pit lane is Gemma Scott. And if you've only just joined us, we've got a great battle developing between the BMW teams of Rove and WRT, Marco Wittmann versus Charles Vietz. This is a little bit further down the field, the Sky Tempesta. McLaren, where she is running currently in 22nd. I mean, that car has been hovering around 22nd, 23rd, 24th since the lights went out. But crucially, they have been in the hunt for the podium all the way, and they are currently in third position ahead of the pure Porsche number 911. And I guarantee you that's what they plan to be. That's what they plan for this race. They're not looking to be heroes. All they want to do is win the category in which they're competing. Well, this is the thing, over the course of a busy season like this, if you're in the top three, four or five times over the course of the year, that's how you in, win a championship. In your category. Exactly, that's how you win yep. your class category. Okay, because absolutely. you've got to just keep banging in the points. You've got to keep banging in those results. Even if you don't necessarily win every time, you've got a good opportunity. Now, here is the duel between the two great Italian manufacturers. Capo and Rigon are battling away. Lamborghini versus Ferrari. Yeah, but Sturm in the Porsche 911 is looking to find a way past John Wee. And again, look at the exit speed of the Porsche vis a vis that of the McLaren. Different lines through the corner, but the Porsche looked to me to have an additional pace of that final. There we go, there we go. Can he get a slipstream? He's going to go down on the, nearly Ooh. on the grass, cuts back to go the long way around. He can break marginally later, but we manages to get the thing in. But the undercut coming out of the second part, third part of the chicane, maybe the Porsche will gain marginally as we go on board with Jonathan Wee. And is that a problem for the car directly ahead of him? Yeah. That's one of the Lamborghinis, and I don't know what that car's problem is, but it needs to get out of the way for this battle to be able to continue. I think it just went over the Retifilio chicane, so that was uh, Capo in front of Davide Rigon. So they've actually lost three positions as a result of overshooting at the Retifilio. One might say shows them right. <laughs> so we've still got the battle going on here between we and Storm, and this is for third position in the cup. Battling away, trying to get the moves done on the various contenders. This is for the Bronze Cup, of course. And third position very much being contested as Jonathan Wee holds on in front of Sturm. But Sturm is throwing everything he can at it. The Ferrari is starting to look like a car that's better on the long run than it is on the short run. Well, again, if you think back to what I was saying yesterday, sometimes a, a car that might be very light on its tyres in a qualifying situation or a practice situation where you're only running a limited amount of fuel, you may not get the best out of the car. When you put a load of fuel in it, the static weight of the car goes up, more energy goes into the tyres, the tyres then switch on, you get more grip from the tyre, you get the balance and you know the car has gone, and therefore you can drive the car more quickly. And I wonder if that's the scenario that Ferrari have got currently. Look at this, a potential pass one lap later than we looked one time before. Now, where will Jonathan Wee go? Because wherever he goes, I can guarantee you the Porsche is going to go down the opposite side. And can he get his nose in front this time? He has, and Jonathan Wee sensibly concedes the corner and uh, that could have been another nasty incident if we wanted to be belligerent about it but you know, again they're looking for a class win or a class podium put it that way not a bit of podium for sure coming back to the ferraris they're now up to 13th and 20th so that's good progress over the course of the first hour and a half of the race and there's still opportunities to move further forward look at this battle it's still irresistible between these cars as very nearly chevalier almost strikes the back of Tim Wales' BMW. Yeah, the, the Porsche just had a snap over stairs and turned in and had to momentarily back out of That's the 44 uh, CLRT French entry. So, oh, it's got a very pretty color on the rear diffuser if anybody's interested in treating colors and racing cars. <laughs> well, at least, at least you can see the diffuser, this particular car here just going into it's very the long year chicane. So but, now it's up to uh, Rail Frey to make the bid here on the 34th car in the rigs. This is Chevalier. And Rail Frey is doing her best in the Iron Dames Lamborghini to try and work her way forward. They're still looking at a potential fight for the top five in class. I mean, Rail Frey is leaving nothing on the table whatsoever. And 
I mean, she is going, I think, to look for a way very shortly around the Porsche and uh, make up another position. She's doing a grand job, chasing down towards the Valiante Ascari, down into the braking zone. This is really good hunting and hustle from Rail Frey, really starting to hunt down Chevalier. The Lamborghini really strong in these faster apexes. Inherently, it should be. Remember, the Porsche still got the engine hung out over the rear axle, albeit now it's a lot closer to the centre line of the car. And again, just people making very aggressive switches left, right, left, right. But watch Rahel Frey, can she pick up a bit of pace as she exits out of the long, long, long Alvarento? And she's in a good position now to make progress, but is she close enough but further forward? See, Whaler, we Whaler's got Chevalier. Chevalier trying to make the move, and now Frey is going to try and get past Rapange in the same breath. Nicely done from Chevalier. Yep. Frey has to wait. Yeah, again, that was sensible. The BMW backed out of it early. It, it wasn't going to be able to challenge your eyeball to eyeball. And again, you have to judge. You're racing in a category. You're not necessarily racing the car that's directly coming past you. Right, Dennis Marshall has closed back up to Timo Bogoslavski in the Mercedes from... Car 96, 96. 15 second time penalty to be taken at the next pit stop. Refueling infringement. Retronic racing. Yeah, that's Retronic Porsche for a refueling infringement. So that's what you were talking about earlier, about getting the fuel well, out I mean, at the right we, time. Maybe. We don't know what the, what the infringement was. Well, look at Bogoslavski and I mean, just behind Dennis Marshall and Fabian Schiller. Oh, no! Well, unfortunately for, for Marshall, he had, he had to check up because Bogoslavski checked up and Schiller, who really was trying to push forward, had really nowhere to go, so that was a, a, an unfortunate contact. It has damaged around the front of that 777 Mercedes, so the contact may hurt the Mercedes ultimately more than it's going to hurt the Audi. There you can see the damage on the... OK, it's the Mercedes, it's the grill, but the, that, you've got a front splitter there that could have been marginally damaged as well. So a very frustrated Audi there of Dennis Marshall, not particularly happy with being nerfed by Fabian Schiller. No, the danger for Marshall is that the, the damage could also be at the rear of the Audi. The, the diffuser at the very back could be, let's say, somewhat diffused by that contact. Well, we've already seen the Valentino Rossi car drop out for oh, that. Right, there's a problem. Yeah, the there Georgia it is. 777 has a problem, and that's oh. the direct result of the contact. Just a few, I mean, it's been an awful stint for Fabian Schiller, somebody who I think is a much better driver than he's shown here today. Oh, the Almanar car is creeping back to the pits. This is a missed opportunity. They were in the hunt for the victory right from the first lap. Yep. And I wonder whether that damage is just purely bodywork damage or whether there's mechanical damage. But ultimately, what I'm also concerned about has there been damage to any of the radiator, the cooling system in the car. There's no water or any fluid seemingly coming from it but he knows there's a problem. That's why he's coming back so slowly. It was a big hit, that was the thing. He went in quite hard, considering that was a slow corner, the Rentafilio. So, very disappointing indeed for the Almanar Mercedes. They come back to the pits and, well, hopefully they can get it back out, but this could be terminal. Yeah, he needs to get the car slowed down. He doesn't want to have an additional penalty for speeding in the pit lane, so he makes his way into the pit lane and all the way down to the team garage and, I mean, he, all he can say is to the guys, look, I'm sorry, I made mistakes, and leave it there. Don't try to qualify it by saying, oh, well, he was backed up and I had no, just say, it was my mistake. That policy will pay you dividends in the future. It's always been your way, hasn't it? Not necessarily my way, but I mean, I had a <laughs> teammate who was very honest about things, and if he made a mistake, he's first to put his hand up. So there is Christopher Mies, looking good in the Santa Lock Audi to get himself back into contention. They were running close to the mark through the weekend, but this is a bit of a resurgence now for the Santa Lock Audi. They're into eighth position in both the race and the class, so they are working hard, and they've got their sights firmly set on Timo Bogoslavski and Dennis Marshall up front. Yeah, I mean, I mean Christopher Mies, I'm a big fan of Christopher Mies and his time in Audi. He's one of those professional workmen like Audi drivers who is employed because he's very good at his job. Dennis Marshall is maybe a younger driver who's got a, a long career ahead with him with the Audi brand. So they're all trying to make Timo Bogoslowski's life as difficult as possible. Well, let's have a look back at what happened to Fabian Schiller uh, in that moment. I think Bogoslowski, here we go again. So uh, Bogoslowski 
slows down in the middle, and then, of course, Dennis Marshall had to check up, and Fabian Schiller didn't anticipate that Bogoslawski had slowed down that much. So Marshall had nowhere to go. He had to check up heavily and quickly, and then uh, Fabian Schiller just made it like a snooker ball. I keep using the snooker references, but it's actually a bit like that. But that's Watch again. See, this is this is live. So, Ooh, so Marshall again. almost over the back. Again, Bogoslawski is slow in that transition going into the first chicane, and that's where Marshall maybe is, needs to be careful that he doesn't find himself caught a second time. And this is the difficulty of running so close together when you've got two, three cars trying to go for the same bit of racetrack. So, again, under braking, look how close Marshall gets to the back of Bogoslawski. This is so why, why Bogoslawski would be so, let's say, not early on the brakes, but conservative on the brakes, giving Marshall opportunities, I don't know, but that would appear to be what is going on behind the wheel of the 88 Mercedes. And behind these two cars, just waiting, like the cunning old fox that he is. <laughs> is Christopher Meese, there he is. Yeah, he just knows exactly where to place the car. He can let these two drivers up front battle all day long. It's like, you just swap paint. I'll just sit here, I'll wait for my time. When you guys mess it up, I'm going to die for Opportunity, opportunity going to come up shortly because Bogoslavsky is closing down one of the back markers soon. But this is Bogoslavsky again. Now watch Marshall, because obviously he has to check up, and then bang, there's the contact. Yes, yes, absolutely. Nothing Fabian well, Schiller can do. It's not rocket science. So Marshall tries to find... Bogoslavsky, earlier, just before we cut back to that replay, so Bogoslavsky, I think, is carrying a problem with his car because he's not able to maybe be as, you know, as effective around the lap and now at this phase in the race as he was at the earlier part of the stint. Well, the two Lamborghinis up in front of the K-Pax and uh, Iron Lynx cars going well. They've got a slower Audi in front of them. Yes, and that's going to be key to what happens with these three cars. Bogoslowski, Dennis Marshall and Christopher Mies. So, riding on board. This is Christopher Mies, it is. So, riding on board with the Santa Rock Audi driver and he's looking not just at the car ahead of him, looking at the lap car that's going to come up. But Marshall looking to find a way round. He's going to go the long way round. Can he get alongside Bogoslavski? He... Whoa! <laughs> well, uh, I wonder what the stewards or the what race record will make of that. No, oh, Beast! Oh, oh, come no, on. Come damage on. to the right rear. Damage to the right rear on the Mercedes. A big cloud of blue smoke has just come off. And there it is. Bodywork rubbing on the right rear of the Mercedes as a result of the contact because of what Boga, Bogoslavski brought that upon himself. Well, unfortunately, Jules and Raphael back in pit lane are going to be quite annoyed about that as well. I understand it, but Bogoslavski moved aggressively to prevent Christopher Meese going through, and immediately the contact occurred. The blue smoke came. Oh, dear. Oh, I've got to pull whatever hair in my head I've got left. <laughs> Dennis Marshall was just not prepared to sit behind Timo Bogoslavski anymore. He just said, enough of this, we are yeah. hemorrhaging time. Okay, it wasn't a problem, but he, Dennis Marshall made his move and he, he got away with it in a sense. But it was Christopher Mies who was trying to capitalize on it and then went to make a move on Bogoslavski who had been slightly compromised. But oh. Bogoslavski was so aggressive in his defense, he's led to his own demise. I think I just saw something come off the Audi of Christopher Mies. Either that or he just kicks some debris there, off to the side. There, there may be, but Bogoslavski needs to get into the pits. I don't know what he thinks he's going to do. Yeah, why, is he still going? why is he still going? Well, I don't know. <laughs> so Timo Bogoslavski really causing a headache here. Look, and there no, he's pulling over now. He should have pulled into the pits. Oh, it's game oh, over. He, cheer it's me. game over. Come on, you guys. What are you doing? You should have gone straight into the pit lane. Well, it I mean, looks it, like it's game over me. for the 88 car. He had a golden opportunity to get it into the pits, and he's missed the and entry to the pit lane. And the right rear now looks like it's totally cut down. I mean, that was... He, he... My goodness. That's the mother of all mistakes, isn't it, at that particular point of the race. Listen, we're all armchair quarterbacks sitting in the commentary booth. <laughs> you know, there's a lot more pressure going on behind the wheel of these race cars. But you have to think as much as you do have to do the physical fit of driving. <sighs> well, yeah, I mean, the battle for the Gold Cup continues between Team WRT number 30 and the Audi number 21 for Gone to You. And these two have been glued together for the last half an hour, and they are having a brilliant tussle for the victory in the Gold Cup. And they're now running in eighth and ninth and having a great race of it.
Oh, I'm trying to catch my breath here. <laughs> well, Dennis Marshall's in sixth and Mises in seventh. That's yeah, what yeah, we no. know. That's all fine and dandy. He's out of the way, gets uh, Gabati in the 66 Audi. So the next battle that we need to look forward to, apart from what's going on amongst the top three, and that's sort of been pretty static, is can Marshall catch up to fifth place, Andre, Andre Calderelli, He's currently 4.8 seconds behind. So Nita, the last lap for Calderelli was his personal best, 147.7. The last lap for Dennis Marshall, but that mess is going on at 48.8. So the pace of Marshall, one would assume, is going to pick up because Calderelli's lap is just going to cross top finish line. It was a 48.3, and Marshall's was... Uh, 48.8. Yes, so, so he's not eating into Calderelli's uh, fifth position overall. Well, I'm sorry to the Valentino Rossi fans, but he is no longer on the top of the lap chart sheets because Christopher Meese has beaten it, a 147.626, which he did on lap 35, so that's about 12 laps ago. Uh, Christopher Meese uh, managed to get the fastest lap. So it's turning into a proper thriller, isn't it? Three BMWs, two Lamborghinis, two Audis. And this is where it all went wrong for Bogoslavski. Yeah, look, he just drove straight across the track and the left front of the Audi clipped the, the right rear of the Mercedes. And instantly, instantly, you see the problem. Look, I mean, I'm, I'm slamming my pen on the desk. <laughs> I'm so exasperated by that. That was a dumb move. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Christopher Meese just doing what a racing driver would do. Unfortunately, he gets a mouth full of Mercedes. Here's the first move. Marshall just gets impatient. Yes, but look, look, how aggressive is that? And he got us, he got us come up for as a result. And the problem is, you know, Ravelli Marshall did a great job at the opening stint. Jules Gonon would have done a stunning. And now he didn't come in when he should have come in. And he's having to limp around and more and more damage oh, to the rear of the car. There's, there's virtually no tyre left on the rim. And the diffuser at the rear has been pretty heavily damaged, and I, I mean, okay, well, the, uh, the Akita team, they bothered trying to rip. Look at the rear bodywork behind that right rear wheel is virtually not there. It's actually fallen into the diffuser, the splitter, hasn't it? Well, the, the rear of the car, the bodywork and the diffuser are severely damaged on that right rear quarter. What a disaster. Very unfortunate. Just too aggressive in defence, perhaps. Uh, no, 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 no. Nothing about perhaps. <laughs> no, I've called it as it was. Fair enough, John. You, you, you sit on that fence, that's fine. Into the, oh, nearly into the back of the rival. Goodness me. Williams and Hofer yeah. having a great duel. And there was just a slight miscalculation on the brakes for Hofer. But he's still very much in the hunt for the victory. And now look, Christopher Mies, now that he's got rid of the Mercedes, right, game on between him and Dennis Marshall. Yes, and these two cars, um, has Marshall's car been damaged because of the impact that occurred what some laps earlier down at the opening chicane. Christopher Mies has had contact also with the 88 Mercedes, but his Audi looks to be relatively unscathed because it was the left front of the Audi uh, that came in contact with the Mercedes, but no apparent bodywork damage to the 25 Audi. And Christopher Mies can think, well, I've got Dennis Marshall in sixth position ahead of me. I'm going to before I get to the conclusion of my stint and find a way around. But this is what I love about the GT World Challenge. I mean, we've been at this for an hour and 40 minutes, and it feels like we've only been doing it for about 15 minutes. There is just so much action going on all the time. When one battle ends, another one picks up. There is well, so many things to look at. Look, look. Well, look at the rubber. Oh, my God. That's all, <laughs> that's all from the 88. That's all from Big Slowski's car. That car's going into the garage, yep. that doesn't ever come out of the garage. It's done, it's but done for today. What we're doing here at Monza, we've got a three-hour endurance race. Actually, I think I should start rewriting the actual title. It's, it's three one-hour sprints at Monza, yep. because that's what we've got, three one-hour sprint races under the umbrella of a three-hour endurance race. It's crazy to think that there is still only a second between Wittmann and Wirtz after an hour and 40 minutes, and they're probably going to be that close to the chequered flag. Well, will this race be ultimately, and there's a sad sight to see, that's the 88, I think it's going to be retired, now how close can you get? Christopher Mies, but stays away. Great Stays away battle. from the contact. Great so, battle, but great yes. spatial awareness as well. Absolutely, and that's Christopher Mies, who understands that you can get close, but you don't want to touch. If you touch, you know, it's either by an error or by design in some cases, but he's got a chance coming down into the second chicane as we go back to the exit of Lesmo 2 to watch this battle of what, eight cars or whatever there is. 
Well, this is now the leaders coming up to lap yeah, them as well. Up. So this is traffic. If you're Charles Vietz, you have got to keep your eyes on Storks right now because you could snatch oh, the lead away. Again, being flicked up there. That bodywork has fallen off the car. Yeah, here we go. Not, Look, not boxed in. Cars. Boxed in. Marco Wittmann is boxed in by this long queue of cars. Charles Vietz has a chance to close up and then potentially make a bid into the Retifilio. He's got to keep his wits about him. He's got to keep his eyes on Storks because this is now the best chance that the WRT BMW 32 has got to take the lead. Marco Wittmann diving down the inside of the back markers. He does not want that no. a WRT car but anywhere now, near now, him. Now is the best chance for Charles Vance to make that undercut because he ought to have been positioning himself to get the run off and he's almost bumping into the back of the Porsche's bumper to gain advantage. He's got to use the slipstream as best he can. It's more like a, a side slip more than a slipstream per se but Veertman has managed to consolidate and get himself, drag himself out of problems, and Charles Veertz is the car that's now got to find a way. So Veertman's going to get into the chicane, and a car will be between him and Veertz. So very, very nip and tuck for both lead and second place car as they thread the eye of the needle getting through these back markers, who are all involved in their own little inter-battle battles, but the race leader and second place are charging through. Masterful from Whitman, though, because what he's done is essentially made sure he's always got one car between himself and Charles Vietz. And it looks like it could be two cars now, yep, because it is. wasn't able to make the pass coming into the second chicane. So, uh, oh, the Lamborghini yeah. drops it right in front of Vietz. Yeah, that was a bar. Was that the, it's not the bar. Well, no, it's not. Anyway, there we are, race leader. So Wittmann has done a good job, and he's used his advantage, let's say, cleverly and maybe wisely. You were right. It was the Barwell Lamborghini. It was Rob Collard that dropped it there on the gravel just briefly. And now he's got pressure from Manis Nucken in the Porsche just behind him. Bodywork, rubber, I mean, the trackers. Look at them. You can see bits of bodywork. It really, is, what you want to do is put the sweeper up in the track. but. Thankfully, that's not going to happen. It's now the responsibility of drivers to be aware and keep an eye out on the racetrack. For, but look at the exit of Ascari, the amount of rubber that's been deposited there. I mean, it's off the racetrack. It's just on the racing line, just off the racing line. So come on, Charles Vance, get it done. Dive down the inside. You've got the car to do it. You've got the skill and driving ability to do it. And he's gone through cleaning. And in fact, you know, there was maybe a little bit of inter-team or inter-car assistance yeah let him get through yeah let him get through okay, not the same race they're not the same battle so let your your sister car get through quickly and cleanly meanwhile we have got a real pressure cooker bubbling here because this is the moustier and Rapange, i do believe battling away as marco vitman's going to try and take them both in one fell swoop good move and now there are three cars between first and second position so vitman has used the traffic extremely valuably Look how much time the K-Pax Lamborghini has caught up on the Rove 998. That is a brilliant stint from the K-Pax Lambo of Sandy Mitchell. Doing a fantastic job. I think you're quite right. And, uh, well, what is the gap between Mitchell and Neil Verhagen? It's 1.3. 1.3 yeah, seconds. So that's been, he's been able to do that largely, I think, because he's been running pretty much in clean air. So he's driving his own race, picking his own lines, being able to drive as he wants without having to make too many adjustments to accommodate all the cars on the track. Dark horse for the win if they get the, pen, the pit stops right, potentially, and BMW start to hit more traffic and hit trouble. But certainly the K-Pax Lamborghini guys are here to fight for the victory, and Sandy Mitchell has gained so much time in the process. So when Sandy Mitchell comes in, hands over, it'll be to Marco Mapelli. It is indeed. Well, that's a safe pair of hands and a very quick pair of hands too. Down into the Variante Ascari. And Sandy Mitchell is now going to get the benefit of watching Neil Verhagen caught up in this traffic jam now. So he could really gain and go for third position. Look at the, the aggression, the starts well, of that Lamborghini. It's beautiful to watch. It, Mitchell is giving it a good workout, but the key is he's got a car that he can do that with. Verhagen dives down the inside and manages to get the Porsche between himself and the Lamborghini. So again, just using traffic, and that's again such a big part of the skill of racing in a big multi-different multi-classes with a variety of driving, driving skills, levels of performance, and car performances. So Sandy Mitchell is doing a great job to reel in the BMW hat trick up front. Neil Verhagen just trying to stay out of harm's way with this traffic jam looming in front. Mitchell is begging me very late into the braking zone to gain a little bit more time. And he's got it down to within a second of Neil Verhagen as the cars filter their way through. Just an interesting little point. It's outside of the... We've got the Audis battling wheel-to-wheel -wheel again. 
Yeah, that didn't quite get it done, but the intent is there again, looking to find a way right. Clearly, Christopher Meese has got the performance and he's got the grip and the drive off. The first chicane will he be able to find the space to move? Dennis Marshall's giving him room, enough room, but look, he's got the pace, he's got the drive, and he's made the pass. But well, what will Marshall do? Will he try and come back? Well, that's going to be shut off by Christopher Meese. He knows he's worked hard to get that position and he worked it out absolutely to perfection. I want to see that move again because the way that Chris Meese sold the dummy on Dennis oh. Marshall, because he went left and so Marshall said, right, I'm going left. Well, I'm going to go right then. Christopher Meese is a racer, not a racing driver. Absolutely. But just go back to the point I wanted to make. Driver in 15th place, Loris Hazeman, son of great racing driver from my generation, Twan Hazeman in 15th position. But on his last lap, he also had his recorded his personal best in sector one and recorded his fastest lap and that was a lap 52 i think that's a pretty notable performance and of course they're leading the silver cup at the moment so that is going very well indeed for them they look like they could get the victory in the comp to you audi number 12. So a very good run so far here's the gold battle once again still eighth and ninth Kalan williams and mike max Hoffer battling away and having a terrific duel the WRT BMW 30 and the Comte U Racing Audi 21, and they're still dueling. Now, Lauren Heinrich is just behind them in the 96. That's the Richelieu Porsche. Lauren Heinrich. They're putting a little bit of pressure on is Nicholas Nielsen in the A, of course, of Ferrari in 11th place. Yeah, I mean, the Ferraris, we mentioned this earlier, they're, just, they're coming forward, whether it's on pace or whether it's just consistency and, uh, you know, good, quick, clean in out pit stops so it doesn't matter all that matters is what the result is with the flag i was just going to say you watch the ferraris they're just going to quietly and gradually work their way back both into the top 10 that's the way it's I mean, going to work if isn't they it? get one car into the top 10 i think they'll consider that a result the second car is a bit further down this 18th down david urigo so he is yes he's probably a bit too far to consider a top 10 unless something unusual happens there's the leading bronze cup car that is the garage 59 Miguel Ramos is at the wheel at the moment. They're in 13th position overall. And then you've got to look back to the 79 car next up, uh, which is currently running 17th. 17th position. So, yep, they're working well. Sebastian Baud is in the Haupt Racing Mercedes. And then, of course, the 911 is 19th. That is Josh Sturm in the pure Porsche. Jonathan Hoy is still there in fourth position. And they are 9.7 seconds adrift, but that's still very much game on for a podium territory. Here's the Silver Cup leaders, your friend, young Master Hesmonds. Yes, Lewis Hesmonds. I love the title of the team, Come To come to You Racing. I mean, who ever could dream one up like that? <laughs> I tell you what, the victory is gonna to come to them if they keep this up, they're doing a grand job of it. Second is the Lamborghini, that is uh, Ricky Capo in the Grasso Racing Lamborghini in second place. And then you've got to look back to the number 90 of Alexei Nizov in the Mad Panda. Looks like Ezekiel Perez Compact boys are potentially on for a podium in the first race of the year. I mean, again, I mean, Ezekiel Perez Compact, Argentinian race driver, but lives now in Barcelona. Uh, he actually went back to Argentina for a few weeks just to get uh, his head clear and rebuild before the season started. And as far as they're concerned, they're here to win their category. They're not here to win the race, just win their class. And there's the leader in the Pro-Am Cup, the Italia Ciccato Racing BMW. They have been leading since day one. They have literally led since the start of the race here. And uh, it is currently Marco Casada who is behind the wheel. But this car has not lost the lead at any point through the proceedings. This has been a fantastic run for the Italia Ciccato car. Well, obviously it's not rocket science because they've worked it out what you have to do. Just don't get involved in, this, in the manoeuvres that are marginal. And if you're in doubt, back off. So now we have uh, a grand total of uh, 13 retirements through the course of the race. We have obviously lost the championship winning car from last year after Tim Bogostavsky picked up damage. Four laps before that, we lost the Alman Armour Mercedes. So the big two cars from the uh, three-pointed star, both out of the race, we also lost both of the get speed cars, one on the first lap and one uh, 43 laps later. And then, of course, we lost the uh, 46 WRT, the uh, Rossi, Farfus, and Martin car when they had a damaged rear splitter. Ludvilla got involved in a big accident at the first corner, and that was a very heavily damaged Porsche. Vervish and Patrese hit trouble uh, very early on as well, so two top level Audis dropping back. And we lost two Lamborghinis on the same lap, Roth, Inichen, and Kaven Berlo dropping out at the first turn. 
Uh, Aurelien Palace apparently did do two laps of the race, uh, but they had clutch problems and that was all she wrote. So now the battle's going on. We obviously had the uh, accident at the start as well that took out the number three Getspeed speed Mercedes and the Rinaldi Ferrari of Samantha Tan, whose race lasted a little less than 300 metres. Now we've got an hour and 10 minutes to go. Jake Sanson and John Watson with you in the commentary booth. Gemma Scott is down there in pit lane grabbing the stories for us. And this is the overall battle for ninth position and it looks as though the Comte Audi is going to have to watch itself because they've got pressure from Lauren Heinrich in the Porsche. So again, you, this is, you, you get a group of cars, four, five, six cars, and inevitably what happens is the lead car dictates the pace of those behind. Those behind lose their natural momentum. And the only way you can regain that momentum is to basically try to drop back maybe by a half a second or a second, but you can't afford to do it when you've got three other cars breathing down your neck. And the 51 Ferrari is still running in 11th position, but all over the back of Heinrich and the Porsche. 11th and 17th, it is very much oh, slowly. Passed, no. He has got past. Yes, he has. That's, that's, that, that's the uh, 54 we're looking at. The 51 and 54 are all a bit involved. And the Ferraris are playing the game of slowly, slowly catchy monkey, aren't they? 11th and 17th now. Uh, sorry, 11th and 18th, I should say. But they are creeping their way forward. This is going to be a slow burn for Ferrari, but they are making the ground. They're just trying to stay as close at the moment to uh, Lauren Heinrich in front to get close to the top 10. And through with them goes Ahanshin Guven, who has uh, come through as well. Ahanshin Guven obviously working very hard there in the uh, Porsche from Dynamic Huber. Ahanshin Guber is... Uh, very much a Porsche man through and through, has been for quite a long time. Yes, he's in the Porsche Super Cup, been pretty much an outstanding driver in that category for a long time. Lauren Heinrich in the Porsche fold as well, trying to get after Max Hofer. Callum Williams, though, is your leader in eighth position in the Gold Cup. But overall, it is still BMW, BMW, BMW. The guys from Munich are having an absolute rout. And in spite of the fact that they had to add an additional 10 kilograms of ballast following qualifying this morning, because it was a BMW route, uh, the pace of the car has just been above everybody else by a, a significant margin. Having said that, the 777 Mercedes in the hands of Maro Engel in the opening stint more or less was matching the pace of the BMW. Didn't have any additional pace to find its way around, but was able to hang in behind the 98 Philly Bang, behind the wheel of that car in that opening stint. There are 43 cars running out of the 55 that started. And it's turning into uh, quite a stellar race battle at the moment, as we still have a great run between Kalan Williams and Max Hofer, battling in the Gold Cup. There is the 66 Audi just trying not to cause a headache. That is Kiko Gabbiati in the Trezor Attempto Racing Audi. I think that's the sole Trezor Attempto Audi that's still running in the race, because obviously we lost Lorenzo Patrese early doors. We might still have the other one, actually. The other Trezor Attempto car, I think, is still going. Yeah, uh, yes, a little further forward, obviously, because there are three Trezor Attempto Audis, I believe. No, I was right. There are just two. Just. Uh for the interest of those that want to know what's happening at the front of the field. Wittmann is actually stretching his advantage. It's now just five seconds ahead of Charles Vetz. Now, we haven't been following those two cars for a few laps because we're watching all these other battles going on. But I don't know whether that's down to natural pace because certainly in the early stint, Charles Vetz had matched everything that Wittmann was doing. But once they got into traffic, Wittmann seemed to be able to manage it at the point where we were following it more successfully than Charles Vetz. And whether that's just set into motion, a trend, we can't really tell until we get a view of where the two cars are. It may be that there's traffic between the two lead cars, and that's maybe contributing to the reason for a gap increase up to five seconds. We've just seen Davide Rigon move up into 17th place past Sebastian Bold in the Hunt Racing Mercedes. There is the 911 car, John Sturm, in the pure Porsche, still battling away for the victory in the Bronze Cup and the car in front is obviously a car that it can move up into second position to get past. Well, he's having a little sniff, but again, way, way far too far behind. But it's just, a, you know, the Mercedes took this more defensive approach into the first chicane. It wasn't really an opt it wasn't really a, a realistic overtaking opportunity. But anyway, armchair quarterbacks are never wrong. <laughs> 
Charging down the main straight, we've got more battles. Right. We're not always right either. A uh, good battle coming towards us. This is the Mad Panda charging after another Mercedes in front as they duel for the braking zone. This is going to be quite tricky for Alexei Nizov to get past David Schumacher, who is, of course, the nephew of Michael, the son of Ralph, and the cousin of Mick. Yes, a very interesting biological uh, bit of uh, Schumacher family history. I'd like to see David Schumacher coming to the fore because he's got all the, the correct genes to be a successful racing driver, as is his cousin uh, has attempted Mick Schumacher. Mick a bit further down the road in terms of his career, but David had a, you know, a very strong career in junior formulas. And wait and see what happens for young David. He's done well. He's in the top five right behind his teammate Indy Dontier, so they still have a good chance of a podium, the Windward boys. Long way to go still. An hour and four minutes left on the clock, and we are again starting to approach. Not there yet, but we're starting to approach. Pit stop number two. And there we will see, and I cannot wait to see it, Robert Schwarzman will take over the wheel of the 51 Ferrari. Now, I spoke about pit stops, and it might be a bit early for one, but the leading Pro-Am team have decided to go early. Cassera has come into the pits from the lead, and that is scheduled. That's on schedule as far as they're concerned. I think that's a good move, but come in when the, at the pit lane is still relatively empty. We've got 63 minutes remaining of this race, so they're comfortably within the 65 minute. And I'll tell you which other team has decided to do it with both cars in at the same time. Dynamic Huber, both well, Porsches are in. And I'm seeing the Italian BMW make its way back onto the racetrack. So there we are, there's the Porsche in. So get in, make your pit stop. Pit lane is relatively easy and free. In fact, both Dynamic cars have come in with oh, that one. It's going into the garage. Yeah, one of so them's done, the other one's carrying on. Yeah, and slightly compromised on the exit for the the second car, so what has gone wrong with that particular car that they need to put it back in the garage to affect repairs? I think it's Rapange that has it ended up Rapange, yes. being wheeled into the pits. That's the 56 car, so Marius Narken will go back out. Here's the leader. We haven't seen him for a long time. <laughs> and his lead is now 5.3 seconds. Oh, he's whoa, made a mistake. Whoa, oh, dear, whoa. oh, dear. Well, Marco Whitman, what are you doing that for? That's a wake-up call. That's a wake-up call. Well, that's also maybe just, a, I don't know whether it's a, a fall or a lapse of concentration or not. But I mean, there was no reason why he needed to do that or why that happened. Well, I'm not sure why, but Sandy Mitchell is now behind Andrea Caldarelli. So we might need to see a replay of why the Lamborghinis have swapped. Just overran coming into the chicane and the consequence. But look at the bodywork. All appears to remain intact. So no damage to the front splitter, no damage that we can see to any other parts of the bodywork. But I mean, again, Wow, didn't expect that from Marco Wittmann. Careful, Marco, don't throw this away now. No surprise, just going back to the Caldarelli, Sandy Mitchell, the fact that Caldarelli's found his way around. I mean, Andrea Caldarelli, his middle name is actually Lamborghini. Yes, it is. Uh, and he <laughs> knows his way around a hurricane as well as anybody, if not better than everybody. So Sandy Mitchell is there in fifth position, but uh, he was in fourth, so Andrea Caldarelli has caught him up. Here is the man in second place, Charles Vietz and has managed to gain a little bit of ground as a result of that. He gained about a second in that little error from Marco Wittmann, but he needs to stay as close to him as possible. They want to try and pick up some pace. Well, ultimately, it's going to come down to the pit stops because we're coming up to the end of the second hour. So whether WRT can turn this car around quicker than Rover Racing can turn it around, there is currently, as, you, as at the end of the previous lap, a 5.3 second differential that might reduce because of the error that we saw Vietman make. So, yes, he stays out. So, what will be the gap coming across the line now? 5.3 seconds it was. It should be four points a second. So, the, the lead car lost a second. And there you can see coming into view is the second place. And now that Vertz realizes that the gap has somehow, he won't understand what has happened, maybe, but the gap has suddenly closed. Oh, well, I might just make a little more of a spurt. They'll both probably stay out until they get into under the, the two, hour, uh, two hours of this race. Well, Diamato has now returned to the circuit in the number 56 Hubert Porsche, so it was only a one-lap problem they had to fix. So at least they've gone back out again. But there is Pittman and Vitz. The Hagen's come in. Right, so the 998 Rove BMW is the first one to blink in the pit stops. Hold on, hold on. Stop the press. Stop <laughs> new headline fastest sector of anybody in the race in the entirety in sector one is Davide Rigo in a Ferrari. Oh my word, the Ferrari has suddenly found pace and it was only about, you know, 36 hours too late. But there you go. 
33.5, a first sector from Davide Rigon. So maybe the Ferrari's coming back. They've just done a 147.9, which is three tenths of a second off the fastest lap. And that's that car's best lap in the race on lap 60. I think it's the best lap of the weekend, isn't it? Oh, uh, um, it's not I far off. I need to go back and see. But I mean, it's not far Because off. I collect paper, I've obviously got <laughs> my file, but I'm having to drop my eyes down to check exactly where it was. But certainly the Ferrari finally starting to find pace at the end of the second hour and into the third and final hour of the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS Endurance Cup season opener here at Monza we go. And this is going to be an interesting battle to see which of the BMWs is best placed to take the win as Hesse gets into the car. Max Hesse in the 998 row racing BMW. There's the McLaren. So that is Kiergaard now getting into the Garage 59 McLaren. They, of course, are still trying to hunt down their opponents. And in comes Charles Veerts. So they blink first. Indeed. And, uh, yeah, I suspect the next lap we'll see our race leader in. So this will be crucial. This pit stop will be absolutely crucial to measure the time that the WRT team take. There we see. So Charles Vertz gets out of the car. And into the car gets Dries van Thor. Now we're in for some fireworks. Yeah, so there'll have to be a, an adjustment in the seating position, probably. The pedals brought forward, there's a difference in, in size of, of Dries van Thor and Charles Vertz. So that's all been completed. Vertz runs back into the garage and his job is finished for today. So the car is still up on the air jacks, wheels, tyres, probably all complete. And it's just a matter of waiting for the fuel so where's Hesse coming through in the 998 BMW. Trees are orange Audi decided to pit in before the Santalock Junior yes. Audi, so they might leapfrog them. Can do. That's so worth picking up on as well. It'll be another five minutes before this is finally washed through to see who has gained or regained the lead. Looks good to me, though, for oh, it's 32. Always good. It's always good, so we'll wait and see the length of time. Pit time is 120, 120, oh no. 122.4, that's yeah. fine. So that is the pit time for the lead car. Previously, the time was 122.9. Time for Calderelli, previously, was 123. So we'll wait and see. Coming in now is our race leader. So Marco Wittmann brings the Rove BMW into the pits. Stop, stop, stop. That's perfect. There you go. That's how to do that. Coming off the Parabolica down the straight and nailing the pit stop limiter liners into the pits comes Jonathan Hoy and he will hand the Sky Tempesta McLaren over. So there we see the final pit stop for the lead 98. And just checking to make sure I say the right thing. It will be Nick Yellerly. Nick Yellerly, indeed, the Brit behind the wheel. So Nick is a very capable driver indeed. Right. So put Nick against Dries van Thor. Could be interesting. Could be very interesting, couldn't it? Absolutely. Right, we've changed drivers in the McLaren as well, because Chris Froggart has been in the car. Jonathan Hoy has been in the car. So the only one left to do so is Eddie Cheever the third. So Dries van Thor's 122.2, I think it was, there in our time. There is van Thor. So he's got to make his way now down the back. So oh, look at the speed. Wow. BMW That's... Rover Racing have absolutely, I would say, well, wait and see. Of course, it's, it's a slow pit lane. So it's not going to be as mega, but clearly they will have consolidated their position probably by maybe more than the five seconds it was when they came in. So where is the BMW? Just about coming now. So it's on. So there's the BMW just coming onto the straight, and there is our race leader regaining the straight. So the gap, maybe, maybe not as much as I anticipated, around about five to six seconds. And perfect pit stop, because what was their previous time? It was a 122.5. They did a 122.5 again. That is textbook pit work. Listen, that's why you win races. <laughs> so Dries van Thor hop, skipping and jumping over the curbing and the exit of the first chicane. And he knows he's got a job on his hands. He's got what, 55 minutes and 54 seconds in which to run down Nick Yellerly in the lead Rover Racing BMW and not only run him down, but then find a way around him. And that ain't going to be any easy task. So now we are back into the race action for the BMWs as it was before the pit stops, but leading the race, waiting for the second pit stop now is Sandy Mitchell in the Lamborghini K-Pax. They are going to Obviously sort that out. Well, that's a bit of an afterthought, isn't it? That's the 88 Mercedes gaining an advantage by cutting turn one, noted. That was when Timor was making all sorts of uh, lackadaisical mistakes. So K-Pax in, 
Caldarelli gets out. And Jimmy Jordan Pepper getting into it. So, uh, again, very, very... No, it was a mark of Mapelli. It is Mapelli, I think you're yes, right. it is Mapelli, yeah. Because it was Pereira, yeah, Pereira to start Pereira, with. Yeah, I'm in the wrong car with Jordan. So, Marco Mapelli, I mean, Andre Calder, oh, that's the Sandy Mitchell car, I'm making get confused with my Lamborghinis. <laughs> so, well, Bortolotti has now got Pereira into the is very, very useful. So, yeah, Bortolotti has climbed aboard the Iron Lynx Lamborghini and they have gone into the pits and out again. And I'm fairly sure in saying that pretty much everybody now is heading for pit road if they haven't already done so. Hoffer is currently the leader of the race, waiting for his pit stop to happen. But then you've got the Ferraris of Nielsen and Rigon. They've climbed up to fourth and fifth for the moment, as they are obviously waiting to get their pit stop done. Yeah, I mean, there's a few that have yet to make their pit stop. The majority have been in and done the driver change. So we're looking at Hoffer, Nielsen, uh, Hazemans, Rigon. Uh, then we get down to our race leader, Nick Yellowley, in seventh place at the present time. Marshall and Christopher Meese are in the pits to hand over their car to the respective third driver. Oh, 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 battle coming out of the pit for the two. Sorry. They've done that mistake but in the pit lane. Is a oh, rear, no. A rear tire. The K-Pax Lamborghini, they've messed up the pit stop. Is a rear or left front? It's left front, left front. Oh, my goodness. Another contender to try and take the win off the BMWs has faulted. So what has gone wrong? Is it the tire cut down or is it the tire is loose? that hasn't been seated, looks like the tyre yeah. wheel hasn't been seated oh. properly at the point when the, the gun went on. So what an awful recovery. A K-Pax doing a brilliant job here this weekend, and now they're having to go back at a... Well, is he going to actually try and get around the lap, or is he going to virtually pull the car off? He should try and get back, but he will have to do it at a very, very reduced... I mean, literally reduced walking pace. You know, they might even have had a suspension collapse at the left front. It, the wheel looked as if it was in at the top, which would, could be a suspension component, or it could be because the, the wheel it didn't get seated properly. Devastating. Whatever, Another, it, is, whatever it is, it's destroyed their race. Yeah, it's academic. The K-Pax Lamborghini that was looking good for a podium at possible, a win at best, and it's now all gone wrong. Yet another big name to fall. We've lost the championship winning Mercedes from last year. We lost the 46 WRT BMW of Valentino Rossi and his cronies. And now, having already lost the Almanar Mercedes, We've now lost the K-Pax Lamborghini. They're dropping like flies in the battle to try and take this off BMW. Well, that's when you know, the race gets underway. The first 20 minutes of the race will have probably very little bearing no. overall. Stop. On what Stop the count. Another fastest lap. Stop no. the count. The Ferraris are one and two. Stop the count oh, right okay. now. Okay, well, <laughs> well, certainly the Ferraris in first position. But, but, yes, well, it should be because the two, Max Hoffer and Hazelmans, are both in the pits. Yes, indeed. So, Nielsen and Rigon are first and second. Stop the count right now for Aria 1 and 2. And Marco <laughs> Bortolotti has just set a new race. Fastest lap, the fastest sector time in sector one. Uh, last lap, 147.540. That is a quick race speed lap. It certainly is. But, uh, yeah, it's a very special moment for the Ferrari fans because their cars are 1 and 2. But, obviously, in third place is Nick Yellily. A bit of team, inter-team cooperation there. So there is the 71, which is David Di Rigo. I mean, as they came across the line on the previous lap, it was in fourth place. But uh, Hazelman's still in the pits, and what's the cameraman wandering around looking for? Maybe he just caught something and uh, he thought we might want to report upon. Here we go, the Ferrari is in. Nicholas Nielsen is going to hand the leading Ferrari over. And I have a feeling that David Di is going to be right behind him as he comes through out of the final turn. So there is Nicholas Nielsen. He stops the 296 Ferrari. Well, it was a nice little moment there, wasn't it? Ferrari 1 and 2 at Monza. It'll make a great headline in the Carriera del Sierra. <laughs> the, the biggest sporting newspaper in Italy. So the, the team have worked very hard to make the best of a, a disappointing job, and in, in, both in practice and in pre-qualifying and in qualifying. So, uh, of course, I've got a, a lot of work. I mean, this Ferrari is an extremely busy company at the minute. They've got oh. Formula One, they've got WEC, they've got uh, whatever else they're looking at, and they've got GT3. So, within that group of four major motorsport programs, probably the, this one is the one that's back of the line at present. But did you see the rage in which Nicholas Nielsen slammed the door shut? He's not happy about something. I wonder what that's well, I mean, all made of. General Scott better get down there and put the hard question to him. Absolutely, because Nicholas Nilsson slammed the door as if somebody had just poked him in the eye. Maybe they did. 
Well, uh, very intriguing as Ferrari get back out onto the circuit. Maybe they're just a little bit frustrated that this race just hasn't been as competitive as they wanted it to be. Because it really hasn't, does it? No, but they have made progress. I mean, in the race, they have gone forward as opposed to standing still or going backwards. So that is progress. Or going into the side of other drivers, which we uh, obviously have seen. So, Nielsen has now handed the car over. It is Antonio Fuoku that is in the number 71. Nick Yellily, by the way, has just set a new fastest race lap at 147.532. So he is, in effect, our race leader. Dries van Thor, 3.2 seconds behind him, effectively our second place car. So Fuoku is in the number 71 Ferrari. Who's in the number 51? It's Robert Schwartzman now. So Robert Schwartzman will... Oh! Bit of a moment on the outlap there for Robert Schwartzman. Yeah, and it's a different world. <laughs> getting into a GT car and, I mean, getting in stone cold. Just it's very different, isn't it? And, I mean, Robert Schwartzman, I think, is a big, big star in the making, and uh, Ferrari have got him on their junior driver program. So uh, it's just making the adaptation from you know, high downforce single seaters into a different configuration. A road car that is heavily engineered to become a very, very good race car. So now we return to the normality of having three BMWs in first, second and third. Yellily, Vanto and Hesse now. Rove are one and three with a WRT, the sole remaining WRT at the front end of the field. Dries van Tor in second position and the gap is down to 2.3. Bring it on. Where did that come from? The gap was, in, well, what was the gap just a few minutes ago? I thought it was more than It was that. about five seconds, yeah, wasn't it? Was. it? So I'm just trying to think where was that two. Well, on Nick the Yellily just had recorded the fastest race lap, yet he seems to have lost uh, time between first and second place doesn't quite make sense. Well, down to the braking zone. This is the Hubert Porsche trying to get around the outside. That's Muller. So Sven Muller trying to pick off the Ferrari. No, you don't. We've got into the top 10 and we intend to stay. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So that was 51. And that is Robert Schwarzman behind the wheel. So he uses racing, single-seater racing guys or guile to uh, make sure that he didn't lose a position. So down into the second chicane. What did we say earlier? The Ferraris are going to climb up into the top 10. There's one in eighth and the other one is in 14th. They're not far away. Well, the top 10 finish for one of these two cars, certainly I thought was possibly on the cards for this car, but maybe not for the 71. So that's done uh, 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 Antonio Fuuko down in 14th position. So he needs to get his way past Prining in the Porsche, Drouet in the Mercedes, McDo Dean McDonald in the McLaren. Tenth place is Seminar in a BMW, so a lot of... So there's a little bit of explaining what was going on. There's, maybe he's calmed down a little, but something obviously got him agitated. Well, I tell you what, Robert Schwartzman hasn't flicked the switch, has he? Because it still says it's Nicholas Nielsen in the car. Listen, listen, listen. <laughs> I mean, if you, you don't have that in a single-seater... Priorities, you know, priorities. By, by definition, raising a single-seater is your car and there's no switch no transponder switch to say that Joe Blow was going to drive my nope. car I like that I mean I've always had that that kind of career but when you get into a single if I get into a GT car or into a group C WEC whatever a race when there's more than one driver there's a transponder switch and that's part of the responsibility of the driver now there's radio communication unless and didn't Ferrari have a radio problem earlier in the weekend it did indeed so maybe that's a radio problem that's why the transponder has Click over. Maybe Schwarzman has clicked the switch, but the switch hasn't responded. We have got a three-way battle for the victory in the gold category here. We've got Max Hofer in the Comte Audi in seventh. In tenth is the WRT BMW, now being driven by Jean-Baptiste Simonau. But Dean McDonald in the Optima McLaren is charging after them. The number five has suddenly crept into the battle again. Well, I expect Dean McDonald to do that because Dean McDonald is, in my view, a very highly rated young driver up or into 11th position. Uh, last lap, I'm curious, I was just looking to see this lap, 148.4 was his last lap, his best laps, 147.8. But uh, again, just looking at Chavez down in 20th position in the third place, or third of the McLarens on the road. Personal best, not really personal best, fastest sector time in sector three overall. I totally agree with you though, John. When you look at somebody like Dean McDonald, I've been watching him for the last sort of decade in the world of karting. And obviously, yeah, it's a very different sport. But if you can come away from a sport like that and get back into it with barely a day's testing and go and win the world finals in Miami in a weekend with no prep, 
you are world class. And Dean McDonald has the ability to do that. He's just, he switches it on the dial. He's an ultimate pro. No, he's a, I mean, we've seen him last season and uh, certainly I was impressed with what Dean was doing. And clearly uh, his team think he's a star. So where his future will lie, whether it will lie with his existing team or whether there'll be opportunities. You know, look, all these teams are looking around and seeing the young talent coming forward. You know, some of these names that we talk about may not be around in the next four or three or four years. And the Dean McDonald's and many more will be coming forward looking to take their seats. Well, I totally think he's cut from the same mold as because he grew up on the same circuit as Alan McNish, David Coulthard, Paul De Resta, Dario Franchitti. He's another one. He's absolutely of the same calibre in my book. So down the straight, we've got ourselves a great little tussle coming towards us. And this is the battle between Dijon, Miney and Chiva. 16th, 17th and 18th on the racetrack. And here are the 19th and 20th cars. This is uh, the BMW of James Kell battling away with Enrique Chavez in the Garage 59 McLaren. And those two, of course, are scrapping away for the win in bronze. But they are currently third and fourth in bronze because Arjun Mayani in the Hout Mercedes has crept past the both. So he's now in second in class. And it is currently Klaus Beckler in the 911 Pure Porsche that leads. And Klaus Beckler has won this race overall twice. So uh, he will do that team a power of good and it's unlikely any of his principal challengers in this category are going to catch and get on terms with them. Right, here comes the battle again. The Garage 59 McLarens are trying to make as much progress up as they can, but this is the Vulcan Horse BMW versus the 188 Garage 59. Enrique Chavez trying to get one over on James Kell. He has a little bit of a look to the inside line of the Valiante della Roggia. Not going to make the move there, and they are running short on time now. 43 and a half minutes to go. Get on with it. I mean, both these brands were given big breaks in terms of BOP adjustments on uh, Saturday night, and then there was a readjustment again this morning after qualifying. Nevertheless, both BMW and McLaren are very quick cars at Monza in this current context. Ah, now we've been watching that battle, but there is a bit of an issue. The number 35 car, which is James Kell, under investigation for speeding in the pit lane. Now that really could come back to bite them in the hunt for the win. Yes, that does not help all the work that's been done by team members. So we're riding on board with the, the Sky Tempesta, Eddie Cheever the third, or Eddie Cheever Jr. the third, or whatever he wants to call himself. And the car in front is the second place car in class. Yeah. So they are going after Arjun Mayani, the Indian. So wait, 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 down into, down through the gears. That's nice, that's okay, that's all right. I've got a lot of time for the man up front, in front of us, Arjun Mayani. Of course, he came from the same mold as the likes of Turun Reddy and Jahan Darwala, the Indian drivers in the karting days. They were in the Force India karting team 11 years ago, and Arjun Mayani was always tipped as actually the fastest of the three of them. And here he is now making a name for himself in GTs. He was one of the drivers going through the single-seater ladder, of course, as well. And here he is in Fanatec GT World, and I think he's settled in remarkably quickly. A lot of drivers, I think there was 34 drivers or something that have never been uh, new to this event. I can figure I maybe have to correct myself. Nevertheless, you know, just sitting back, thinking about it, waiting to see it. There's not much difference between straight line speed and performance, but the, the opportunities are going to come. Now, the Mercedes is sort of, again, the meat in this three-car sandwich. So you've got to think about how do I defend from the car coming behind me and how do I attack the car I'm trying to run down. So I think Cheever is the one that hopes he's going to be the biggest beneficiary out of this. 35 under investigation yep. for speeding in the pit lane. James Kell, and he's the one who's currently battling away with Henrique Chavez for fourth place well, in the Bronze Cup. It's at the present it is investigation, so maybe he might get away with it, but I suspect if it's whatever over the the 50 kilometer speed limit, then uh, it'll be a time penalty, I suspect. Right, the car that's in front of these two is the leading car in the silver category. That is Sam de Jong in the Comte U Audi. So he is not involved in this class battle, but they are going to try and use getting close to him and overtaking him to settle their own difference for second place in the bronze class. Yes, but uh, I mean, that's a car out of class, and you don't want to find yourself getting trapped when you've got your principal competitor directly behind you. So it's it's in everybody's interest to get that different class battle that's going on. 
sort of straighten up, get the Mercedes ahead of the Audi, basically. So the Audi is leading, but the second place car is Izzy Kopelic compact in the Mad Panda about seven places back. So there's no pressure no. if that car loses positions. So as far as Mayne is concerned, he wants to get past the Jong as quickly as possible and drop Chiva. Yes, and Chiva's just sitting there waiting to see whether there's going to be uh, a sort of an out of character reaction from Mane to see whether that can give him an easy overtake or whether he's going to do the hard yards and force the situation. But these five cars are all closing up, and um, so it's going to be watch a mirror with one eye and watch what's going on ahead of you with the other one. This is what's brilliant about this championship. Every time one battle ends, there's another one to pick up on. And there is just so much great racecraft here at Monza. This is what this circuit was designed for. And this is what this championship was designed for. Battle after battle after battle. Currently, we have got 39 and a half minutes to go here. And it's BMW 1, 2 and 3. Yellowly 2.1 seconds now only ahead of Dries Van Tor. He's chipping away gradually. He is. It's the, the, the little chips. Being a Belgian, of course, they appreciate little chips. <laughs> Very true. But, but, you know, it's going marginally towards the direction of Dries van Thor, and we've got 39 minutes and eight seconds of the race remaining. So there is time to cut down and get onto the tail of Nick Yellily, but then it's gonna be a, an almighty battle because Nick Yellily ain't gonna yield ground to anybody, let alone to Dries van Thor. Then you've got Max Hesse in third position in the 998 Rove BMW. Mirko Bortolotti has worked the Iron Lynx Lamborghini up into fourth position. Look at the hesitation there as James Kell tries to find his move on Eddie Chiva the third. They go side by side. The Sky Tempest, the McLaren versus the Walken Horse BMW. And they've got Arjun Mayani in front. This could be a very telling opportunity. Who's going to break latest? Oh, the McLaren trying to get the move on the inside and they're around the outside of the Red Filio. James Kell had it all worked out and done all the hard yards. And then he found himself out positioned both first by Eddie Cheever and then by the McLaren coming side by side. Kell is going to get back, I think, just ahead before they get down into the second chicane. Certainly side by side. And oh, he had to, he's conceded it. He's conceded it. Brilliant from Enrique he's Chavez. The undercut, he's got the undercut, he's got the drive. And again, another aggressive move, to, a blocking move, which I'm, I'm uncomfortable watching that. But I tell you what, Enrique Chavez, that was bold as brass around the outside of the Retifilio chicane. Once he knew he had the space and he felt, well, that walking horse is going to get impeded by the car in front. Right, kick on the throttle. Let's get it round. Let's see if we can outfox him. And he did. Another racer. Another racer. Yeah, very, very smart. Well placed, well positioned, read the situation perfectly. Right. BMW's one, two, and three. Mirko Bortolotti in the Iron Lynx Lamborghini is up in fourth position. Fifth place for the Santa Doc Junior Audi of Patrick Niederhauser. Then Matthew Drudi in the Trezor Orange One car. The Conti Racing Audi of Max Hoffer in seventh position. Surely it can't still be Max Hoffer in that car. I think they've got an issue with their the kind of transponder driver change. Problem, yeah. yeah, there's definitely something wrong there. I'm just keeping an eye on Schwartzman in eighth position. 2.7 seconds behind Max Hoffer in uh, the Audi, and I wonder whether any... Thomas Preening has also made a move. He's got ahead of Thomas Drouet. So that's another battle just outside the top 10 that we haven't really had much of a glimpse of. But Schwarzman in eighth position potentially might get up Cut to seven. 35, five second time penalty added to the final racing time for oh speeding in the pit lane. There we go, that is James Kell. Yep. Slam dunk. Yeah, I mean, it's a five seven second penalty added to his time. It's not the worst penalty that uh, could have been given, but um, it's still, you know, you can see where he is on the racetrack. Uh, what's he going to do? How's he going to find? It's not going to magic out of nowhere, a five second extra degree of pace back on board with Cheever as they come out of the second chicane and either run down into the magnificent Lesmo one. So Max Hofer is actually joined in the oh, car. Oh, oh, by. is that an overtake? It is. Have we got an overtake? We, I think we have. Robert Schwartzman, Schwartzman battling with Muller. Hofer, yes. Oh, no, this is Schwartzman and Muller. So Muller, okay. Muller's actually caught Schwartzman. Ah, okay. So this is Ferrari versus Porsche yet again. Yes. How many times in the years have we said this? Ferrari versus Porsche. It's going to be a great battle. So there is the Porsche that Schwartzman was looking at. That's the car directly ahead. So I think that maybe a move forward for Schwartzman is going to be uh, difficult because Muller looks to be the quicker of the two cars right now. And I'm sure Robert Schwartzman is thinking, 
nobody told me it was going to be this difficult. <laughs> you just said I could drive a Ferrari and it would make me look great on Sunday. You didn't have no idea at all I was going to be wheel to wheel with a Porsche on day one. Well, you know, racing against people you've never raced against, some of whom you've probably never heard of, uh, and then finding yourself, you know, a legend in the very early part of his life as a potential Formula One driver, and here he's battling with people that never raced single seaters in some cases. Here not, we... not in Muller's case, but in some cases. Well, here we go again Ferrari versus Porsche. It's uh, Siegfried Rauch versus Steve McQueen. We get to do it all over again, don't we? As we have seen so many times over the decades. I think that might have gone over the head of most of our listeners. Oh, oh, no, I'm sure they've seen Le Mans with Steve McQueen. I'm sure they've seen that movie. The greatest motor racing movie of all time. Surely they've uh, seen uh, that I movie. I wouldn't bet my life on it. <laughs> If you haven't, it was, it was that's made, what you're doing tomorrow. The film was made 50 years ago. It was still the best ever. It's never been beaten. It's never been beaten. On to the straight, up towards the Parabolica. And we are going to have a sensational battle between these two, if anything's to go by, Schwartzman and Muller. And in the background, you can just about make out, coming into the distance, 9.2 seconds back, that is... Uh, Sim uh, Jean-Baptiste Simenauer, 10th position in the BMW, second in the gold category, just in front of Dean McDonald in the Optima McLaren. But this battle is wonderful. Lead gap up to three seconds. I don't know the reasons why. Again, arguably, probably, possibly, traffic involved. But this is the battle we're focusing on for eighth position. Robert Schwartzman in his first race in a Ferrari 296 GT3. Sven Muller, more seasoned, more experienced. In the lovely, magnificent Porsche. I'm a Porsche fan, I just left. You probably didn't realize that, but I am. <laughs> so, I mean, How could we have told? Well, I mean, back <laughs> in the heady days of 917s and 512s, certainly the 917 I'm, won I'm, the day. I've got a secret affection for both brands. It's very bad. You know, you, you can't show bias to one, but you can show even just to the other. Right, here's Dean McDonald putting pressure then on the BMW up in front of Jean-Baptiste Simenauer. This is not just for the top 10, but this is also for second in the gold category. And Dean McDonald really senses that the Optimum McLaren can get there. I have a feeling that Dean McDonald will find a way around and get himself around the, the BMW, get himself into the top 10, because I've just got so much faith in the young Scotsman and his natural and outstanding pace. He's done a great job so far too. Well, so has uh, uh, Fag and Charlie, or oh, Charlie Fag and uh, Sam De Hart. They've both done a fantastic yes. job to work their way forward. Yep. Third position in class at the moment. Only five cars left in the gold category, such has been the attrition rate of uh, the category this time around. And I can tell you that it's been uh, a very tough battle for second place in the class. End of lap 75, the gap had gone from three seconds to three and a half seconds. So what is going on? And there's a retirement potential. Yeah, it's an Audi. It's, oh, uh, that dear. is Everard. That is Everard, I think. Yeah, it is. So that is the number 26 of Paul Everard in the silver Santa Lock Junior team car. Uh, I mean, color, not class. But what, a very, oh, it is cl class as well. Yeah, a very late cut call to come into the pit lane. I mean, it looked like he wasn't about to come in, then he made a... So, so what his... Listen, oh, this is the reasons. move! There we go. Round the outside. Oh, he's overrun the corner. Oh, Dean, you got it wrong. You were, did all the right things, and then just you couldn't get the car slowed down sufficiently. But there we are. The, the potential is there. Uh, and he's got and half an hour to do it. Oh, yes. Still plenty of time to get this done, Dean. Don't be disheartened. Just get back on the bike. Have another go. He is charging after once again. Meanwhile, in the battle for second position in the bronze category, Chavez has fallen down to fourth, and Eddie Cheever has worked his way up to second past Largin Miani. So that's good work that, from that Eddie was, Cheever. That, I felt that was going to happen because I just. Oh, oh, oh there no. is Chavez. That is Chavez going off. What did he do? Again, it looks like he just simply outbraked himself coming into the first chicane. Couldn't make the, the, the cut to the left, so he opted to take the. This sort of escape route, you might call it. Yep, so Arjun Mayani got back in front of him again then, as a result of that. But here he comes again to try and make another bid. Enrique Chavez is trying to hold on to this. But James Cowell sniffs an opportunity as well, because he's got the BMW right on the tail of the McLaren. And look who's behind them, Marvin Kirchhofer in the other Garage 59 McLaren. And that's a car that had a problem in qualifying, that an alternator failure. And that's why they qualified all the way down. Let me just check my little notes on this one. 
they qualified all the way down on the 22nd row of the grid, so they come from about 44th start position, and uh, that's a pretty good effort all right. But look, Thomas Preening has done the fastest sector time as Miguel Ramos just mulls over in his mind what was that all about. But Thomas Preening running in 12th place in the Porsche, a 33.3 in sector one. Yeah, where do these times come from? I mean, Suddenly got faster over there. Well, I suppose it's because, is it to say that the, the circuit's got cooler? First to second, the gap now 4.2 seconds. Has Dries van Thor maybe pushed too hard early in his stint and all of a sudden the rip level that he enjoyed and used to its full extent has started to air away? Don't know any of this. Yeah. Any speculation. And Thomas Preening, not only was he fastest in sector one, he set the fastest race lap at one, 47.2. That's, with, that's within a second of the qualifying times. Nice jump there from the leader, Nick Yellily. And we're going to watch and see what happens as Dries van Thor does the same thing. Well, maybe even that's more, the reason. Even more aggressive. Maybe that's the reason why they're slowly falling back. I think when you do that kind of thing too regularly... Oh, oh what's going on there with Enrique the Enrique Chavez falling back. Yes, the car looked very unstable. I don't know whether That's gonna... the second lap in a row. They've dropped it at the Retifilio, and now they're under pressure from the sister car. As I was saying, I don't know what the problem is, whether it's a car problem or, again, possibly a tyre problem. So Kirchhoff is now going to try and make his bid on Enrique Chavez to clear the other Garage 59 McLaren, but this is for racing positions, and they're in different classes. So Cheever on the headlight flasher telling the car ahead, I want to get through, so let's look again and see. Oh, side by side, a bit of a hip and shoulder between the Mercedes and the McLaren coming down. The McLaren's going to break as late as possible, Ooh. but it's going to be slightly... <laughs> oh, 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 and that doesn't... Over oh, those banana curvings. Again, that's why the car came back on and just flicked the tail, just sideswiped James Kell as he came off the chicane. But the Indian, Arjun Mayani, showing Enrique Chavez, who is boss. Oh, Do you really again, think you're going to get the, me? The BMW getting the tail stepping out. So James Kell, don't know why, just the last couple of laps. So is he running into, you know, running out of tyre performance, or is it, again, another issue, just simply response and reaction to the pace behind him? We didn't see it, but McDonald has now got past Jean-Baptiste Simenauer. He has got through in a second place. We didn't see where it happened, but the McLaren is now in second. Yeah, I mean, I, as I said, it wasn't a matter of it, but a matter of when. So McDonald has now got a fine, what's he, he's nine and a bit seconds behind Sven Muller, who's been in this battle, ongoing battle with Robert Schwartzman in the eighth position Ferrari. Here we go again, down into the first again. Now, there's an incident that's been noted on the timing screen, which is the Winwood Mercedes number, oh, sorry, yeah, the Winwood Mercedes number 57, Philip Ellis, and the Grasso Lamborghini of Sam Neary. Now, that's been noted. OK. So we don't know if something's going to come up as a result of that. But here comes the 44. That is Palette. Stefan Palette is going to try and make the move on Zug into uh, the first quarter. Bit too far behind. He's had to go one way, then the other way. So he's going to hang in there, but he's going to get run out of room. And oh, Dries Van Thor is in. Dries that's a problem. Pits. It is a problem. We've been predicting it the gap. Well, it's 11 seconds, but that's because he's had to come into the pits, and it looks like it was a left front tyre. It's a slow may puncture, be, maybe. It may have been a deflating tyre. Could be the only thing I can imagine. Slowly deflating. Something's maybe... Pit, well, he's picked up something in the tyre. Well, maybe also when you hammer the curbing, you can also damage the tyre. Whatever it is, that is race over in real terms for the WRT entry, because that will, of course, Dries van Thor, the best part of, what, 30-odd seconds, maybe more, driving in, stopping, left front change, back out again. So, what, again, who could have written the script for this three-hour endurance race here, opening round of the endurance championship at Monza? They are down to seventh now, in front of Schwartzman and Muller, and there it is. Yeah, that looks... Just look at the tyre, they're rolling the tyre. Can't see you. If there's anything, there, there are marks on the tread. Look at Van Sam Voss, the team boss. He's straight in there, lasering in to see what was. There was a cut, a lateral they, cut across. They, they've just been testing the tyre pressure on it. Yes, they're testing it, but I'm just looking at the surface. There are marks on the surface of the tyre. Yeah, I think it's a slow puncture. So, well, I, that was my call, wasn't it? It slow was puncture. indeed, John. Yeah, you were right. I don't like being right, but I don't <laughs> like being wrong <laughs> even more. Well, you're here to be right. What are you talking about? You're absolutely right, John. So, Nick Yellowley now. Waiting to see as the cars come round to complete lap, but just as the lap, end of lap 78, so the 
gap between Nick Yellowley and it will now be uh, Max, Hol uh, Max, Hess Max Hesser in the second place. And that's 14.8 seconds. So a, a relatively comfortable advantage to the 98 Ruba Racing. And it's a Ruba Racing BMW now in second. So it's a Ruba Racing 1 2. It is, but it's not a BMW whitewash anymore because Mirko Bortolotti has ruined the party by bringing the Lamborghini up into third position. And that's what I would call a 100% professional performance from that 63 Lamborghini. Yeah, amazing and considering it, when they started the weekend, no, we well, were concerned. No, but that's these are proper professional racing drivers. And you, if, you, you, if you don't qualify necessarily particularly well, that's not the end of the day. And you know that come the, in an endurance race, there's going to be matters, issues, shunts, yellow flag, safety car, no engine. Those are items that then you have to make use of to your best advantage. Well, we saw Paul Everard bring the Santa Lock Junior Audi into the pits. They haven't left it, but they're under investigation for speeding in the pits. So talk about uh, kicking a man when he's already on the floor wounded. Probably the pain from the wounds bigger than the pain from the penalty. But <laughs> exactly. whatever way around it is, it's never pretty. Well, there is Nick Yellily. Now 14.8 seconds clear of the sister car. It is a Rove 1-2, exactly what the doctor ordered. And they are doing a grand job. After Philip Eng did a fantastic run in the first hour, Marco Wittmann balanced in the second, Nick Yellily calm and composed in the third. You're talking about the, the medical doctor, not, the, I am, not yes. the doctor that's known as Valentino Rossi. Yeah, that's right. I am referring to the medical doctor, not the doctor who started on the front row of the grid. So Max Hess in second, Marco Bottolotti in third. This is getting probably the spicy now. Enrique Chavez getting back in on Arjun Mining. These two are having a great ding dong. McLaren versus Mercedes. And this is absolutely irresistible to watch. Yes, and James Kell again. You know, he's got a five second penalty, which will be added to his race time. So he's trying to find a way to get ahead of the Mercedes and then make progress. So again, it's, it's it, you have to be patient, but you know now the clock is clicking down 23 and a half minutes of the race remaining. Where has this race gone? Seriously, where has this race gone? I was not expecting three hours to feel like half no, an no, hour. No, no, as I said, this is no longer a three-hour endurance race. It is three single one-hour sprint events. It's and that's what endurance racing has become. When you get to Paul Ricard, for the six hours of Paul Ricard, which starts at daylight and goes into nighttime, that is six one-hour sprint races. If you're at Spa, that's a 24-hour endurance race. No, it's 24 one-hour sprint <laughs> races. So true. Now, we're looking at the Bronze Cup battle because we are obviously looking at Chiva in second position behind Sam de Jong in the Audi who is leading the, uh, Sam de Jong who is leading the gold race, I do believe. Oh, no, sorry, he's leading the silver, I do apologize. Uh, then Chiva has Chavez and Miani behind him, but they are all trying to get close enough to Klaus Bechler, who is still a good few seconds up the road of all of this. So they're doing their best to try and catch up as we watch. The watch at the back of the line, there is Dries van Thor with a brand new left front tire being a predominantly right-hand corner circuit, that will give him an additional performance. And of course, he's going to try and get ahead of Max Hoffer, who's not racing in his class. Nevertheless, he wants to get as far up the field, just out of his own pride for, for, for something that, well, we're, we don't know the reason why that tyre had to be changed, the wheel and tyre had to be changed. It was losing pressure, that's why he came in. But that appeared to me to be happening maybe a couple or three laps prior to the entry into the pit lane because his lap times had dropped away and the gap between first and second was increasing. Offer, Bayard and Sule looking good in the Conti Audi to get the victory done and dusted in the Gold Cup. Dean McDonald now to second as we know in the McLaren. Jean-Baptiste Simonau still looking for a podium in the BMW number 30 from Team WRT. So they are going to get a lot of trophies from this race in the lower classes but it's all fallen away in the Pro Cup hasn't it? What a shame for WRT. Well, WRT, look, I mean, up against the Porsche coming down into braking. So Porsche wisely, wisely, not on the same race. So very sensible. Now, this is the car that is running in 15th. This is the leading yes. car Klaus in the Backler. Bronze Cup. Klaus Backler doing a great job in the pure 911, 911. Yeah, that does make sense. I yes, promise it does. <laughs> and very, a very clean graphic design of the car, the base white sort of stands out, but just those flecks of yellow and black and the, uh, the very uh, fetching purple headlight covers. It's very distinctive, isn't it? There's no Porsche in the world that looks quite like that one. Well, well you know, I might, I've got to do my uh, 
configurator for my car. My oh, yes. Tiller, yeah. Give them a call. I'm sure they'll sort you out quite well, John. Oh, so, so. It's in the system. It's in the, it's in the process. <laughs> That'll be a good phone call tomorrow morning. So they lead the way then in the Bronze Cup with the two McLarens now second and third of Chiva in the Sky 10 Besta car and Chavez in the Garage 59 car. Arjun Mayani, though, has not given up hope in fourth position in the Haupt Mercedes. Here is that battle. Now, Chiva is behind the leader in the Silver Cup, Sam De Jong. In the Audi, the Comte to you, number 12. And I think Chiva is about to make a pass. Uh, well, look in the background, because that's even more close. You've got Chavez, Kell and Miney having an absolute squabble for third position. And there goes oh, Kell off the through. road. Kell cut through. I don't know whether he was forced to, but he's going to have to give that two positions. He will not be permitted. Oh. Uh, the, but the battle between the Mercedes and the McLaren, that will be influenced by what has happened with James Kell. Kell needs to pull over and let these two cars regain their position. But at the same time, he's got to be careful. And look, he's not doing so. He's pulling away. Well, this is going to be interesting as here comes Enrique Chavez once again going wheel to wheel with Arjun Mayani. And they're almost banging doors as they go under the Monsonapolis banking into the Valiente Ascari. Can Arjun Mayani hold it on the inside line? Chavez trying to hold it around the outside. And they bang wheels. And off goes the McLaren. Almost into the path of the sister car. And also running behind that. Well, I mean, wow, the Audi nearly got carried up and all that. Kerfuffle. I mean, that was side by side going into the Ascari chicane. Not something that normally ends up with a pretty result. And it almost could, it could have been a much bigger incident as Chavez came back. What you get is he, look, you're side by side. And there was a no brainer that the Mercedes was going to, but he had to pull across to take his own racing line. I mean, you have, I, I admire Chavez for his commitment and courage, but it was never going to be, he wasn't sufficiently far ahead of the Mercedes at the point when he turned in. Anyway, made exciting viewing for us and for those back at home. So they did. 42 cars still going. From Nick Yellily in the lead all the way down to poor 17-year-old Aaron Walker, who is still trying to get the Get Speed Mercedes home after they have had no end of problems, but none of them have been the drivers making. Here is the Pro-Am Cup leader, the BMW Italia Ciccato car. And they are actually in front of the Ferrari of Andrea Bertolini, who is obviously still battling away for the honours in bronze. So a very strong run. It is Guerra in the car at the moment for the BMW Italian Ciccato car. This is an absolute whitewash. Here we go, the Mad Panda crew struggling to stay in front of the gaggle. This is getting a little bit feisty. Again, a five-car group, all of, actually a six-car group, all battling, and that's Bertolini coming along. Oh, no, it's not, it's, it's, uh, it is Marco Bertolini. No, it's, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm looking at timing and scoring, and I'm trying to keep an eye on the screen as well. well Michelle, and the, and the Iron Dames in the mix also. Yeah, that's Neri in the Lamborghini. Stevan Ballet has obviously got to the head of this queue. There's the Mad Panda. That is uh, Ferris Compank. And then we've got Neri battling away with Ellis. Uh, Gatting is in the mix there. Zug is in the mix there, I think. So this is an absolute squabble. So many cars having a great run. There's Sam Neri in the 58 Lamborghini. Steven Pellet has got to the front of this queue and disappeared. So the Mercedes cars are up in front, the 57 and the 157. Well, I think one of them is actually Ezekiel Pellet's Compact. Yeah, there it is, the Mad Panda in 25th position. Then Zug, then it is Neri. So a fabulous battle. But then what's interesting, this battle of Comportaletti, who was, was, what, 3.4 seconds behind Hesse in the second place BMW, he's got himself bogged down and the BMW has been able to break clear. And I've figured out why the number two Get Speed Mercedes is still pelting around in 42nd place, because they're on for a podium if they are a classified finisher. So that's why the number two Get Speed Mercedes wants to finish, because they can finish third in the Pro-Am Cup and take some trophies. And points, points, points. Absolutely, because obviously we lost uh, Samantha Tan on the first lap, and we lost Litvala with that massive accident into the Redivillo. So there is Hesse just gone through. Bortolotti, he can do nothing. He's the fifth car in that five car group, and he can't even find a way past, one might say, not the slower car, the 58. And he's just sitting there seeing all that opportunity to finish on the second place podium just evaporate. Get out of the way, boys. Come on, I'm in third position. I've got the BMW in my sights. And you are, oh, that's a problem for the leading Pro-Am car. But they've managed to get away with that, I think. They have. They've gotten away with it. A small error, but, but consolidated sufficiently to keep their motor running, get back into first gear, 
and set off. So no damage. Watch and see. Just under braking. Did he hit the? Oh, he got, oh, he got hit oh, by the Ferrari goodness, Bertolini. Was that Bertolini. Yes, it was. I mean, Andrea Bertolini. That's not normally something you'd imagine, but that was why the BMW went backwards into the grass, and then, well, so we get didn't up. expect that, Andrea. I think that's a case of going to bed without any tea for you tonight, my son. Well, a rude awakening there for Gerda, but you know what? He was lucky because not that far behind was the 78 of Lind, who is in second place. Dennis Lind in the Barwell Lamborghini. They nearly lost the lead, courtesy of Andrea Bertolini. But is the car damaged? That's going to be the key factor now. Damage will be around the rear diffuser. It possibly has been damaged. Just There's the Barwell Lamborghini. That's how close it is now. Yeah. And there is Dries van Thor. Uh, he is in sixth position. He's just found a way around. Well, there's a change of position to Dries van Thor and Hoffer. That was a while ago. But Dries van Thor is 10 point, whatever, five seconds behind Matteo Drudy. And we've got 14 minutes remaining. It ain't going to happen unless there's something unforeseen. Well, I don't happen. know. He's got one fresher tire. Is yeah, that going to help? Yeah, he's got two cars at least ahead of him. He's got to find a way around them. Very true. The Barwell Lamborghini, though, is now very much aware of the fact that the car in front has just been hit off the road. So there is a good chance that they could catch up to the Italia Ciccato BMW. Come on, let's go for it. Let's see what happens. So the Bertolotti coming, he's trapped behind this group of cars. He's on the headlamp flasher going absolutely ballistic. Look, look, see the lights flashing at the way back? That's the Ferrari, yeah. Yeah, but the Lamborghini behind has been doing the very same thing. So it's very frustrating in these closing 15 minutes of the first race of the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS. Dennis Lind, he's a, here at Monza about four years ago in, in the wet. He was stellar, absolutely phenomenal. I mean, speed in the rain, nobody ever could get within a country mile on the pace. Yet he's running down in 32nd place. Second in the Prime Cup, though, and that yeah, car... I just know, but Dennis Lind, you know, <laughs> I would like to see him in a winning car but he's had that opportunity. Maybe it'll come back to him later this season. Well, he, Dries van Thor, being cautious coming into Lesbo 1. Well, look how quickly, I think there is damage to that BMW. Look how quickly Dennis Lind is catching the BMW. I think they might do this. I think the Barwell Lamborghini might be about to take the lead because Gerda in the BMW that got pitched around, they're struggling. They've got damage. So this could be the Barwell Lamborghini victory in Pro-Am after all. Dennis Lind could be on the top of the podium today. Well, he's in 32nd position overall, which is totally irrelevant because, as you point out, it is about a class of victory. Here we go. Look how quickly he's oh, gaining. No. But Dennis Lind is a star driver. <laughs> I, mean, I can't emphasize what a great guy he is. Here he comes, and he's going to follow in behind the BMW, which says, get out of the way to the BMW Italia Chicago car. You never car. knew Dennis Lind might overtake Dries van Thor. Uh, here comes the opportunity. That's first and second, split by Dries van Thor in the red WRT BMW. Dries van Thor should get through no problem, but then Dennis Lind is going to have a clear path to go for the win in Pro-Am. Yeah, but he's also going to get the benefit of the slipstream of the two BMWs. And look, Dries van Thor finally with the BMW Italia car pulls over to the side, lets Dries van Thor get a clear run down into the chicane. Dennis Lind looking to see, well, what way do I go? Follow Italia car or follow the WRT car? Chooses to follow the 15 BMW through the first chicane, gets a good run off the corner, expects maybe a similar kind of cooperation. But well, this is the lead. This is the lead battle now between the 15 and the 78. They are going to go wheel to wheel from here on in. Dennis Lind, if he passes the BMW in front of him, he takes the lead in Pro-Am. So that is why Dennis Lind has got his dander up. He is going to be pushing hard now to get that Lamborghini up the inside of the Italian Jakarta BMW. This is for the victory in Pro-Am, and Dennis Lind is going to be throwing everything at this. And we're down at 11 and a half minutes remaining in this race. So we've got probably the best part of eight and a bit laps, maybe not even that seven and a bit laps. And all, all racing all the way to the checkered flag throughout all the categories. The biggest gap probably in the categories is between the lead two cars. I think the yellow lane, I have a comfortable 11 second lead over Max Hesse in the Rover Racing. So Rover Racing look as if they're going to have a magnificent weekend here at Monza if this race and these two positions at the lead stay the same. Let's see what Dennis Lind can do about the man in front of him. Francesco Guerra trying to hold on to the victory, trying to get the Lamborghini out of its slipstream. On the run to the Parabolica. And they've got the seventh placed Audi, which is currently leading the Silver Cup right behind them. Max Hoffer in the Comte to you Audi. 
but it's Hoffer, Bayart and uh, the third driver in the mix there, of course. I'm not sure if it's actually Hoffer still in the car, but it's Soule, Hoffer and Bayart. Here we go, Dennis he's, Lind is going for it. He's got a good run, but still needs to be a lot closer than that to make a, a meaningful move on the BMW. He's going to have to go the long way round if he wants to... Uh, he, no, he can't even think about making the cutback, and the BMW is cleverly placing itself in a way to lose, slow the momentum. Oh! Slow the momentum of the BMW, and again, that's what happened. Dennis Lind was much quicker off the chicane, and contact occurred. Now, side by side, and look what's happening. He's being, the BMW is being swallowed up, not just by Dennis Lind, but, oh, well, they already tried to make a position but didn't happen. Lind is through, and Lind has oh, he's taken... Oh, has gone through as well. Yep, yeah, the Audi went through as well. That's definitely helped out Dennis Lind, and the Barwell Lamborghini has hit the front in the Pro-Am race for the first time all race long. He moves over and lets the Audi go through. Now he's got to go on the defensive from Francesco Guerra, but the Barwell Lamborghini now leads in Pro-Am with less than 10 minutes to go. So real racing with this... Well, I mean... <laughs> Dennis Lind, I don't want to over-egg him, but uh, with respect to those around him and those he's racing against, his bodywork, or rubber, I should say, on the racetrack, Dennis Lind has got enough experience and expertise to keep the Lamborghini, in my view, ahead of the now pursuing BMW, rather than the BMW being pursued by Dennis Lind. Now that is a class position change. Dennis Lind with his teammates Ballon and Collard. 26.15 second time penalty added to the final racing time for speeding in the pit lane. Uh, that is Paul Everard, one. that's Everard. That's the one we saw speeding in the, uh, coming into the pit lane with a mechanical problem. They've gone out again, but that's not going to affect the positions because the car behind them is yeah. four laps it, It's amazing, you make a pit stop for a reason which is beyond the driver's control. But, but what isn't the driver's control is the speed limit in the pit lane. The fastest car in the race is actually the Rutronic Porsche. Thomas Prining, he got the fastest lap at 1 minute 47.2. Yeah, done a long time ago now, 12 or yep. so laps ago. Indeed. Had fastest first sector on that lap and fastest lap. I mean, a 147.232. say That's within a second of a qualifying time, almost matching the best time we've seen all weekend. So Nick Yellowly now really in a comfortable 14 second advantage over Max Hesse. What with now eight minutes remaining, he can just breeze at home, so he hasn't got traffic directly behind him, that's going to be an issue, and he hasn't got much traffic ahead of him, where is the second, there's the second place BMW, now just coming on to... Honestly, I need yep. to put some lottery numbers in here, because there's a very good chance that Antonio Fuoco is going to get Drue to get into the top ten of the Pro Cup before this race is over. Because they're only seven tenths back and they've got seven and a half minutes to do it. Yeah, but he's got to pass three cars to do it, or four cars to do it, actually. Oh, well, I mean, to do it overall, yes. I'm talking about, I mean, about overall. Yeah, in the, in, the, in the Pro Cup, all they've got to do is pass Drew A in okay, front. Okay, okay. And done. they'll be top ten in the Pro Cup no, for both cars. No, I was looking at an overall top ten, which is really, uh, you know, yeah, of course. finishing in the top ten, regardless of whatever class and category you're in. That was that was my thought. That'll be the headline that Ferrari writes, though. The Mercury Portal Lotti is still struggling to make any progress. He's been trying, he's been going one way, he's been going the other way, and not able to do very much. So there's the Iron Lynx Lamborghini. He used to say the Iron Lynx Ferrari. Window open, so letting a bit of air get into the cockpit. These cars do get warm over a, an endurance vent. The heat soak from the rear of the Lamborghini motor gets into the cockpit. He can't afford to be held up too much because only three seconds back is Niederhauser. So Niederhauser in the uh, Santa Lock Audi might steal the podium away if they're not careful. Oh, well, uh, yes, but you said six and a half minutes not oh, remaining. like that! Yes, a little error like that. That's going to cost them half a second or more. But uh, there is the idea behind Patrick Niederhauser to say, oh, I like all that. that obviously, <laughs> obviously, Mirko is under pressure and he's trying very hard to get ahead of the Porsche. Well, just keep doing that, Mirko, because I'll be in your wheel tracks before you can say, Mirko, Lotti. I bet the team will be on to Niederhauser as well. He just dropped it. He's feeling the pressure. Go get him. Go yeah. get third. Yeah, absolutely. So this is going to be a thrilling end to the race, potentially for the overall podium as well. I think one and two, barring any mechanical maladies for the Rove BMWs, is done and dusted. But third position is absolutely up for grabs between two brands in the VAG group, Lamborghini versus Audi. Well, like I said that Nick Gillenley only needed to cruise home, and he's maybe taken that literally because, actually, Max Hesse has taken about a half a second out of the gap. It was 14 point something, it's now 13 point something, but it's irrelevant because Max, sorry, Nick Gillenley has got all he has. He's got 
five and a half minutes of the race remaining. He's got a 14 second advantage. And uh, this is gonna be maybe the more interesting battle on racetrack to see whether Patrick Niederhauser can catch him. And if he catches Mirko Bortolotti, he's got two chances of finding a way around Mirko because he's not gonna give that position up for that a serious battle. What a great race it has been. And we've still got five minutes to determine a few of these positions. There is the new leader in the prime category. The Black Bull, Barwell, Lamborghini. Dennis Lind has fought his way through. There's Rob Collard with the latest member of the Collard Racing family. They are so good at producing these little racing drivers, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll leave it there. Fantastic. Well, they, they all seem to go pedalling in something, but uh, that'll be the next member of the Collard dynasty. That's certainly a very strong run indeed for Barwell Lamborghini. What a great charge back. Mark, Mark Lammer, the team owner, unfortunately he's not here this weekend. You've got Chris Dell, who is de facto the, the boss of the team running it. So I'm sure Mark will be watching it somewhere, uh, either on watching it on Sky, which is a broadcast this weekend, or maybe watching it on his laptop and uh, enjoying every second of it. What a great way to start the season for Barwell. Speaking of which, what a great way to start the season for Conte U. They're looking good for the silver, uh, sorry, for the gold victory, I should say. But they're also looking good for the silver race. I was right, because both Conte U racing Audis are looking good for the win in both gold and silver. Very, very impressive Africa debut 52. for the team. 10 seconds stop and go, penalty converted in 45 seconds. That's added Bertolini. to the final racing time for causing a collision. Bertolini. Wow. I mean, Ooh. Bertolini getting a penalty like that at the end. I mean, I, I'm afraid that's a game set match as far as the oh, penalty yeah, is absolutely. concerned. So that's now third place to Patrick Niederhauser and probably going to be fourth place to Matteo Trudi. And even if I didn't... Oh, no, no, be... it's Bertolini, not Bortolotti. Oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> Bertolini and the Ferrari getting the penalty okay, there. Okay, that okay, was for pitching yeah, the no, no, BMW no, around. No, no, that, that's fair because that was an avoidable incident. And there was a pro driver also, which makes it almost a guarantee, what well, is a guarantee, a pro driver attacks a car that isn't driven by a further pro driver. Well, it's looking good for Comtiu to get a win in class in both silver and gold. But how about this? This is gaining ground now. Oh, Niederhauser oh, hand is over catching. fist. Hand over fist. Portolotti's really struggling to hold this. Niederhauser has suddenly realized, hang on, we could be on the podium here. Well, I just wonder, is, is Portolotti now carrying a little, little war wound? Because the gap has very quickly closed down to the point where Patrick Niederhauser Seriously, we'll believe on two and a half or two minutes, 50 seconds of this race remaining, this lap and one more lap, he could actually, maybe, if and or but, make progress and gain a position. All it takes is one car to hold up Mirko Bortolotti, and all of a sudden, Patrick Niederhauser can snatch Santalog Junior Audi, the podium in the first race of the season. This is right down to the wire here at Monza. Break, turn in. Nice and planted through the Valley Anti Ascari, and they have got a car in front of them that's going to hold them up. It's going to certainly hold up for Lotti because he's the closest to that car. So there it is. I think uh, that's Stephen Pallette, isn't it? Yeah, I think Port Lotti's been given the road. So you can see on the screen just how much the time has come down over the last three laps. So there we are into Alvaretto, or the Parabolica, as we've known it for so many long years, decades. So come across the start finish line now and maybe they'll get this lap and one more lap it's one minute 50 roughly as they come across the line and a race lap here is about 147 148 so they'll probably come across start finish line with about two seconds before the checkered flag is unfurled and Patrick oh. Niederhauser will be enjoying this opportunity it'll give him maybe if just it depends what time it's going to be very close to the flag coming out catching these two cars Niederhauser is in full send mode. We can get him, we can pass him. All we've got to do is get in his blind spots and really psych him out. Remember, these two cars run the same power unit. It's the Audi V10, which is Lamborghini eyes in the Lamborghini, but effectively they're identical. That was good. Portolotti did well, they pulled away coming through the second chicane. That was a good entry, good exit for Mirko Portolotti. Patrick Niederhauser wasn't quite on his toes as Portolotti. So sort of the seesaw between different parts of the racetrack, some parts seem to suit the Lamborghini maybe marginally better than the Audi and the Audi. But the Audi overall is the quicker of the two cars at this point, I'm assuming. Although maybe Bortolotti has been at, he's sort of regrouped with 
this lap and one more to go. He knows that Niederhauser don't take prisoners, but Niederhauser likewise knows neither does Merkel Bottolotti. Remember when the Barwell Lamborghini was going side by side with the Italia Ciccata BMW? That incident out of the Retevilio has been noted by the stewards. So that's interesting. Yes. They got very close together, didn't they? Yes, they did. Right, 20 seconds to go. Last lap. Here we go. Last lap. Go get him, Patrick. You can find that third position. You've got to really work hard. You've got to focus. You've got to concentrate. You've got to nail it to the mast. And this is going to be tricky for Mirko Bortolotti to hold on to, but equally as tricky for Patrick Niederhauser to snatch away. Actually, it's not difficult for Bortolotti. He's got a big enough advantage. It's only if something unforeseen were to happen, but the gap between the two cars, even though look, Niederhauser closes them down, he just has got to not drop a wheel off, as we saw him do a few laps earlier coming through the Ascari chicane. But he's got sufficient. But here's our race leader coming into Lesbo 1 and continues serenely. And it's been a really, really, I mean, it's easy to say, an understated drive from Nick Yellowley, but he has had to do all the hard yards to consolidate that lead. And then once the 32 BMW, Nick, uh, uh, Dries Van Thor had that tire problem, it was going to be just a gentle Sunday evening trot back to take the checkered flag. What a way to start the season in the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS in the Endurance Cup. The Rove BMWs have had an absolute thunderbolt of a race here for Philip Eng, Marco Wittmann, and Nick Yellily. They are going to come down the back straight for the last time, having led virtually every lap of this race, certainly in terms of the run for the victory. Absolutely. I mean, they, they led from the lights going out, and only during that period when you had pit stops, when the car was in the pits and others. So they have effectively led every racing lap. Out of the final turn, down the home stretch, it's a Rove BMW victory for Wittmann, Eng and Yellily. What a start Chicken, to the season flag, for BMW flag. at Monza. What a way to start the season. There's the sister car, a brilliant run indeed from Harper, the Hagen and Max Hesse. What a terrific one-two for Rove. And who is going to get third? It will be Bortolotti. He will hang on in front of Niederhauser in the Santa Loc Audi. So the Lamborghini from Iron Lynx will get the podium. Here come the winners in the multiple other classes. The Come To You Racing Audi in seventh position. The number 21 car is going to get a glorious victory here for the three drivers, Nicolas Bayer, Maxime Soleil, and Max Hoffer. And it's the first of two victories for Come To You Audi today. They win in gold, seventh across the line, but they will also win in silver with the number 12 car when they come home. But the Barwell Lamborghini snatches the Pro-Am victory in the dying minutes of the race. Well, Rob Collard and uh, Chris Nadell, congratulations, Rob, with the latest incarnation. <laughs> in other words, his child. And here comes the bronze victory. A brilliant run from the 9-11, 9-11. The Pure has been absolutely fantastic. What a great drive it has been from the 9-1-1 of Alex Malikin, Joel Sturm and Klaus Backler. Victory in bronze. I do like those headlights. They are stunning. What a great way to start the season. Here is the other oh, another back wall, yes. Here's the other to you taking the victory. The number 12 car comes through to get the win in silver. A great result for Sam de Jong, Loris Hesemans, and Finlay Hutchison. And in the mix there as well, the podium finishes in across the classes. What a stunning thriller of a race that was. Yep, absolutely. I mean, a 55 car field. I mean, the grid was as long as from the, well, virtually the length of the entire start finish straight. And a little bit of a confusion in the first turn, but listen, BMW came alive in qualifying massively. They had a benefit with a reduction in the BOP, a benefit in BOP, uh, but they fused it extremely successfully. Uh, they had to give back some weight. Nevertheless, they have been, I mean, who's surprised? But maybe <laughs> we didn't expect it to be as, as, as emphatic as we've seen here this evening. Wins for the BMWs, Audis, Porsches, and Lamborghinis across the five classes. Double win for Come to You Audi across gold and silver. A win for the Rove BMW, a 1-2, in fact, in pro. A win for Come To You Audis, twice over. A win for the Pure Racing Porsche in bronze. A win for the Barwell Lamborghini in Pro-Am. A fabulous, fabulous race.
to start the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS Endurance Cup here at the Temple of Speed. And what a race it was. And can I just point out, was there a single safety car? I think there was one. One safety car in the whole race. Not bad, eh? That was a good start to I the mean, season. we've seen a lot worse, make no mistakes. <laughs> what so, a great start to the year. No, no, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's what we expect. And I mean, I think we had a race that delivered in sheds over all the four categories, whether it's racing for the overall win, whether it's racing for your class, we're here in, f focusing on the Barwell Lamborghini and you know their battle to achieve success. And I mean, it's, it is, it, I think you mentioned there were 32 cars covered by one second. I mean, it's just, it's just nuts. In qualifying, it was very close indeed, wasn't it? But the cars are making their way onto the start finish straight here at Monza. The overall winners. First and second, Rove racing in the BMW M4. What a victory for Eng, Wittmann and Yellily. And they are absolutely euphoric. What a way to start the year. <laughs> this is their first race together as a trio, don't forget. They've come straight in and they've won at Monza. Boom, thank you and good night. Any race at Monza that you win is always, I feel, I feel certainly, very special. And I've loved this place for goodness knows how many years. So let's head down to the Rove Trio with Gemma Scott. Boys, congratulations. <laughs> just let Nick get his helmet off. But uh, Philip, well, I mean, that was just an incredible race. And your first one all together, of course, showing that you've got a great setup for the season ahead. Yeah, as a team, uh, I couldn't be happier for everybody. Uh, Rover Racing did an incredible job. Uh, BMW with our M4 GT3. We just had an incredibly strong package today. Um, my amazing teammates uh, did an outstanding job as well. So here we are. Uh, very, very happy. Congratulations to you. Nick, you look fresh. You don't look like you've just done an hour's stint. Uh, well, these guys made my job easy. So um, yeah, at the end of the day, I think for us, as a team, after the struggles last year, we're obviously very happy to be yeah, where we belong, I feel. We've been able to win at the Nürburgring and in other categories, but to get um, our first endurance win here is yeah, really, really awesome. Um, these guys both drove fantastically, and like I said, the only difficulty I had was actually getting by lap traffic, and once that was, um, once that was done, we were all sorted, so these legends did really well. Congratulations to you as well, Marco. I mean, a fantastic race and a great result for the team to get a 1-2. Oh, yeah, definitely. A 1-2 is just amazing. I feel a little bit sorry for the WRT guys with the puncture at the very end, um, but for us, for, for the team, for Rove, it's just a great result, a great start of the season in the GT World Challenge. So, yeah, let's keep going like this. Well done. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Guys, can I get a screen? A truly fantastic result for the Rove crew because they were first and second with the sister car as well. A perfect start to the season for the BMW M4 here at Monza. And when they head to Brands Hatch for the first sprint race weekend of the season, John, it's going to be very, very hard to take it away from them. Well, Brands Hatch is a totally different racetrack. So uh, what happens there in a sprint race, entirely different to what we see here. Let's go down to the Come To You Audi team. Gents, winners in class. How does that feel? It feels good, huh? First race for Come To You in the GD3 category. So we can't be more happy about that. P7 overall, I think, yeah. Come To You did a great, great preparation over the winter and happy to be part of this program. Now. Absolutely, I mean, it's a great, for the, great result for the team across the board, really. Yeah, it's, it, it, honestly, it feels amazing for us. It's the first race for Come To You Racing in Fanatec GT World Challenge. First win, two wins, even in silver class. So, yeah, I think all the team is really happy for, for this result. And my father will confirm it, but it's going to be a long night for us. <laughs> that sounds like a good part of your head. Maxime, just a quick word at the end there. I mean, it's not easy. It's such a busy, busy circuit. It's not easy, uh, to be honest. Uh, it's the first time I drive in another category than pro, and it's harder to, I mean, to not make a mistake because we're in the lead, but go fast. It's really, uh, it's really difficult. But uh, I mean, we must thank Jean-Michel, uh, at least me, because he gave me the trust. I came back after four years without a GT World Challenge, and uh, I think we can be proud of uh, come to your racing as well.
I mean, to be seven overall and P1 in gold and P1 in silver on the first race in this championship, I mean, this is something special. It's going to be a good year. Congratulations once again. Thank, Thank you. you it's definitely going to be a very good night, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking about Maxim Sule, who I remember from his Bentley days. He was absolutely always a star. And if it was a, you needed a single, your fast lap, Maxim Sule was often the man that the yeah, team I'm looked to, to do to that. Yeah. So great to see him back behind the wheel. And he's a star driver, and it's a shame we haven't seen more of him in the last few years. Well, what about Sam Loris and Finlay, the winners who got the job done in silver? Sam, we'll come to you first. Obviously, a double win for the, 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 the team is absolutely fantastic. But for you guys to take the class win really means everything, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, for us, it was a last minute deal. I mean, two weeks ago, we didn't have a drive and, and now we're here and we're winning. So uh, we have to thank Come to You Racing for the opportunity and for the work that's done. I mean, it's for them, it's their first year on this level in GT3. They win in both classes and the third one, I mean, he got unlucky. So uh, I think that's a great start. And um, for us, it means a lot. It really does. Finlay, coming into this, you know, what were the expectations? Did you really believe you could be up on the podium? Well, coming into the weekend for sure, but, you know, starting way back where we did, uh, seventh in class, I think 41st overall, I, it seemed tough and uh, it just seemed in the first few laps the race really came to us and it just stayed with us. So, yeah, really good job from the team. Like, what a start for a new start team. Uh, in GT3 to, to come and do this. It's amazing with two cars. Absolutely. Congratulations to all three of you. It really is wonderful. And there is so much history for your family and you're making it now yourself as well. It's great. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. What a great day for Comte to you, Audi. I mean, who, who would have thought it? I mean, who would have, you can stick the tail on the, on the donkey and say who you think might win the race, but who are going to win the various categories? A brand new team comes in and they swoop up two of the categories first time out. Fabulous job, fabulous work. A double win for Comte U Audi then across the gold and silver categories. And of course, what about that thrilling battle for the Barwell Lamborghini? They snatched the win at the death. A class win for you, boys. Dennis, I'm going to come to you first. You did that right at the last minute. Yeah, it was a bit touch and go. Uh, I don't think we were going to catch him, really. I was sort of stuck behind uh, BMW also. Um, and it was very, very hard to follow, and it was smelling bad, and I got to have a bit of a headache, honestly, by following it. And uh, yeah, it was just it was difficult to get past. They have a lot of straight line speed, which we really don't. We have, we're good on brakes. Um, so it was really, really hard to fight with him. I just was sitting there hoping for, for something, and then he appeared right in front of my car. <laughs> <laughs> very cool and chilled about it, as always. Congratulations to you, boys. Coming over here, Adam and Rob, well, you've got to be ecstatic with that, Rob. Yes, absolutely. You know, to come here and win on our first race, so for, for Barwell and Lamborghini, it's brilliant. The, um, it was quite a hard race. You know, I, I was out and I got, like Dennis, got stuck behind a BMW, and we just can't overtake. We just haven't got the straight line speed, so we had to be patient. And thankfully, the race come back to us. So great job, all, all of us, all the drivers. Did you enjoy it? That's the main thing. Did you enjoy the stints as well? Because they're tough. Yeah, I loved it. First, first GT World Challenge. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, messy start. It was all a bit chaotic, and then, um, but then I got into the groove um, in the stint, and it was it was really good fun. But once again, trouble, trouble overtaking. But the pace was there in the car. It took all weekend to get it actually, but we got it when it mattered. Well, it's great to be in the groove from the first round. So uh, we we'll look forward to the rest of the season. Thanks and congratulations Thank once you. again. Vincitore in Monza, the Barwell Lamborghini. What a race from them. What a fight back. Absolutely, I mean, I mean, this is a team that's been involved in GT3 motor racing, goodness knows how many seasons, and uh, they are a super professional, private-owned team, the customer Lamborghini, and they delivered, and they came at a particular you know, mission, and they achieved it. And then, of course, there were the winners in bronze. A fabulous performance all the way through the race from the Pure Racing team. They were the fifth class winners of this brilliant race despite all of the pressure that they had on them throughout from the McLarens of the team from Garage 59 and Sky Tempesta Racing that eventually came home in second at the Sky Tempesta number 93. The Haupt Racing Mercedes of Arjun Mayani and the team coming through for third position. What a fantastic opening race for the season in the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe powered by AWS in the first Endurance Cup race of the season. Down at the first corner, it was BMW's galore as Valentino Rossi held his nerve and held on to second position in the opening phase of the race. But there was a big accident at the start that took out Samantha Tan and Florian Schultzer. 
Everybody picked their way through, trying to stay out of trouble in the opening phases of the race. But there was already an intense battle brewing. Cars started to drop left, right and centre. The first big scalp, Lorenzo Patrese, ending up falling out of the race. The talented 17-year-old's brilliant weekend coming to an end at the first corner after an incident with Rolf Inichen. Then a big shove, the number 24 of Nicky Lidvala. Fortunately, he is OK, but the Porsche dream died there and then. There were some great and fantastic duels all the way through, but Valentino Rossi's first big mistake of the season, and hopefully the last, brought him into the pits on the back foot. Sadly, it all came apart once Augusto Farfus came into the car as a puncture put them out. Then the Almanar Mercedes was the next one to fall. Collision with the Trezor Orange 1 Audi and a damaged radiator dropped them out. The number 25 Audi saw a fantastic battle with the champions from last year, but the 88 Mercedes was the next one to fall. Then just as it looked like we were going to have a duel between Rove and WRT, there were problems for the number 32 BMW. There was great battles across gold, silver, bronze and pro-am that took us right the way to the wire. With great overtakes, great duels and great thrilling battles. The Barwell Lamborghini snatching the pro-am victory in the dying minutes of this classic race. But at the end of the day, it was the Rove BMW pair that got the victory in front of the Iron Lynx Lamborghini. And what a fantastic one too for BMW to kickstart the 2023 GT World Challenge campaign. Well, I tell you what, the Temple of Speed has really delivered. The first time we've been back here since 2019. And what a fantastic opener to the season it was. What a great start. So let's run through the results in full. It's a Rove BMW 1-2 for the number 98 and the 998. The Iron Lynx Lamborghini coming through to the podium ahead of the Audis of Santa Loc Jr. and Trezor Orange 1. The WRT BMW coming home in sixth position further back and the leading car in the gold category the CompTIA Racing Audi coming home in seventh ahead of the leading Ferrari. Frustrations for them, but they did bring their car home into the top 10 at least. It was a great battle all the way throughout. The winning car in bronze coming home in 15th position in the end. And we had some truly sensational battles all the way through. An incredible battle and a fantastic duel as the cars gave us so much excitement right the way to the end. I tell you what, this Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS season, has kick-started in the best possible fashion. 94 laps of the circuit, and so many great duels and battles all the way through. But a BMW 1-2 on the overall podium, the Lamborghini from Iron Lynx in third position, and there were class victories galore for the CompTU Audis in gold and silver, the Barwell Lamborghini in Pro-Am, and the Pure Racing Porsche in the Am category or I should say bronze category. What a fabulous end to the weekend here at Monza. A brilliant three-hour race that gave us so much suspense, so much drama and action, and almost 100 laps a year after the 100 years centenary of Monza. Very fitting indeed, John Watson. I mean, I, I love coming here. I just love this racetrack. I love the, the area, I love the food, everything about Monza. And I spent some time over this morning with many of the people that work here at Monza. And they, they make you walk and they, they're so pleased to see your competitors from the, the past coming here. And because the, the, the emotion that's part of Monza is just so, so deep, so intense. It's always, for me, it's always a pleasure to come to Monza. Iron Lynx get their first podium of 2023. They will be out to ensure that they will get several in the 2023 season. Third position for Iron Lynx Lamborghini. And then come the pair of Rove crews. What a brilliant result. Second position for Rove BMW 998. But the winning crew, the Rove BMW 98. And a great start to the season for the boardroom back home in Munich. One, two for BMW. 1-2 for Rove Racing. A truly stunning start to the year. It really has been sensational. And a truly magnificent and majestic run here at Monza. We hear the national anthem.
The message from Rove Racing seems fairly simple to me, John. Catch us if you can. That was a perfect start to the season here at Monza. Certainly starting on pole position is always your key, particularly into turn one, that first chicane, get in there first, get out first. That gives you a significant advantage. But it, endurance racing is about mitigating all unforced errors. And Robo Racing did that absolutely perfectly with both the junior drivers. And you look at the, 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 the 998 drivers, the, the, if they're over 20 years of age, you'd be surprised. And then you've got the winning car with more experienced drivers behind the wheel. I mean, just a wheel perfect race result for Robo Racing. And uh, well, how can you say it can get any better than that? So the Rove Racing crew in first and second, they soak up the spoils in fantastic fashion. A BMW 1-2, Lamborghini in third position, but the Audi crew from Santa Locke Jr. and Trezor Orange 1 were not far behind. This is gonna be a sizzling season in 2023. Roll on Brands Hatch for the sprints. It really is going to be a brilliant year at the racetrack. So as the pro category get ready to celebrate in style on this truly unique and sensational Monza podium, the moral of the story is, if you've got a BMW, you're looking pretty good. If you've got anything else, time to go to work. Well, in the case of what we've seen here at Monza, I would concur completely. But Brands Hatch is, is, the, is much, much closer to what I would call a, a natural road circuit. You've got elevation changes, you've got pedicle bend, you've got other corners out the back, Hawthorns. It's a different racetrack, and the, those conditions will actually suit maybe other brands more than they so the conditions here at Monza did. So it's not easy to sort of anticipate well, BMW are going to be at top at Brands Hatch. They will be at, in the mix undoubtedly, but you're going to have Mercedes, you're going to have Audi, you're going to have McLaren, Porsche or whatever, all competing equally hard to secure success when we go to Brands Hatch for the first of the five sprint rounds we're going to enjoy this year. A fascinating end to the weekend. The Lamborghini can really take a smile from this one. Third position after a very long and arduous weekend for them. They came back to the fore at exactly the right time to snatch the rostrum. And that's what is so great about this Iron Lynx crew. They never, ever give up. They never surrender. Great podium for Iron Lynx Lamborghini. And there's more to come from them, I'm sure. And not only a great podium, the podium itself is a great podium. Oh, it's beautiful. It projects out Virtually part of it is actually over the racetrack. The other half is over the pit lane. But what it enables at Monza is for when the race fans are released and allowed to go onto the racetrack, they become a part of the celebration. Our next Lamborghini, third position here at Monza. A great way to end their weekend. But the Rove BMWs were the ones that came through in fantastic fashion. Monza really has given us a sensational battle. So we continue on with the podium ceremonies. And after a sensational charge all the way through this fantastic race, we now move on to the next podium. It's the fabulous team that continues to give us so much drama and activity here at Monza. The Lamborghini crew coming home in third position in the end. Sam Neary, they put on a fantastic run, didn't they? In the Silver Cup, it really was a tough battle out there. The Grasser Racing Lamborghini in third, the Mad Panda Mercedes in second, but the Contier Racing Audi picking up the victory with Sam de Jong captaining the ship home at the final hour. A very exciting run for the contenders here. Be ready for the It's an important start to the season for the Conti U Audi crew. They've not just taken one win here in the Silver Cup, they've done it in the gold as well. A perfect start. I don't think they can believe it. I mean, to, to win one category would be a, a great, road, great result. But to come here and battle two categories and walk away the winner in those two categories, I mean, well, 
what, what, what can you expect in further endurance events? And a fabulous advert for how competitive this championship is. A Lamborghini, a Mercedes, and an Audi on the podium. And, and the fact that Audi, I mean, we're seeing the former Audi factory team, WRT, going now to BMW. The fact that the Audi is still sufficiently competitive oh, to yes. win its category is not going to go unnoticed. No, indeed. It's still a great all-rounder machine, isn't it, the Audi R8? And it is great to see just how much success they keep on adding to the prolific history of this car. Win after win, title after title. And this sets the, uh, this sets the wheels in motion for the Silver Cup title crown. What if they could wrap this up? A week ago, as they said, they didn't even have a team together. And now they're here winning at Monza. What if they could turn this into a title battle? Well, they've started off on the, on the, on the right foot, as they say. So we wait to see what will happen in, in future rides. We've got Brands Hatch, which is a sprint ride coming up. I don't know whether this team will be a part of that or whether they're going to focus principally on the endurance events. The first, sorry, the next endurance event will be the six hours of Paul Ricard, which will come at the end of May. Uh, you know, one of those wonderful races that starts in the evening, six o'clock in the evening, and runs through until midnight. Sun sets. And it's just got a, a massive amount of atmosphere. And uh, again, a, a wonderful venue in the south of France, not a million miles away from the Côte d'Azur, if those things are of attraction to you. But anyway, <laughs> it's a lovely part of the world. And uh, again, very fond memories of racing at Paul Ricard. So obviously the next endurance race, as John mentioned, is at Paul Ricard in France at the Le Castellet circuit near the beach. But next time out for the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, it's the sprints at Brands Hatch in Kent. Another circuit you're very familiar with, John. Yes, I mean, Brands Hatch is a marvellous racetrack. I mean, it's, it's time when I was racing at Brands Hatch was in the 70s and 80s. Today, it's, it's on the Grand Prix loop. It is a massive challenge. Like a lot of racetracks, one of the difficulties is, of course, the, the, sometimes the cars are now emasculating racetracks and finding a way around a competitive car of Brands requires a great deal of consideration and skill. Silver Cup drivers really enjoying this and really soaking it in. They have every reason to be very happy with the way the race has played out. We still, of course, have three more podium ceremonies to come. That's how busy it is in the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS. And here in the Endurance Cup, we really have had some exceptional battles. We've had the Pro, we've had the Silver, and now we're going to have the Gold, the Pro-Am, and the Bronze. What a fabulous end to proceedings here at Monza, and of course, you can keep up to date with everything that's going on in the gt-world-challenge-europe.com. So you can keep up to date with everything that is uh, still progressing over the course of the season. There's all the latest uh, photos, videos, and the Canada dates, all the latest news bulletins and updates. So do please make sure you add that to your bookmarks. Just a funny little sort of aside from all this, Teams are required to be clear of the, the pit complex by midnight. Right. So while the race is finished, it's now a quarter to seven in the evening here at Monza. The teams will, will have been working during this three-hour event at already beginning the packing process of all their, and the, I mean, the paddock. I mean, it's like a traffic jam on the M25 when you know, Extinction Rebellion are stopping the traffic. It is just... <laughs> You can barely move in the paddock because it is so busy. Indeed, you've now got and all that has got to be cleared. And how they can maneuver all these, you know, vehicles, the support vehicles, they're, they're side by side by side. Yeah, and they're all, all cleared <laughs> out by midnight. That in itself is a documentary. Right, you've got five hours and 16 minutes. Go. <laughs> WRT coming home in second place, uh, sorry, third position, I should say, in the Gold Cup. The Optimum Motorsport McLaren coming home second. But come to you, racing are back on the podium again on the top spot. Not just the win in silver, but the win in gold as well. Little little Dean McDonald standing there. He had a very, very fine drive in that final hour stint. So.
and yet again, three different manufacturers on the podium, Audi, McLaren, and BMW. A sensational battle here at Monza to open up the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS in 2023. And my oh my, has the Endurance Cup delivered at the Autodromo Nazionale Monza. We have had a sensational race battle here. We're going to have four more thrillers in endurance and five weekends still to come in the Sprint Cup. Join us at Brands Hatch. It is going to be a fabulous battle as we continue our fantastic season in the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe. If you enjoyed that, you'll want to make sure you tune in for Brands Hatch. It is going to be sensational. Two more podiums to come here from our season opener at the Autodromo Nazionale Monza. Wow, it's been sensational, hasn't it? A really incredible trio of teams there on the top spot. And John, we just got everything we could possibly have in that race. I think with excitement and uh, surprises and lots of emotions, disappointments, a lot of drivers will be absolutely gutted by uh, their performances or their results or whatever. But and it, it's uh, for me, it's been just the perfect season opener, whether it's an endurance or in sprint. It produced a race of surprises. It produced a race of great results. I mean, come to you racing to get two category victories in their debut season, debut race. I mean, how often, I can't even think back that far, mind you, I don't think back that far much anyway <laughs> these days. But it, it's been a race of, and because it's been a race of surprises, the thing that the series produces is what motor racing is desperate for, and that is unpredictability. The worst thing motor racing can have is predictability. If you, if you know who's going to win every weekend, where's the entertainment, where's the excitement? I mean, you're talking about Brands Hatch. I mean, I don't know who will be the winner at Brands Hatch. I'm not even, no, probably until we've gone through the, the, the various sessions and qualifying and you might get a clue and even then it doesn't necessarily guarantee you're going to know the winner i was just going to say i think you probably won't know who's going to be the winner of brands hatch until they come out of clearways <laughs> well i certainly would get through panicle bend on the opening lap <laughs> well what a sensational battle here at monza right we continue on with the podium ceremony in pro-am get speed mercedes with their three Superstar drivers, including young 17-year-old Aaron Walker. I think he might be the youngest driver on the grid. Not sure. Jeff McKells. Oh, yeah, maybe Jeff McKells is younger. I mean, they're all, I mean, they're basically, they're still <laughs> probably schoolboys. It's by a couple of months, isn't it? That's all Yeah, it I mean, it's very little. I mean, just watching the, 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 uh, the 998 BMW drivers, I mean, just unbelievable how young they are. The BMW Italia Ciccato racing team coming home in second place after a tough fight. But the Barwell Lamborghini snatching it at the death. God save the king rings out over Monza. Yes, first time I've heard that spoken in a motor racing context this <laughs> season, and uh, long may we continue to do so. Well, a brilliant podium for the Get Speed Mercedes team just by hanging on in there and keeping it running, which their rivals didn't do. But a great duel right to the death between the BMW Italia Ciccato squad and Barwell Lamborghini. That'll be another great one for the shelf at Chris Nadell's place, won't it? Well, the Barwell have got a very, very full trophy room, and uh, again, a success. Again, they, they won the category by coming first, not necessarily by, by being quickest overall or quickest all weekend. It's about who comes first. A fantastic performance then from the three manufacturers. Again, three different manufacturers in the top three places in the Pro Am Cup Lamborghini, BMW, and Mercedes. Yep, and again, this, it goes up this. This concept of unpredictability, that's, I think, just fundamental and, and, well, magic for me, that we don't know who's going to be, which manufacturer is going to be the dominant manufacturer. The balance of performance is now such a sophisticated equation that, um, I mean, 
teams might think they're smarter than the people that do the balance of performance, but I think they've got to think again. Quite incredible to think that at the end of the fifth podium ceremony, 45 racing drivers will have stood on that Monza podium in the space of half an hour. Yes, that's means a lot of awards, but there are a lot of categories. It's not quite as bad as going to your school these days where every child <laughs> has to get a prize because you cannot give a child a prize. <laughs> We're not at that phaser stage, thankfully. Have you been to the same school as my kids used to go to then, have you? <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Fabulous stuff. And now, of course, having finished the podium ceremonies in pro, in silver, in gold and in pro-am, we will focus on the bronze cup. And what a battle the Bronze Cup gave us. Look at these guys fighting tooth and nail, wheel to wheel the whole way. There are five crews that could have taken the victory. And what a brilliant battle that we got from the BMWs, from the McLarens, from the Mercedes, and from the Porsches. It really was right down to the wire. Yeah, Scarriage 59, I think, would be reasonably happy. And, uh, well, there we look. This is the view from Alberetto, the curve, Alberetto curve, a curve. As we love it, the fantastic corner that leads on to this long Monza straight. And what makes Monza again very special to me is it's a place of one of the few racetracks where in the tribunes and in the, in the pit lane, you actually see racing cars traveling at high speed. There are not many pit lanes that have got a, a pit straight as long as this one is. But watching a racing car, watching these cars coming past 160, 70, 80 miles an hour is actually, it makes the ground shake and it's, that's part of the magic, part of the joy. That's why fans come. Last but definitely not least, the Bronze Cup podium. The Halp Racing Team Mercedes in third. The Sky Tempesta Racing McLaren squad. There they are in second place. What a fight back for them. Really good job to get into second place. But the Pure Racing Porsche team triumphant after a great run from the trio as Porsche take their first win of the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe in 2023. First time you'll hear the Lithuanian national anthem over the course of the season. Could well see that quite a few times more. But what a great end. And again, yet again, for the fourth class out of five, three different manufacturers on the podium. And look, Hubert Haub, who I would describe as being a, a more senior citizen. <laughs> He's got teenagers as his co-drivers. Hubert Haub, still it's his team, but still a very, very competitive race driver. Making you tempted, John? Come tempted? On. You've got to be joking. <laughs> I've got a reputation to protect, you know. <laughs> Finished unbeaten, didn't you? Well, not just that. Just, I don't want to get beaten up by some little teenager <laughs> who doesn't shave or you know, hasn't got any hair in the back of his hands yet. John Watson, it has been an absolute pleasure and a privilege to share this first round of the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe with you. I can't wait to see what goes on at Brands Hatch. What can the fans expect? Well, I hope we're going to have another cracking round at Brands Hatch. It's a wonderful racetrack. It's just the, by the virtue and nature of the layout of the track, the rise and fall. And it, it's got its natural own, own natural amphitheatre, so the fans get to see a great deal of the racing until then they go out into the country for about 40 seconds, then come back through Clearways, one of my all-time favourite corners in any racetrack in the world. Thank you very much indeed for all of your comments, your messages, your patronage and your viewing. It's been a great weekend here at Monza. From Gemma Scott down in pit lane, from us, Jake Sanson and John Watson in the commentary box, we have absolutely loved every single second. Join us again at Brands Hatch for the next weekend in the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe.